The Owner's Secret, A Secret Billionaire Romance, Book 4, written by Kimberly Montpetit, performed by Reagan Boggs. Chapter 1 Britt Mandeville threw open the double-carved doors of the White Castle Mansion, giving a chivalrous bow while he swept out a hand in a gentlemanly gesture. Welcome to our new home, darling, he told Crystal, his girlfriend of the past year. A tiny frown appeared between Crystal's eyebrows when she stepped across the threshold and entered the high-ceilinged foyer. A look of dismay flickered in her eyes, but an instant later, Britt caught her quickly washing it away, as though trying to hide her initial reaction. His excitement was dampened just a little, but he brushed it aside. He was so eager to show her the house he'd come to love so much. It's very old-fashioned, isn't it? Crystal commented, blinking her long but probably not quite real eyelashes. I've been working hard on this old place, and there's still a lot to be finished, but I hope you can see the great potential of this old southern mansion. It's one of the few antebellum homes still standing in Louisiana. The war destroyed most of them. Crystal's stilettos paused on the wide hallway carpets. What does antebellum mean, darling? She asked, attempting to draw a smile across her ruby-red lips. She stared at the foyer's old wooden floors and dusty chandelier sixteen feet overhead. Portraits and landscapes hung along the walls, and she openly frowned at those. Butterflies squirmed in Britt's gut, as if he was a sixteen-year-old kid on a first date. He'd spent the last year renovating this stunning plantation house on the banks of the Mississippi, and he was so excited to show it off to the woman he was about to propose to, like, in ten minutes. Antebellum means before the Civil War. Oh, yes. There was a war here, but I thought it only happened in Georgia. You know, the burning of Atlanta? Britt smiled at her indulgently. Despite living in Baton Rouge, Crystal had morphed into a New York City girl through and through. He could forgive her lack of knowledge, although, as a previous history professor and antique collector, he wished she might take an interest in the passions of his life. Atlanta was one of the war's battles, a big one, and a terrible one, he explained. Very dramatic and gone with the wind, Crystal murmured. I'm confused, though. Who are all these people in these pictures? She asked, her eyes roaming the large frame paintings. They don't look familiar at all. They're portraits of the people who built the house, 175 years ago. It's on my research list. But look at this original painting of the property, taken just a year after it was built. No landscaping or fences yet. Just cows in the distant fields and chickens in the yard. A piece of Americana, lost to the past. Crystal's nose wrinkled. It smells a little funny in here, don't you think? Very musty. Maybe it just needs air freshener. It's been raining for almost three days straight with the hurricane in the Gulf so the humidity brings out the antique furniture's age. He moved closer to her, slipping an arm around her shoulders. I'm just glad you were able to fly in before they close the airports, although that might not be for a few more days yet. Don't remind me. I should never have agreed to come out during hurricane season. September is the worst. We're more than a hundred miles from the storm and safe here. Just the two of us. It's going to be a romantic weekend, Crystal. We finally get some time alone to talk about our future. No phones, no guests staying overnight. I let the tour staff return home to prepare for the storm. Depending on what happens, we won't see them for days, maybe even a week or two. The grounds are already so saturated, I can't work outside on the new gazebo construction. You have my undivided attention all weekend. She gave him a quick kiss on the lips and then abruptly asked, did somebody already bring my luggage inside? Is there a bellhop around? I'm your bellhop, cook, and housekeeper, all in one. Britt wished Crystal could see that this was a grand old place, rustic and charming. Not the park plaza with a dozen servants and assistants at her beck and call. My official title is head landscaper. But a landscaper doesn't have much of a salary. You need to come back to New York. You've had your fun helping the owner fix this place up, and now it's time to leave this silliness and return to the real world. You gave me the impression you could support us. 
in the manner to which I've become accustomed, she added coyly, standing on tiptoe to kiss him again. Britt felt himself melt against her lips. It had been several weeks since they'd seen each other. During that time, he'd spent every weekend in Baton Rouge or New Orleans searching for the perfect diamond ring, which was now burning a hole in his pocket. Maybe it was just the dreary weather caused by the looming hurricane, or perhaps he was just tired after putting in extra long days preparing the perfect guest room for Crystal. His hopes had been high, but at the moment, she was staring daggers at the large rugs in the foyer while she stuck a hand on her hip. It was true they were getting worn and the patterns were fading, but they were over a hundred years old. The history of this place was incredible, but maybe that was the boring history teacher and him talking. Come to the ballroom, Britt said, tugging her down the grand hall. It's not a huge room like some of the old houses, but the white marble floor is stunning, and the crystal chandeliers are one of a kind. The elegant marble ballroom was the perfect location to get down on one knee and snap open the ring box where a large, marquee diamond clustered with ruby chips waited to go on Crystal's finger. When they neared the double-arched doorway of the ballroom, Crystal dropped her hand from his. Honestly, Britt, I'm exhausted. I'd love to go upstairs and unpack and take a nap. The roads were a mess getting over here, plus I haven't eaten all day. Where's the kitchen? Um, it's downstairs, actually, and a bit of a mess. I bought groceries for a weekend here, but I haven't prepared a meal yet. Dinner isn't ready? I'd planned a dinner for later this evening, just the two of us, as we celebrate. Britt stopped, not wanting to give away the fact that the delicious dinner was supposed to be a celebration of their engagement after he got down on one knee and did the actual proposing. Introducing her to the mansion wasn't going quite as he'd hoped. Crystal ran a hand along the rope cording that partitioned off the library and front parlor rooms. I can't walk into these rooms on the main floor. I'm not five years old and going to break the valuables. <laughs> of course not, Britt assured her. These are the rooms that are on the daily house door, and the furniture is so old we have rope barriers to prevent tourists from touching the fragile antiques. You never mention daily tours, Crystal said, almost accusingly. Are you telling me that there will be people tramping around the house when I wake up in the morning? Not at all. The house is closed until after the hurricane is over. You'll feel better after you've had a chance to see your room and unpack. Take a brief nap while I fix dinner. With a sly smile, Crystal walked her fingers up the length of his chest, seductively sliding her arms around his neck. She stood on tiptoe to bring her face close to his. After kissing him lightly on the lips, she whispered, why don't we take a little nap together? Britt returned the embrace, whispering in her ear. We promised each other that we'd wait for our honeymoon. But we're all alone right now, Crystal said, leaning in to brush her body against his while she kissed his neck. Crystal, he whispered with a low groan. Yes, the tourists have gone home as well as Mrs. Benoit and her staff, but I'm the caretaker nights and weekends too. I live here around the clock. Then we have no reason to worry about listening ears or someone walking in on us, Crystal continued. Let's pretend tonight is our honeymoon. I was going to wait until dinner to do this, Britt finally said to distract her. But we can make it official right now. He got down on one knee at the foot of the mahogany staircase. No, 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 Crystal said, waving her hands in the air. Have you no sense when to propose? I thought maybe you wanted to elope tonight. We could probably find a justice of the peace. I know the man personally. White Castle is a tiny village. Crystal put a finger to her chin and pursed her lips. Before we make any rash decisions, show me the rest of the house. I don't quite understand. I thought you were ready to make our relationship permanent. He paused meaningfully. You're even trying to lure me upstairs. Crystal gave him a cat-like smile and slipped her arm through the crook of his elbow. Show me the house that you're going to give me first. Her flirtatiousness was typical Crystal, playing games with him and his heart. She was so stylish, well-dressed, and confident 
that he often fell for her little games. Britt went along with her request and proceeded to spend the next 30 minutes giving her a personal tour of the White Castle Mansion. This place is on the historic register and open seven days a week from nine to five. He went on to describe the history of the house, how Union soldiers took over the place during the Civil War and used it as a headquarters, relegating the family only to the upstairs. It wasn't until they had walked out to the newly planted gardens and the fountains he'd designed and built that he realized how quiet Crystal had become. Finally, she said, almost bored, I always thought you would buy me a castle. He turned a puzzled eye toward her. This is a castle. Buy me one near London, and I'll consider it, Crystal said, covering up a yawn. There are people in London, including the theater, shopping, nightlife. Now they were at the front of the property where the long, curving drive led up to the house. She gazed at the trees, then cast a glance toward the Mississippi River. I don't see any neighbors. How close is the nearest town and airport? You came through the village on the way here, Britt reminded her. Crystal whirled on her heels, her eyes widening. Main Street wasn't even half a mile long. Where's the closest airport? Baton Rouge, but you already know that. Crystal stuck her hands on her hips. Britt, I don't think you've been very honest with me. You know I'm not a country girl, and there's not a blasted thing to do out here. Besides, I thought we'd spend holidays at our family mansion while we lived the rest of the year in my penthouse in New York. I'm sorry if I misled you. I was hired to do this renovation on top of my full-time job, so purchasing a mansion of our own is still up in the air. But I was hoping we could pick a wedding date this weekend before I have to go to Savannah for that big estate auction. Why would you take on two jobs? Crystal asked, frown lines creasing between her eyes. You're overextended. You haven't been to New York to visit me in a month. I love finding unusual antiques around the world. Hey, I'm a history nerd who sometimes wishes he could live in the past when life was simple and friends and neighbors were relationships for life. But we can have an elegant life in New York. Crystal glanced at Britt through her lashes and pouted, a mannerism Britt often had found endearing, but at the moment was beginning to annoy him. She hadn't listened to him at all, just brushed aside his dreams. Britt had thought they were ready to commit and walk down the aisle. How could he have been so blinded by her beauty and social skills? Crystal chewed on her bottom lip, staring at the link of oak trees dripping with Spanish moss in the twilight. It sure is sweltering out here, she said. The heavy rain makes it worse, but it'll pass. Hurricanes don't last forever. I think, she said, her words speeding up. We're in our very own relationship hurricane right now, and I'm not sure we're going to survive the storm, Britt. His stomach sank. What do you mean? Growing up in Baton Rouge, I always dreamed I'd become a Parisian princess, not a boring southern belle. I'm an East Coast girl now. You know that. She gave a sad laugh. Uh, uh, please quit this silly renovation job, and let's go house hunting in the Hamptons or Martha's Vineyard, where we belong. Britt gazed up at the white three-story mansion and its sweeping double staircases that led to the main front doors. Being here is like a dream come true for me, as if I'm finally home. I hoped you would feel the same way. This property is a place to raise kids and let them run wild, ride horses, build a boat and sail the Mississippi on the weekends. Crystal blinked her eyes in disbelief. It's like I don't know you at all, Britt Mandeville. The Mandeville family originally came from Louisiana. I can't explain it. But being here feels right. I've always heard that house renovations bring out the worst in people. Crystal let out a discomforting laugh while she flung a disparaging hand at the house. But this old fixer-upper has to go. Britt stared at her, hurt and confusion like a wound in his chest. She hadn't heard a word, he'd said. Maybe this was all his fault. He should have known this woman better than he apparently did. 
He cleared his throat, the words coming out stilted. I think we need some space, Crystal. We could have a villa in Tuscany, Crystal broke off, glancing up at the dismal sky when rain began to drizzle again. Oh, for heaven's sake, could this day get any worse? There goes my makeup. Yeah, it could get worse, he said sadly. The last ten minutes just proved that. She glared at her designer shoes, mud sticking to the pointy heels. Does this mean I'm not going to get my diamond ring? Britt gazed at her, shocked at her brazenness. Of course you can have your diamond ring. He withdrew the box from his slacks pocket and handed it over. Take it. Keep it. I bought it for you. Crystal let out a small squeal when she snapped open the box and saw the large glittering diamond. Immediately, she slid the ring onto her left hand, admiring it under the hanging cypress tree lights. It's stunning, Brit. You do have good taste. At least, I know what you want in jewelry, he said dryly. Okay, we'll take a break, she said, almost too eagerly. We both have a lot to think about. Guess I'll be in New York while you're in Atlanta for your antique thingy. Maybe we can think more clearly with a few hundred miles between us. Britt made it sound like he was joking and Crystal giggled, despite the fact that he was dead serious. I suppose it's a good thing you didn't bring in my luggage. I'll head back to Baton Rouge and try to catch a flight out before the hurricane hits land in a few days. With any luck, you'll be on a plane by midnight. Before he could speak again, Crystal moved quickly to his side, kissing Britt deeply on the mouth. His lips parted in surprise, and then she quickly broke away, sliding into her bronze-finished Camaro like a cashmere glove. Just remember what you're missing, darling. I will, he said. One hand on the car door, she inserted the key into the ignition, but she didn't catch the irony. Do you want me to drive you back? That's silly. Then you'd be stranded with no way to return to your beloved White Castle. Britt winced at the sarcasm of her words. Call me if you need anything. He stood at the edge of the road, watching the Camaro spit mud as it fishtailed down the long drive back to Highway 1. Crystal lifted her hand in a brief wave without turning around to fling a kiss, as per her usual goodbye when they were in New York together. Had she taken the sudden breakup in stride, or was her pride just covering up her anger and hurt? Shoving his hands into the pockets of his jeans, Britt returned to the house. He let out an unexpected sigh of relief. How could he be so stupid to fall for a woman who was obviously not right for him? or to let it carry on for over a year without realizing the truth. Their interests and goals were worlds apart. Despite all the glittery fun they'd had attending shows and fancy dinners, those activities weren't exactly the best way to get to know someone. He had so hoped Crystal would fall in love with White Castle as he had. He must be one blind and dumb dude. Would he ever find the right woman to share his passions and interests? He was 35, and so far, had been utterly unlucky in love. Maybe he was looking in all the wrong places. Chapter 2 Several Days Later Heavy rains streamed down the windows of Melody de Leon's grandmother's tiny house. It was impossible to see across the street now. With every hour, the hurricane winds grew more fierce more sinister and more frightening. Worry tugged at her as she seized another five-gallon bucket from the windowless garage, hurrying back inside the dark kitchen to stick it under the fresh leak dripping from the ceiling over the dinette table. Melody had been here the past two days after boarding up her little bookstore in the French Quarter. Mary needed her help. No matter what the elderly woman said to brush off her rapidly declining health, she wasn't doing well. Was it just the flu or something worse? Besides, with the impending storm, neither of them wanted to be alone and stuck in their homes. Water slid along the ceiling and plopped into the plastic container in the middle of the stove. Another one sat by the back door, and a fourth sat on the floor between the kitchen and the front room, causing Melody to step over it as she went back and forth. 
The power had been out for hours, and an eerie wind shuddered about the eaves, threatening to tear off the shingles. I swear, the house is going to collapse in on itself, Melody muttered, lifting her head to the ceiling to make sure the old bucket was in the correct place to catch the new leak. A plop of water hit her squarely in the eye. Guess it's in the right place, she said, trying to keep her sense of humor at the absurdity of raindrops running down her face inside the house. She gazed about the various buckets, pots, pans, and bowls around the house, about ten in total with the front hall and three bedrooms. Time to dump the water and start over. Her grandmother's house was old, and living on a small social security check meant that too many repairs had gone unattended. Melanie had tried to convince her to move into an apartment that didn't need maintenance, or move in with her in the little apartment above her bookstore. But her grandmother was stubborn. She had lived in this house her entire life. She had raised her children here, and then her granddaughters, finally tending Melody's grandfather when he'd grown sick and weak after a heart attack more than twenty years earlier. Melody picked her way around the dinette set, bumping her hip into the edge of a chair. Through the small kitchen window, glowering black clouds pressed down like an iron fist. Her heart was in her throat, listening to the pounding rain and wailing wind. Dishes and clutter piled along the counters. When she came to visit her grandmother, she spent a couple of hours cleaning, but today she couldn't use the water or electricity to run the vacuum. Utilities were definitely off. She lit a second kerosene lamp and carried it into the sitting room where Granny Mary lay on the couch, her paper-thin eyelids blue with tiny veins. Another drop of water hit Melody's head. Her hair was getting wetter by the minute just maneuvering around the house. Think I'm in a losing battle, Granny, she said, forcing a cheery tone. She didn't want to alarm her grandmother but they should have left and gone somewhere north. For instance, camped out in her sister Chrissy's apartment. Melody had no idea her granny was so ill, not until she had arrived last night to check on her. After 24 hours, the rain was still coming down. The street was beginning to flood, water creeping like spiders up the steps of the front door. A funny slurping sound caused Melody to stop in her tracks. She stared at the front door. Not two seconds later, Slivers of water slipped under the threshold of the door, moving like an alien across the floor, soaking the rug instantly, rising from a fraction of an inch to a full inch within minutes. Melody's heart hammered in her chest. We can't stay here. I'm calling 911. Melly, her grandmother croaked from the sofa. Go, she whispered, attempting to lift a weak hand. Melody put a hand to her grandmother's burning forehead. Her eyelids fluttered as she strained to stay conscious. You've got a fever now, she said in a steady voice, not wanting to alarm her. Quickly, she punched the numbers on her phone, grateful there was still cell service. Emergency services, the switchboard said. I'm on Old Mellon Road, Melody said quickly. My grandmother is very ill and our house is flooding. I need an ambulance. From the other side of the room, her grandmother tried to lift her hand, shaking her head. No ambulance. Go to White Castle. Rushing over, Melody said, What do you mean, Granny? What's White Castle? Ma'am, the emergency operator said on the other end of the line. Are you still there? Yes, I'm here. At the rate the floodwaters are coming in, we're going to be submerged in the next couple of hours. My grandmother is 87 years old. I can't move her by myself. I need help, please. Her older sister, Avery, who was a wedding dress seamstress for a high-end store in Chicago, had been pestering Melody to put their grandmother into a nursing home. But Melody couldn't abide ripping her beloved grandmother out of the only home she'd known. In fact, this house was mostly the only home Melody had ever known herself. When their parents had been killed in a car accident, the three girls had moved in with their grandparents. Melody had only been three, and her two older sisters, seven and ten, Mary was not only her grandmother, but her mother, the woman who had rocked her to sleep and tended all the bruises and growing pains of her life. Up until the last few weeks, Mary had been healthy and active, but this puzzling fever kept returning. Once she got her out of this flooding house and into a hospital, Melody would demand more tests from the doctors. But right now, the imminent flooding was getting desperate. The dispatcher's voice came again. We have emergency personnel in boats near your neighborhood. I'll radio them to stop by your house. 
Hopefully you'll see them in the next hour. Good, Melody said, relief flowing through her. I'm at number 21, directly after the sugarcane fields on the right. Do you know what her temperature is right now? Five minutes ago, it was 103.5. She's been running a fever off and on for a week now. Put an ice pack on her forehead and make sure she's comfortable. Call me back if anything changes and watch for the emergency boat. Melody hung up and slipped the phone into the back pocket of her jeans. Moving quickly, she scurried to the ice bin in the freezer, but there were only a few melting slivers left. Sweat dribbled down her brow and into her eyes. The house was as hot as an oven without the A.C. running. She lit a fat candle and set it on the kitchen table, which was cluttered with plants and books and papers she'd picked up from the floor. The water level was now five inches deep, and she sloshed through it like a wading pool. Placing the last few ice cubes into a plastic bag, Melody zipped it closed while hurrying back into the front room. She shoved the two front windows up so she could hear any approaching boats. After placing the cool bag on Mary's forehead, she perched on the edge of the sofa, holding her hand. Too much was happening all at once. Mary's illness, and now the flooding in the aftermath of the winds that had torn up the city. At the moment, her grandmother appeared to be sleeping, though her breath was shallow and raspy, her skin hot and dry. The next moment, her lips parted and she tried to speak. Chrissy, Avery, my babies. Melody spoke in a soothing voice, stroking her hand. Avery lives far away in Chicago, remember? I'm here, and you're going to be just fine as soon as the rescue boat gets here. Unfortunately, Chrissy, the middle sister, wasn't in Louisiana very often. She was always on the move with her job or another man, after divorcing her first husband two years ago. Straining her ears for any sound from outside, Melody noticed the neighborhood turned eerily quiet. Had all the neighbors left? If only she'd had a four-wheel drive truck, Melody would have tried to transport Mary by herself. The house was dank and dismal, and every inch higher the water rose, her panic rose with it. Peering out the window, Melody realized that there was no way driving in the high floodwaters would be safe. The truck would be flooded, and they could easily be carried away to their deaths. Already the neighbor's yards had disappeared under the dark, murky water. Working nonstop each day at the bookstore in downtown New Orleans, Melody wasn't used to sitting still, and the constant brown water seeping under all the doors unnerved her to no end. Punching numbers on her phone again, she muttered, Pick up, pick up. Finally, a male voice answered, Melody? Vince, yes, it's you, thank goodness. Mary's house is flooding. I'm waiting for an emergency boat, but it could be hours. She's ill and running a fever. I'm ready to jump out a window and start swimming. Can you come and get us in your boat? Huh? Her boyfriend said, shock in his voice. There's no way. I'm ten miles from you. Flooding's everywhere. And it's getting dark. All the updates on my phone are telling me to evacuate. But I don't dare put Mary into my car only to get swept away. I'm getting scared. Vince didn't respond to her pleas or seem particularly worried. How bad's the flooding over there? Up to my knees and dirty and cold. I'm terrified of snakes coming in from the cane fields and worried about Mary. She's really sick, and I can't move her by myself. You say you, you got a boat coming to get you? I called 911. You sound funny. What's wrong? I was at the bookstore an hour ago. It's gone. Melody's throat went dry. You mean, my bookstore? Books on the Mississippi? How is it gone? Water's closing in on the rafters all downtown. Melody could hardly speak, images of destruction running past her eyes. Books floating up to the ceiling, Vince went on. Water's two feet deep in the apartment. The store was Melody's livelihood, her home, everything. That means my entire life is gone. Uh, pretty much, Vince said. Sorry. Melody's gut tugged with fresh anxiety. You sound funny, Vince. What's going on? Are you okay? 
There was a brief moment of silence, and then he cleared his throat. I figure this is as good a time as any to tell you. I'm clearing out of New Orleans. Lived through two hurricanes over the past two decades, and I can't take it no more. Where are you, Vince? Right this minute. Surely not at the bookstore. Nope. I cleared out. I'm with Roxy. Roxy. Melody echoed dully, her throat swelling with emotion. Roxy. She's the waitress I told you about. Melody had an urge to punch him through the phone. You mean the waitress at the diner who gave you a free meal for fixing the belt on her truck? Yeah, that's her. The air left Melody's lungs. Her boyfriend was deserting her. For some floozy with a chest the size of Lake Pontchartrain. Her bookstore, her livelihood, and her home was destroyed. Melody wavered on her feet, trying to take it all in and not break down in hysterics. You're leaving me? She finally said, her voice cracking. Um, yeah. Sorry, Melody, at bad timing, huh? Wow, Vince. Apologies were never your forte, but in three sentences, you just told me that you're running away with another woman and my entire life is destroyed. A buzzing static came over the phone and Vince was gone. Whether he'd hung up on her or the connection was lost due to the weather, Melody would probably never know. She wanted to scream at him. She deserved a moment of satisfaction to tell him off, but he'd denied her that. Ironically, she had recently thought Vince might be getting ready to propose so they could start a family. After all, she had turned 30 last year. What an idiot she was. Melody bit back the tears of frustration that threatened to overwhelm her. She couldn't think about Vince or her bookstore. Mary was all that mattered right now. She took Mary's temperature again. It was still over 103 and getting close to 104. Growling in her throat, she sloshed through the knee-deep water, kicked at a floating bucket, and then yanked the curtains apart again. Down the road, or river now, a boat was coming toward the house. Hallelujah, she cried, going into high gear. Splashing through the living room, she jerked at the front door, trying to open it, but the door wouldn't budge from the water on both sides. Letting out a low curse word, she raced back to the window soaking herself in the process and creating waves that splashed over her torso. Her teeth began to chatter. Popping out the screen, she leaned along the ledge, waving her arms frantically. We're over here, she yelled. We're stuck inside. The emergency officials saw her and accelerated the engine, forming a deep V in the water behind the boat. I can't get the door open, she shouted when they got closer to the front door. My grandmother is ill, almost comatose. Two huge men with broad shoulders jumped out of the boat, sloshing through the water in thigh-high waders. Stand back from the front door, they warned. We're going to try to break it down. A second man wearing the uniform of a paramedic climbed out next. What are your grandmother's symptoms? High fever, pale skin, raspy cough. Anything I should know about, like diabetes, high blood pressure, previous strokes? Melody shook her head. Nothing like that. She's 87 but healthy. We'll get her to the hospital right in a jiffy, ma'am, he told her. Melody gave him a tremulous smile. He was young, probably not more than 23, but if he had medical training, she wouldn't argue. She felt such relief at one of her worries being taken care of that tears pricked at her eyes. Within minutes, the front door was off its hinges. The paramedic had done a quick exam on Mary, and they loaded her onto a stretcher, carrying her to the boat and lifting her up with careful hands. I'm coming too, Melody shouted, grabbing a rain slicker, a jacket, dry socks, and shoes to replace her squishy ones that were a horrid mess after wading around in water for the last few hours. Earlier, she had packed a backpack with two sets of clean clothes and a few toiletries. Snatching both her handbag and backpack off the top of the fridge, she double-checked that she had her wallet and credit cards and shoved the purse in the top of the backpack. One of the rescuers helped boost her into the boat, and she toppled ungracefully inside. Holding Mary's cold hands in hers, 
the speedboat revved its engine while they cut through an ocean of water that covered the landscape as far as she could see. Chapter 3 Staggering devastation lay before them. Homes half underwater. Fields flooded with only the tips of sugarcane stalks above, about a month before harvest season. Skirting debris and fallen trees, floating tires, and a myriad of personal waterlogged possessions, the paramedics continued to check Mary's vitals. The two men who had been out all day rescuing people from their homes called out to a young couple hanging out their windows when the boat passed. Need a rescue? The husband shook his head. Thanks. I got a brother coming any minute with a boat. The man at the engine nodded. Call emergency if you have any trouble, and we'll come back and get you. After 30 minutes, the hospital finally came into view, and Melody wanted to cry with relief. Granny Mary was so still, so quiet. She was terrified at her condition. The paramedics tied up the boat just below the hospital emergency entrance because the building was sitting higher than the floodwaters. Only a few inches of sloshy water surrounded the sandbag doors as they carried her grandmother inside. The lights and sounds of the hospital were welcoming, nurses and doctors bustling up and down the hallways and in and out of the triage cubicles tending patients. A cup of hot tea was thrust into Melody's hands, accompanied by a clipboard of admissions paperwork while they took Mary into an exam room. Drink this, love. You look stunned. I'll be back to update you on your grandmother's condition in ten minutes. Melody nodded, trying to get past the dizzy motion rolling through her body. Worry gnawed at her throat and stomach. After quickly scribbling down the information on the intake paperwork, she rose to her feet, gulped down the hot, comforting herbal tea, and then set the cup down on a table where other volunteers were manning drinks and food for patients and family members. Just as she reached the cubicle, the same nurse pushed back the curtains. Come on in, miss, uh, sorry, I'm Melody de Leon, her granddaughter. How is she? What's wrong with her? You took good care of her under difficult circumstances, the nurse said. We're taking her for chest x-rays, but the doctor thinks she's got pneumonia. And that explains the high fever and raspy cough. She needs a few good doses of antibiotics and lots and lots of rest. Can I take her with me and care for her? The nurse gave Melody a wry smile. From what I understand, her house is underwater. What about yours? Melody gave a short laugh. <laughs> I heard from my a friend that my house and business are completely flooded. I'm not sure where to go. I guess that was foolish thinking I could get her somewhere else. Any other family close by? She chewed on her lips, shaking her head. My sister in Baton Rouge is out of town. My other sister lives in Chicago. There's a group of Cajun fishermen with boats transporting folks out of the flood zone. They'll help you get away from the major flooding. But I don't want to leave my grandmother. I can't. She's going to be in good hands here, I assure you the nurse said, reaching out to squeeze Melody's hand. Your grandmother's age is delicate despite her past good health. The high temperature and the fluid in her lungs need to be monitored. I know it's a sacrifice not to be with her, but you can visit as soon as the water recedes in a week or so. A week? Melody echoed. What would she do until then? Her boyfriend had deserted her. Her neighbors were probably with family or had left the city. Her co-workers, who knew? And now her purpose for staying, taking care of her grandmother, had been taken away. She had hoped to sleep in the empty hospital bed next to Mary, but she realized that every bed was full, with more people flooding the hospital doors every minute needing help. I'm sorry, the nurse said, gazing at Melody's stricken face. We're all dealing with the upheaval, but your grandmother will get the best care. You have my promise. My home is gone, so I'm camping out here in the hospital round the clock. A shiver ran up Melody's spine. I'm so sorry. Thank you for taking care of her. I guess I can leave the hospital knowing she's in good hands. I'll try to figure out where to go, she added, her mind whirling as she tried to figure out where that might be. I'll be with her every day, sweetheart. Now, go in and talk to her. 
then we'll be whisking her off to X-ray. Biting back hot tears, Melody nodded again, following her to the curtained cubicle. Granny, she whispered, bending over to stroke the tangled gray hair from her forehead. Are you awake? Her grandmother's eyes fluttered, but she didn't open them. Yes, she said faintly, her fingers grappling for the sheet with a weakness that shocked Melody. I'm right here, and you're in the hospital. They're going to take good care of you, but I have to go find shelter somewhere, if I can find a boat to take me. No, Mary said, her lips barely moving. Go home. Go home. My apartment is gone. Her grandmother tried to wave away her words, but her hand fell limply to her side, her eyes closing again. White castle. You don't give in, do you? She said, trying to make a joke. Mary's lip tried to form the words again, but she was too weak. Melody leaned down to kiss her cheek. I don't know what you're talking about. She waited for a response, but her grandmother had fallen unconscious. It's time, the nurse said at the door. Reluctantly, Melody slid her hand from her grandmother's fragile fingers and slipped slowly through the white curtains of the cubicle. For a moment, she stood shell-shocked staring at the hustle and bustle of the emergency entrance. People continued to stream through via boat or on foot, soaked to the skin, to be treated for cuts and gashes, broken bones, and some even carrying crying children. Grabbing her phone out of her purse, she saw that the hospital had Wi-Fi. A small miracle. Melody put White Castle into her Maps app. What exactly was White Castle? It sounded vaguely familiar but her brain wasn't working at the moment. The little town was only about 90 minutes away, northwest from New Orleans. It looked like she could take Interstate 10, cross the Mississippi, and finally cut down Highway 1 straight there. But how long would it take with clogged roads and flooded riverbanks? This is completely crazy, Melody said out loud. I need to go to a shelter. But she had promised Mary and her grandmother would darn well ask her about it later. Maybe Granny Mary would laugh at herself and declare she must have been delirious. Except her grandmother hadn't been delirious at all, just emphatically insistent. Outside the hospital doors, it was still raining. Melody pulled her jacket hood over her head and gazed about. At least she had cash with her. One of the male hospital orderlies stepped out to glance at the sky, and Melody walked forward. Excuse me, do you have any idea how I get out of town? Or if there's a way to get a cab or Uber? Heard there's a ride board on the other side of the hospital in the lobby. Check there. Good luck. Melody smiled her thanks and trudged through the hospital again, searching for the corridor that would take her to the main entrance. The sheeted cubicle where she had just said goodbye to her grandmother was now occupied by someone else. A pain flashed in her chest, but she told herself to toughen up. Everyone was displaced, soaking wet or searching for loved ones. There was actually a camaraderie among the people standing at the ride board, discussing various routes and transportation possibilities to get out of the flooded city. Melody hung around for thirty minutes, eyeing an empty corner of linoleum she could lie down on when a middle-aged couple approached and told her they were headed to Baton Rouge to their daughter's home that hadn't flooded yet, and they'd be glad to take her to White Castle. You're very kind, but that's so out of your way, Melody said, guilt streaming through her. Nonsense, Miss Herbert said firmly. It's not that far from Baton Rouge, and it's nearly dark now. The rain is worsening again, Mr. Herbert agreed. I suggest we get a move on, young lady. Our car is this way, and we don't want to leave you behind, alone. The city is going to get very dangerous in the next hour or two. And, he added gently, it will help us to know that we've helped you. Chapter 4 No sooner had Melody climbed inside the Camry sedan than the rain began to fall in torrents. Traffic crawled with escaping residents on a few city streets that hadn't flooded yet, but Mr. Herbert finally reached higher ground an hour later. After another four hours, they finally reached the turnoff to Highway 1 and White Castle. 
The power was out everywhere, and the darkness intense and brooding. Not a single light could be seen beyond the vehicle's headlights, while shadows of hulking oak trees lined the roads. The rain was abysmal, drumming against the windshield while the wipers moved back and forth at top speed. Your daughter must be so worried, Melody said from the back seat. Mrs. Herbert brushed off her concerns. We're almost to White Castle and not more than an hour to our daughter's home. At least we have a place to go. You lost everything, my dear, and I'm so sorry. You must be devastated. Your bookstore sounds wonderful. The floodwaters will recede in a week or so, and then it'll just be all the mucking out and cleaning up, Mr. Herbert said in his deep, comforting voice. Mostly elbow grease. Melody tried not to think about her bookstore. Although she had thought about it plenty while she made small talk with the Herberts over the last few hours. You are very kind, but I'm not even sure I want to deal with it right now. Maybe I should just sell the store. What she didn't say was that all her memories had washed away with the hurricane and the flooding. Along with all her hard work of the last three years getting the bookstore up and running. And now... Her boyfriend was gone, too. How had she misjudged him so badly? At the first sign of trouble, Vince pulled out and disappeared. Is this White Castle? Melody asked, pressing her face up against the Camry side window. This is the little town, yes, said Mr. Herbert. It's so tiny. I had no idea. <laughs> you need to get to know your state, Mr. Herbert said with a chuckle but I thought White Castle was a historical plantation. Actually, the plantation mansion is on the other side of town, called Nottingham, actually. Its nickname is White Castle because it looks like a castle, at least from the outside, but we've never been inside. Melody's stomach jumped and her heart gave a peculiar flutter in her chest. Why had her grandmother sent her here? Most of all, what sort of shape was the place in? Was it even livable? Maybe it was filled with sunken ceilings and rotting floorboards. She might end up camping outside with no tent or sleeping bag. Melody was woefully unprepared. She'd only come because her grandmother had insisted and because New Orleans was unlivable right now. She had no money for a hotel either. The bookstore expenses drained her bank account every single month. I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place, she muttered. So many folks are suffering right now, Mrs. Herbert murmured sympathetically, not understanding Melody's meaning, but her husband frowned and glanced in his rearview mirror with concern. Have you got people here to meet you? he asked. Melody gave a small smile. I'll be perfectly fine, she assured him. If Grandmother Mary had sent her here, she had to be fine. There had to be a reason. She would just have to make the best of it. Even so, hot tears pricked at her eyes while she fumbled for her cell phone and turned it on. She had turned it off once Mary was at the hospital to save battery power. Hopefully, there was a cell tower out here. One bar of service lit up the screen. Weak, but a call could go through if she found herself in trouble. Mr. Herbert pointed through the windshield. Here's the sign for Nottingham. You can drop me off right here, Melody told him. It's much too dark, Miss Herbert protested. You'll fall into a ditch or something. I grew up camping, and I'm wearing my boots. I don't want you to get your car stuck in the mud out here yourselves. It's so cloudy. There's no way to see where you're going, Mr. Herbert said. Here, take this flashlight to help you get to the house. He reached over to open the glove compartment and pulled out a hefty black flashlight which he pressed into Melody's hand despite her protests. Thank you so much. Somehow, I'll get your flashlight back to you. How far up this road is the house? No more than a fraction of a mile. Don't see any lights, so power must be out here, too. Melody's heart sank. Guess there's not much I can do about it, she said with forced cheerfulness. Well, here goes nothing, she added when Mr. Herbert finally eased the car to a stop. Mrs. Herbert insisted on exchanging contact info so she could check on Melody. If you have any trouble, you call us immediately. I will, Melody promised. Thank you again. She lifted her hand in farewell when the Herbert slowly drove off. What am I thinking?
she said aloud. Silence filled her ears, and she gave a faint groan of trepidation. The headlights of the car disappeared around the next bend. It was drizzling now, not nearly as bad as New Orleans had been, at least for the moment. After lifting the hood of her jacket over her head, she trudged up the gravel drive. Deep darkness enveloped her with damp arms as though it were alive. Cautiously, she walked past hulking shadows of cypress and oak trees. Overhead, not a single star peeked through the mist-laden clouds that hugged the earth. The only sound was the crunch of loose gravel under her feet. Wild animals were probably cowering in their underground homes or holes of trees, but not even an owl hooted overhead. Not a single cricket or insect chirped or buzzed. It was as though Melody were the last living person on earth. She flipped on the flashlight and stuck it under her arm, shoving her cold hands into her pockets. But that just made her feel as though she were a beacon, a target for anybody from the house who might be watching her. So she turned it off again just as quickly. But who would be watching? The property was uninhabited, right? Many of Louisiana's historic plantations conducted tours for visitors and tourists, but there were others that were crude and simple. Definitely not the handsome, well-appointed showpieces that other historic mansions were in other locations of the South. A colossal shadow appeared on her left, growing closer, and her stomach jumped in anticipation. But it wasn't a grove of trees. A moment later, the faint scent of roses floated on the air. Melody cautiously crossed a waterlogged, mushy lawn toward the fragrance. Roses were usually a sign of a garden. Slowing, she snapped on the flashlight again, not wanting to trip over a hose or raised flower bed or run straight into a gate. In the beam of light, flower beds appeared out of the darkness. Empty fountains surrounded her. Broken branches lay strewn everywhere, along with damaged rose bushes and stripped magnolia trees. The storm had come through here, too. Melody stepped over a large branch lying across a stone pathway, which led to a brick pathway and then to a second fountain, filled with two feet of dirty rainwater. The sound of rushing water came from the right, and her heart raced with sudden fear. Had the Mississippi overtaken its banks? Was it flooding, and was she in its path? Picking up her pace, she scanned the yard more closely, trying to get her bearings in relation to the house. Not a second later, she slipped, flailing and extinguishing the flashlight in her arms while trying to keep her balance, only to land flat on her back in a large mud puddle. Ouch! she moaned, her backside hurting like the dickens. Her jeans were now slick and dripping mud. Great. She was colder and soggier than ever. Clutching her backpack, Melody struggled to rise, her feet slipping and sliding in the slick mud. Finally, riding herself, she snapped the button on the flashlight again and moved the light about, trying to figure out where the house actually sat, even though she was fairly certain it was the looming shadow blocking the clouds. Could I get any more miserable? She muttered, gritting her teeth. Suddenly, in the beam of the flashlight, the great hulking mansion rose like a sparkling white specter under the monstrous black clouds. The drizzle of rain did nothing to diminish its utter grandeur or pure white color. If she hadn't known better, Melody would have thought the house was floating in the air. But as she focused the sweeping beam of the flashlight, she spotted wide, half-circular granite steps that rose to a front porch and double doors that had been at least twelve feet in height. Melody sucked in a breath. She had never expected a house like this. She assumed the name White Castle had been some sort of inside joke. Gigantic, twenty-feet-tall columns graced the front of the mansion, and there were at least three floors above the ground level. As Melody approached the house, a sense of deja vu washed over her, causing her scalp to tingle. Had she ever been here before? Is that what her grandmother was remembering in her delirious fever and illness? Some long-ago trip to this place? The fever had probably jumbled Miri's memories, crossing the wires of her brain into confusion. Or was there some other connection to this magnificent piece of Southern history? Chapter 5 her heart was in her throat when Melody grasped the doorknob, afraid it might be locked and she'd be stuck outside all night. Surprisingly, it wasn't, and surprisingly, the doorknob didn't fall out of its hole. 
She gave a tug, and the carved door swung open on well-oiled hinges. No squeaky, spooky haunted house here. Once inside, she couldn't make out a single thing. The place was as dark as a cave. Either it was completely hollowed out, or the power was still out. Her bet was on both, since the windows had been dark ever since the Herberts had dropped her off. What an idiot she was, coming all the way out here, only to find absolutely nothing. But Melody loved her grandmother, and at least she would be able to return to the hospital and tell Mary that she had fulfilled her wishes, even if she had to find a tree in which to spend the night. Now what do I do, she said, throwing the beam of the flashlight forward to make sure she didn't fall into a hole. Melody staggered in shock. Beautiful antique rugs covered polished parquet floors, at least 30 feet in length along a wide dramatic foyer. Shaking her head in disbelief, Melody stopped, aware that she was tracking mud. When she cast the beam of her light upward, a magnificent curving staircase with molded mahogany wood climbed up into the darkness of the second story. She tilted her head back, and a stunning antique chandelier hung directly over her head. Chandeliers? Carpets? Am I dreaming? Without warning, footsteps suddenly sounded above her, and a powerful beam of light crisscrossed the foyer like a spotlight. Instantly, Melody snapped off her light and dropped to her knees, shutting her eyes like a little kid, as if she could hide. Who's there? came a deep male voice. Melody's throat was dry and she couldn't speak. She only wished she could sink into the floor, sink down, down, into the broken basement she had expected to find ever since she left New Orleans. The smell of lemons and dust and antique furniture wafted over her nose. The smell of old houses and brittle books. Who's there? The voice called out again, and, as if a switch had been flipped, the chandelier lit up like a Christmas tree above her. Melody lifted a hand to shield her eyes from the sudden light, after so much darkness. She squinted when the teardrop crystals showered a thousand halo-like prisms around the great hall. A moment later, she fell back on her heels with a gasp, her heart thundering like a piston. At the top of the staircase stood the most beautiful man she had ever encountered in her life. Chapter 6 Standing at the top of the staircase, Britt held his lamp steady, scanning the downstairs hallway. This is a private residence, he called down. Can I help you? The next moment, his breath was in his throat. A woman with wild, dark hair and large blue eyes was crouched on her knees, staring up at him like a deer in the headlights. In the circle of light, she looked like an angel, despite wet hair plastered across her cheeks and a desperate, frightened look in her eyes. She was stunning. Pale, luminescent skin, parted red lips, and a pair of deep blue eyes that made such a dramatic contrast to her thick black hair. It had to be close to midnight, and he hadn't slept a wink yet after checking windows and potential leaks in the attic from the storm. Britt probably looked like an idiot the way he was staring at her, but the sight of her was so totally unexpected. The woman finally spoke, her voice hesitant but lovely. I, I thought the house was deserted. I'm sorry. The door was unlocked. Not deserted, but mostly empty, Britt said with a self-deprecating chuckle. It's just me, at least after hours. She shook her head, confusion crossing her features while droplets of rain fell to the rugs. After hours? The Nottingham Mansion is on the historical register and open for tours during the day. At least when there's not an actual hurricane churning overhead. Right, she said slowly. I kind of knew that, but I didn't know it was so striking and well-appointed. She gazed around the hall at the antique furniture and then lifted her eyes to the chandelier. I was expecting it to be run down. You know, uh, decrepit, falling apart. Britt cocked his chin. You were expecting the house to be run down? He paused. So you came here on purpose? In this hurricane? She lifted her shoulders in a tiny shrug. My house in New Orleans is gone. Everything. She said the last words in a whisper, and Britt took a step down the staircase, 
snapping off his industrial-sized flashlight now that the electricity appeared to be restored. Shuffling on her knees, the woman tried to get up, but she moved unsteadily and her sneakers squished with water. I'm so sorry, she said, staring down at the pooling splotch of mud with horror. It's just water. Oh, and a little dirt, Brett added with a wink and a grin. I'll clean it up. She gave him an embarrassed smile. This is the sort of house where I should arrive in a ball gown and allow a footman to help me down from my carriage. I can imagine you doing just that, Britt said with a soft laugh. Inwardly, he groaned. What a stupid thing to say. She bit her lip and took a tentative step backward. I apologize. I didn't mean anything suggestive by that. It's the house. It does that to me. It's the magic of the antebellum period. The elegance and charm. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. Now I'm talking too much. She gave a wry smile. You took the words right out of my mouth. The house is magnificent. I love it already. So you drove all the way from New Orleans? I didn't see a car drive up when I was checking for leaky windows on the parking lot side. I was dropped off by a nice couple who were on their way to Baton Rouge. You came to White Castle on purpose? I'm sorry to be confused. It's not the sort of place people think, Oh, there's a hurricane. Think I'll go hang out at White Castle. She laughed, covering her mouth, and Britt was drawn to the shy but infectious sound. That makes two of us, she said. I thought the house was uninhabited. I planned to snoop around and then report back to Mary, so she would get better and I could bring her home, she added, as if that explained everything. Giving a laugh, Britt shook his head. <laughs> Who's Mary? A realtor or something? No, she burst out, covering her mouth again. The gesture was endearing and charming. Mary is my grandmother. The grandfather clock in the hall began to chime, and Britt paused to listen as he always did. The young woman did as well, her lips turning upward into a smile of delight, erasing the look of panic she had had moments earlier. Standing utterly still, she listened as the twelve deep bongs began to signal midnight, and they turned to stare at each other, only a few feet apart now. Britt tried to suppress the strange rise of emotion in his chest. This woman was having an odd effect on him. He wanted to protect her, shield her from the lost look in her eyes, wrap her up in a cozy blanket, and just hold her in front of a roaring fire. There was definitely something wrong with him. Only an hour earlier, he'd been moping about Crystal wondering how he was going to recover from the woman he thought he'd be marrying in a few months. She had left a week ago, but the scenario of the strange night where he'd given her a diamond ring and they'd broken up, or decided to take a break or whatever had happened, still puzzled him. They hadn't spoken since, except for a couple of brief texts when he checked on her safety after she got home that night. The final bong of the grandfather clock reverberated in the air and the woman let out a deep breath, as though she'd been holding it the entire time. That is the most exquisite clock I've ever seen. I love the rich sound it makes. I need to get one for my bookstore. You own a bookstore? Yeah. Books on the Mississippi. But it's currently sitting underwater in New Orleans. Her answer shocked him, and he winced. Wow, I'm so sorry. That's awful but I'm still confused about why you came to White Castle. That's a good question, she said, tiny frown lines creasing her brow. My grandmother insisted, and my apartment sits above the bookstore, so I literally have nowhere to go. I have a sister in Baton Rouge, but she said she was headed out of the state several days ago, and I don't have a key to her place. My other sister is in Chicago, and that's a little harder to get to with airports closed and no vehicle. Don't tell me you walked all the way here from New Orleans, Britt said. No, I got a ride from a lovely couple outside the hospital. That's right, you did say that. Are you hurt? No, 
My grandmother was admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. Her house flooded, and we were rescued by boat paramedics. The city is flooded, just like Katrina 15 years ago. It's insane, she added, her voice falling to a whisper. You've been through a lot. I'll bet you're worried about your grandmother. She looked into his face curiously. You don't even know me. And yet, you're more compassionate than my boyfriend was when I told him how ill Miri is. You have a boyfriend? Britt was dismayed by the knowledge, and he tried to shake it off, but he didn't like the idea of her being taken, whatever that meant. Her presence invigorated him, and Britt wanted to know all about this stunning creature who had landed here in the middle of a hurricane at midnight. Sorry, I'm spilling my guts. But let me correct that. My former boyfriend, she added with emphasis. He ditched me and took off for greener pastures, companionship-wise as well as location. I don't even know where he is. I don't care. And good riddance. She blushed at her strong tone and pressed her hands against her face. I'm really not a crazy person. Never crossed my mind, Britt assured her. Just the opposite, he found himself thinking. She was so open, refreshing, thinking more about her family than herself. If Crystal had lost her home and business and ended up drenched and wet and muddy at some strange house, she'd have a complete meltdown. It was odd how strongly he knew that now. Life with Crystal would have been stressful and wearing. Relief flooded him. No more moping, that was for sure. Please, he said, follow me to the kitchen. Let me get you some hot tea or something. You must be freezing. I couldn't possibly stay. If you call a cab, I'll be out of here. My phone is almost dead. You wouldn't happen to have a power cord, would you? Of course, I keep spare ones for guests who forget to pack theirs. Where would a cab take you? if the cities are flooded. And there's nothing round here but gators, swamp, and sugarcane fields for miles and miles. I'll be out of your hair. I didn't mean to barge in on you. But who are you exactly? Honestly, I thought the place was a hollow, deserted shell. She shook her head as if embarrassed by her rambling thoughts. Sorry, I'm Britt Mandeville. Caretaker, gardener, landscaper, handyman, etc. She quirked her lips, amused. Etc. Jack of all trades? He grinned. Except my name is Britt instead of Jack. <laughs> Good one, she laughed. A warm feeling spread through Britt's chest at being able to make her laugh. He loved the musicality of her voice, the sparkle in those rich blue eyes. She seemed a little nervous, although how could he blame her? She'd just lived through a horror in New Orleans, and he was a total stranger to her. The kitchen is downstairs, actually. Follow me this way. Brett rounded the circular staircase to descend to the floor below. After a few steps, he looked backward. She wasn't following him. Is something wrong? He asked. I, maybe I should just walk back to the nearest town, find someone at the gas station, or maybe a Payphone. Haven't you heard? He teased. Payphones are an ancient invention. I'll get you my cell phone. She glanced over her shoulder toward the door, then began to sidle backward. Britt felt like an idiot again. Of course she was nervous about going downstairs with a total stranger. I'm sorry, he apologized, holding up his hands. You can never be too careful these days, right? You don't know me. We're all alone in the house. I, I understand. I'll give you my cell phone and ID. I promise I am the caretaker. Look me up on the internet. There's a computer in the back room on the other side of the staircase. Here. He handed her the flashlight he'd switched off. You can club me with this, if it helps give you peace of mind. Melody took the flashlight and held it in her fist like a weapon. Now she had two of them. Okay. Give me your wallet. Please. She laughed as if realizing that she sounded like a mugger. Pulling it out of the back pocket of his jeans, Britt flipped it open. 
There was his driver's license, his social security card, and a couple of credit cards that matched his other ID, including a name tag he used for his job here at the mansion. She examined them, glancing up to study his face and the photos, then pressed the button on his cell phone. If you take it across the foyer, he told her, there's a room you can go into if you want to make a phone call. I'll go out on the porch if you don't mind. I'll wait right here. Take your time. Britt plopped himself onto the steps of the staircase and leaned back, giving her a smile of reassurance. He liked that she hadn't just taken his word for anything. He could be a squatter or a burglar caught in the house. He liked her independent thinking and measured calm. But the moment she walked out the front door, he found himself desperately hoping she'd come back inside and not disappear into the storm-soaked night. Chapter 7 Melody leaned against the wide front door frame, taking deep breaths. Her brain whirled like a merry-go-round, thoughts ricocheting off the corners of her mind. White Castle was gorgeous, and she hadn't even seen it properly yet. At the moment, the mansion was all shadowy Victorian rooms, with a caretaker that about made her swoon. She had been careful not to fall into his arms in her relief at finding out she wasn't spending the night in a rat-infested barn. Britt Mandeville had a working cell phone, and the house was actually warm. He must have a fire burning somewhere, and there was a kitchen, probably with food and water and real beds with blankets. It was enough to make a girl weep. Despite Mr. Mandeville's exquisite looks, rugged chin, and broad shoulders, she had been taught to check into a stranger's background, especially since she was a couple of miles out of town, if you could call that one road, tiny gas station, cafe, and post office a town at all. It was no surprise that it was pouring rain again, too. The wind blew so hard the rain slanted across the huge porch that ran almost the full length of the house. Melody huddled under the eaves and punched a number on the phone. She had a friend from college who was now a police dispatcher in New Orleans. When the connection went through, Melody quickly gave Sally Britt's name and info. I hate to bother you when the phones are ringing off the hook with the storm, Melody said, but I'm alone with this guy and I need to know that I'm not going to wake up dead in the morning. Sally laughed and Melody could hear her fingers tapping a keyboard like a professional secretary. Brit Mandeville, huh? Yeah. What have you got on him? I hate him already. He actually takes a good photo for his driver's license. So unfair. I'll trade you places, Sally went on. This guy is hot, in capital letters. <laughs> He's also got incredible eyes and a good haircut, Melody said with a laugh. But serial killers are often psychopaths that know how to charm and deceive. Mr. Mandeville has a squeaky clean record, not even a speeding violation. His address is listed as White Castle. A former employer is some sort of website startup. Uh, now he's the caretaker for White Castle. He has been for a couple of years. Mm, oh, scrolling further down. I guess he used to teach high school. He really is a Brit of all trades. Melody said, letting out her breath. What? Inside joke, Melody said. You already have inside jokes with him? That was fast. Too hard to explain. Guess I won't try to walk into town and hope for a non-existent motel. I'd probably slide off the road into a muddy ditch and spend the night with an alligator as a pillow. Just lock your bedroom door and keep a weapon handy. He already offered all those to me, plus his cell phone. Men who intend to harm you would never do that now. Stay safe and get out of the storm, you idiot, Sally chided. I can hear that dragon rain through the receiver. Gotta run. Phones are ringing off the hook. Thank you, Melody said quickly, but Sally had already hung up. She blew out another breath and pushed against the door, desperate to get out of the weather now. But the door was stuck. The door jam was swollen from the rain. Using her fist to knock on the door, Melody called out, Mr. Mandeville, can you help me open the door? 
She shoved against the heavy doors one more time in case he didn't hear her. At the same moment, the massive front door popped open and she stumbled across the threshold, literally falling against the chest of the tall, solid caretaker. Oh, she cried, her face growing hot when Britt Mandeville threw his arms around her, stopping her from landing flat on her face. I'm sorry, I couldn't get the door, I didn't mean to. She stopped, his face close to hers, too close, when she glanced up at him. A rush of sensation swept over her. Melody tried not to think about the man's hard muscles underneath the soft flannel shirt he was wearing, or his sandpaper jaw, or the pair of amazing lips so close to hers. When she had practically knocked her face into his at the moment they collided, Britt slid his hands along her arms while he bent to gaze into her face, concern in his eyes. You okay? Yep, I'm fine. Perfectly fine. Except for her racing heart and the pounding in her ears, she was calm as summer's morning. Quickly dropping her hands, Melody stepped back, glancing away from those eyes that seemed to penetrate her soul. He stepped back, too. Guess the door stuck. So you're not hurt? No, I'm good. Just fine, she said, trying not to waver on her feet. Um, I'll take that hot tea or cocoa. Whatever you have. Right this way, miss. You never did tell me your name. And you know all my personal details, right down to my weight on my driver's license. Heat rose up in Melody's face. She couldn't stop gazing into those deep green eyes of his and hoped it wasn't too obvious. And yes, she had checked out all his stats, not only his driver's license, but in the flesh even though she had never been the sort of girl to fall for a man on sight. What was the matter with her? <laughs> Damsel in distress syndrome? I'm Melody, Melody de Lyon. That's a good French name, he said warmly, gesturing toward the staircase. I could say the same about you, Mr. Mandeville. Yeah, my family goes way back. A combination of French and Spanish from the 1600s. My grandmother always said that her great-grandfather sailed from France after the Revolutionary War. We're both old-timers in Louisiana then. Figuratively speaking, Melody groaned inwardly. She'd become a silly, tongue-tied girl in the presence of a gorgeous man. Obviously, she needed to blame everything on the storm. She wasn't in her right mind tonight. At the bottom of the staircase... Britt gave her a quick tour of what used to be the basement floor of the original house in the 1850s. This is where the root cellar was, an alcove where the outdoor kitchen was located, storage rooms, slave quarters. It was enclosed in the early 20th century. And if you walk through those swinging doors, we have a restaurant that was added onto the rear of the house with access straight to the gardens. The main entrance is actually the second story although from the front of the house, it appears to be the first floor. That's why there are those pretty curving staircases up to the porch and the double front doors, Melody said, thinking out loud. Can anybody come to White Castle to dine in the restaurant? Yes, it's open to the public, although we mostly get folks that have come for the tour or they're spending the night. Melody's eyes riveted on his again. People spend the night here? Yep, we're a full-fledged bed and breakfast. Don't tell me you do the cooking, too. <laughs> no, he laughed. I'd probably end up serving burned or raw food. Sushi is the only food allowed to be raw. I completely agree. They gazed at each other for a moment, and then Britt got busy boiling water in a red ceramic teapot, while Melody walked through a set of swinging doors to peek into the elegantly laid dining room. It was dusky except for sporadic lightning bolts flashing through the floor-to-ceiling picture windows that led directly to the outside through a set of French doors. The restaurant was a narrow half-circle curving around the back of the house, just as Britt had explained. Candles in china adorned the snowy white tablecloths, while every table got a private view to the outside. It's beautiful, Melody breathed. Very romantic, too. Britt's deep voice spoke behind her as he held the door open. It's dark now, of course, but the windows look out on the fountains and oak trees. 
We even have an enclosed swimming pool beyond the trees when I get around to cleaning it. This place takes massive upkeep. So picturesque, Melody said, her breath catching at his nearness, the scent of his musky cologne wafting across her face. She was self-conscious standing next to this gorgeous man, with her stringy hair, muddy clothes, and no makeup. Hot water's ready, Britt said, allowing Melody to walk underneath his arm back to the warmth of the kitchen. Sit in one of the chairs by the fire and get dry. I tend to turn off the heat when it's just me at night, but when it storms, I keep a fire going down here. Lost power earlier, but at least it's back on now. New Orleans is a nightmare, Melody murmured, her thoughts returning again to her grandmother. Britt's expression was sympathetic when he handed her a cup of lavender tea with a saucer and spoon. I'm glad you got out of there safely, and I'm sorry about your grandmother. I hope she recovers quickly. Melody sipped slowly at the hot drink. Thank you. Can I use your cell phone to call the hospital and check on her? I hate to use up the last of my battery. Of course. Anything you need, just say the word. And here's the phone charger, I promised. He rose and took her cell phone, plugging it into the wall where a charger was already inserted. When Britt took a seat on the other side of the hearth, he abruptly set down his cup and leaned forward to inspect Melody's leg. Miss Melody? he said with an endearing Louisiana accent. I do believe you've hurt yourself. Looks like there's a cut on your leg. Chapter 8 Melody set her teacup on the table with a clatter. Quickly, she leaned over and saw that her jeans had a jagged rip. Underneath the rip was a bloody gash on her calf. Good grief! When did that happen? She grimaced when the wound began to throb. How had she not noticed it before now? You were rescued from your grandmother's house by emergency boat, right? She nodded, gingerly touching the gash where the blood had dried into a long, clumpy ribbon of congealed red. You probably cut it on something in the floodwaters. A branch, a piece of metal floating by, a rock, could be anything. Melody sat back, a weak sensation coming over her now that she was out of danger and sitting in a warm room. The gash was going to leave a terrible scar. No more short skirts for her. How strange that I wouldn't feel something this deep. You're in shock. It's been a traumatic day, and you were more worried about your grandmother. There were moments, Melody whispered, clenching her fingers together, that I thought she was going to die before we were rescued. You did good today, Britt told her, his expression serious. I mean that. You probably saved her life by being there and getting her help. When the rain wasn't letting up yesterday, I left the bookstore and went over last night to stay with her. I could not be with her. Granny, Mary is... She's like my mother. He touched her hand. Your own parents are gone then? She nodded, willing herself to not suddenly cry at his tenderness. An accident took them when I was only three. My sisters and I were raised by Mary and my papa, though he's gone now. I can see why you're so close to her and why you're so worried. He jumped up to open cupboards and retrieve bandages, scissors, and a bottle of medicinal disinfectant. My official first aid kit, he announced. At that moment, the lights went out again. What's that? Melody said with a surprised cry. Did somebody cut the power? Britt's voice was calm. I'm sure it's the storm again. Electricity has been going on and off all day. Made it hard to get any work done on my computer. Oh, right. Melody let out her breath in a whoosh. But I can hardly see a thing outside of the fireplace's perimeter. There aren't many windows here in the kitchen. The logs are mostly coals now, he agreed. Staying where she was... Melody watched Britt rise and rummage through a few more cupboards. A minute later, there was a flash and a sizzling sound of a match as he lit three candles. He placed a candle on the counter behind him, and then the other two on the table at each end where she sat. Kneeling in front of Melody, he asked, Do you mind if I doctor you up? I promise I'll be gentle. She gave a small laugh, a tug of attraction pulling her forward so she could see the candle flames flickering in his dark irises. 
Okay, Doc, she managed to say. But no stitches, please. I'd be embarrassed if I screamed in front of you. I'm already embarrassed at how horrible I look. And I'm sorry for intruding on you. I'm sure you were asleep when I barged in here. You don't look horrible at all, he said, focusing on cleaning up the streaked, dried blood running down into her sock. And nope, I wasn't asleep, but when I heard the front door slam open, it got me out of bed in a hurry. I banged it open. His mouth twitched in another grin. I was afraid we might have looters or burglars. When I grabbed my flashlight, I sure wished I hadn't left my toolbox down here. I'd been working on the drippy faucet earlier. But when I turned on the flashlight and saw you kneeling on the carpet of the entry hall, I almost fell down the stairs. With your black curls and fair skin, I thought, well, you looked just like an angel. You have funny ideas of angels, Mr. Mandeville, she said, trying not to wince when he swabbed the gash with iodine-soaked cotton balls. I'm sure I looked more like a demon crashing into your house during a hurricane with snake-like hair and mud on my cheeks. Melody found him gazing into her eyes and she jumped a little, glancing away and then back again, the pull of his own gaze mesmerizing her. You don't have mud on your face, he told her. Well, maybe just a little bit right here. Britt touched her cheek with a damp cloth while Melody tried not to breathe at his closeness. The warmth of his breath, the scent of his skin. Good grief. What was wrong with her? All clean, he pronounced. Thank you, she said primly, and then laughed at herself. Does this sting? He asked, finishing off the procedure on her leg and inspecting the wound. She swallowed down a wince of pain. Not much. I heard that, he teased. I was never good at pain. My grandmother used to tease me about the time I howled over a scrape on my knee that turned out to be strawberry jam. He let out a belly laugh. <laughs> you have to admit, that's pretty hilarious. Go ahead and laugh, she retorted, feigning insult. My sisters used to all the time. So, how bad is it? Will I need stitches? He furrowed his brow. I think we need to take you right to the hospital. This instant. Are you serious? She spit out, leaning over to get a better look in the dim light. Is it still bleeding badly? While she was spitting out questions, Britt finished placing a large bandage across the gash and sat back on his heels. All done. In a couple of weeks, the scab should fall off and you'll be good as new. You are such a liar, she accused him, suppressing a smile. He chuckled again, lifting his shoulders in a shrug that was so adorable. Melody shivered as though he'd caressed her hand. Just taking your mind off the trauma you endured today. There was a moment of silence between them while they stared at each other. With the flickering candles, the kitchen was cozy and intimate. What you need is sleep, Britt said. It's after 1 a.m. I feel like I've been hit by a sledgehammer. Or a Mack truck. I've been up since four yesterday, listening to the news about the hurricane on the TV and radio. I'll show you to your room. I keep fresh sheets on the beds at all times, but during hurricane season, we rarely get many overnighters. So sleep as late as you need to. I promise you'll feel better in the morning. Thank you, Mr. Mandeville. Melody said, creaking to a standing position. The caretaker handed Melody a flashlight and then flicked on his own again. Hopefully we'll have power back by morning. If not, we have a generator I can get up and running. I didn't want to go outside in the rain and start it up if it was just me tonight. I'll put you in a room upstairs. I sleep down here so you'll have the house to yourself. Feel free to explore the house in the morning. I'll bring breakfast up and leave it at your door about ten. How does that sound? Heavenly. I think I could sleep for two days straight, but I'll be calling the hospital as soon as I wake up. And worrying about Miri all night long. I'll say a prayer for her, Melody, Britt said quietly. Try not to worry. She's in the best place she could be. 
The way he said her name with his soft, country boy accent was like a delicious prayer, and Melody found herself wanting to lean into him. In fact, she must have been unsteady on her feet because Britt took her elbow in his strong hand and guided her upstairs to the second story, unlocking the door to a large suite. Before I forget, here's your phone and the charger. Just plug it into an outlet in your room and hopefully the power will come back on and charge it for you. Britt flashed his light around the room and then went to the mantelpiece, flicking on a lighter to the wicks inside a pair of etched glass kerosene lamps. The Victorian-style lanterns glowed, adding a soft shine that Melody hadn't expected. The lovely bedroom came to life, showing off a four-poster bed with thick comforters, deep, cozy couches, and even a small fireplace with a marble hearth bearing two white candlesticks. This is the best room in the mansion, Britt said. You have your own private bathroom, garden tub, and picture windows overlooking the rose garden. It's absolutely beautiful, Melody said, running her hand along the smooth surface of the fireplace mantle. What do I owe you for the guest room? He spread his hands with a smile. Please, hurricanes are a no-charge season, too, especially for damsels in distress. Melody laughed weakly. <laughs> Is that what I am? He lifted his eyebrows when he grinned. Or a princess in disguise? So, first I was an angel, and now I'm a princess. <laughs> I have you so fooled, Mr. Mandeville, she said with a laugh. In reality, I'm a demon or a pauper with no titles, no fortune, and no good breeding papers. Only dogs are bred. Beautiful young women have pedigrees that descend from queens. When he paused... They stared at each other while Melody became tongue-tied. A moment later, she began to waver on her feet. Suppressing a small grin, Britt asked, Do I need to carry you to the bed before you collapse into a faint, Miss de Leon? That broke Melody's reverie. No, no, of course not. I must be sleeping standing up. Never mind me. I'm going to fall into bed in about thirty seconds. I'll leave you to it, Britt said with a soft smile. There's a house phone on the nightstand. Don't hesitate to call if you need anything. Thank you. You've been very kind. Britt strode to the fireplace where logs and kindling had previously been laid. With a single match, he lit the tinder, and within less than a minute, a flickering fire warmed the chilly room. Despite no power, we have plenty of warm water, so help yourself to the shower. Britt gave Melody a slight, royal bow, then crossed the room to the door. She followed him with her eyes, half wishing the caretaker would sleep in front of the fire so she wouldn't be alone. Melody inwardly groaned with annoyance at herself. Her fears were just plain silly. She'd lived alone for years in her own little apartment above the bookstore. Still, the crashing wind moaned eerily through the oak trees, and the torrential rain slammed against the tiled roof like a battering ram. The old house was massive and solid and had withstood many hurricanes over the last 175 years. There was nothing to worry about. Before I forget, Britt said, turning around on the threshold, here's a key to your room. You can lock the door from inside and feel perfectly safe. When he handed over the old-fashioned key, Melody gave him a wan smile. I think you are reading my mind, sir. Thank you. Britt crossed the hallway toward the staircase and descended, giving her a quick look over his shoulder. Biting at her lips, Melody closed the door lest he think she was staring at him, even though she was staring at him. How did a stunning man like Britt Mandeville become a caretaker of an old house, landscaping and repairing fences? Instead, he looked like an actor for a high-action movie. After wrapping a towel around her bandaged leg to keep it from getting wet, she jumped in the shower, still thinking about him. The sensation of his gentle fingers cleaning her gash, bandaging her up while holding her leg in his large, warm hands, made her shiver, and she found herself blushing at the daydream. You are an idiot, Mel, she said aloud, washing the dirt and grime from the long, stormy day out of her hair. 
a white plushy robe was hanging beside the bathroom door, and Melody slipped her arms through the sleeves, feeling warm at last, while she dried her hair in front of the fire. Carrying a lamp to the night table, she couldn't wait to crawl into bed. But at that moment, a strange light flickered across the balcony windows. A flashlight scanned the yard, and Melody recognized Britt hauling a large limb off a small shed that had obviously fallen during the hurricane. Britt suddenly glanced up at her window, as though he could sense her standing there. Melody's face flushed, and she whirled around to jump into bed. Quickly, she blew out the lamp and snuggled under the thick comforter staring up at the ceiling in the darkened Victorian guest room. She wondered once again why her grandmother had insisted she come to White Castle. Britt Mandeville was an enigma, and her brain spilled over with questions about the man. But her grandmother's almost desperate plea for her presence at this strange southern mansion was the biggest mystery of all. Chapter 9 when Melody woke the next morning, the house was as silent as a tomb. Rolling over, she glanced at the bedside clock. It was nearly nine o'clock. She had slept over seven hours, but was still exhausted from the previous day's trauma. Even so, this was her opportunity to explore the house while the mansion was closed to the public. All night, strange dreams had invaded her sleep. In one, Melody had been endlessly rowing in a dinghy, floodwater surrounding her. No sign of another living soul while Mary lay lifeless on the bottom of the boat. Shivering, Melody had tried to shake off the feeling of doom, burrowing deeper into the blankets. After staggering to the bathroom at about 5 a.m., she had fallen back into a fitful doze, and a second weird dream found her treading water in her flooded bookstore, soggy, swollen books floating by while water lapped about her head and threatened to drown her. Melody dreaded going back into town to clean up and see what she could salvage. Were all her personal belongings in the apartment also ruined? At least she had insurance. Even so, the loss of all those book treasures, especially the section of rare books and first editions, made her want to weep. She stared at the ceiling, visions of looting in downtown New Orleans, store windows smashed, desperate people walking through chest-high, filthy water, just like the aftermath of Katrina's horrible storm. Melody had worked hard to buy the bookstore, pouring her life savings into it, as well as maxing herself out on bank loans. It was no use worrying about it. She couldn't do anything about all the ruined stock at the moment. Burying her head into the downy pillow, her eyes burned with exhaustion, but she had to call the hospital. That was top priority. The electricity had remained on all night and charged her phone, and she had a single bar of service out here away from any major town. Praying it was enough, Melody dialed the hospital and spoke with the head nurse, who put her through immediately. Only two rings sounded before an unknown woman answered. This is Melody de Leon, and I'm looking for my grandmother, Morella de Leon. You have the correct room, the woman said. I'm her nurse, Angela and was just checking on her, so I picked up the phone. She had a restless night and is sleeping now, so I hate to disturb her. Yes, ma'am, but please tell me how she's doing. I brought her in last night. There was a pause as though Angela was checking her charts to see Melody's name on the authorization. Her fever spiked last night. You brought her in just in time. Chest x-ray shows a bad case of pneumonia, but you probably already knew that. She's on some heavy-duty antibiotics, as well as high blood pressure meds and sedatives. Perhaps you can try again later this afternoon. But she's going to be all right, correct? Melody asked, desperate to know. She's very sick, honey. But she's in good hands and responding to the medicines. Try not to worry about her, but you can come in later today if you can make it through town. I wouldn't advise it just yet, though. Crews have barely begun clearing down to trees. There's still way too much flooding, too. Can anybody get back to their homes? The hospital staff is working round the clock. We had a lot of injuries brought in last night. But at least the cafeteria stocked up when they knew the storm was coming. The nurse's voice was light and pleasant, as if she was trying to ease Melody's mind. Guess I'll have to wait. I'm over an hour away in White Castle outside of Donaldson, and I have no transportation at the moment. Call any time you like, honey, but I wouldn't try to travel into town. 
It's very dangerous out there. The nurse paused. It's funny you mention White Castle. Is that your home? Oh, no, I'm... Melody paused, not sure how to explain how she had ended up here. I don't live here. I... Your grandmother was mumbling something about White Castle in the middle of the night when I was checking on her and taking her vitals. She was? That's all she could talk about yesterday when her fever was spiking. You take care now, Miss Melody. Call later this afternoon and your grandmother may be up to talking for a minute or two. Melody finally sat back with a sigh. It was a relief to know Mary was in good hands, but frustrating to be so far away and not see her in person for herself. How strange that her grandmother was still muttering about White Castle. Why, why, why? Was her grandmother having sudden dementia? The idea was both disturbing and frightening. Staggering to her feet, Melody sorted through her backpack, dressing in her only set of fresh clothes. Then she brushed out her hair, which was sticking up in weird angles after going to bed while still damp. A blow dryer and a curling iron in the guest room helped, and she marveled that the power worked. After applying a bit of makeup that she had stashed in her handbag, Melody felt a little more like herself while the scent of bacon drifted underneath her bedroom door. Then a whisper of footsteps stopped just outside the guest room. Melody froze, knowing it was him. Brit. He didn't knock on the door, and after a brief moment, she heard his soft footfalls walking away again. She took a final glance at herself, tempted to primp some more when she thought about seeing the devastatingly handsome caretaker again. But that was silly. After today, she'd find a way home, although there was no taxi or bus service to New Orleans, and the nurse had warned her to stay away. But Mary was her responsibility. She was the only one of her sisters able to help. Avery was too far away, and Chrissy was trying to get her career off the ground, flying between the coasts every other month. I'm a bad granddaughter complaining like this, she chided herself while puttering about the lovely suite, admiring the Victorian wing chairs and Tiffany lamps, the carved plush rugs on the floor, the lace curtains at the window, and the balcony. This is gorgeous, she exclaimed, unlocking the French doors to a stunning view of towering oak trees. Flowers as far as she could see, along brick pavings where cute wrought iron benches sat. This morning the fountain spread clouds of misting water and gurgling waterfalls. Leaning her elbows on the balcony railing, Melody dreamily stared across the beauty of the property. Shading her eyes as she tried to spot the banks of the Mississippi on the far side of the massive lawns, she couldn't help remembering Britt in the yard below her room last night, and the shivers his presence had given her before running back to bed. The attraction she'd felt for him had been instant and powerful, but she needed to shake it off and forget about him. After today, she would probably never see him again. The gash on her leg barely stung this morning but she needed to check the bandage and change it out. Returning to the suite, she closed the balcony doors and strode toward the bedroom door. Breakfast sat on a side table, just outside, a silver platter with a domed lid. She lifted it, and the enticing smell of perfectly scrambled eggs and bacon, a cinnamon roll, juice, and a plate of perfectly grilled pancakes with dollops of whipped cream and strawberries greeted her. Wow, she said, overwhelmed at the sight. Her stomach rumbled. When was the last time she'd eaten a regular meal? She couldn't even remember at the moment. Taking the tray into her room, she curled up on one of the lounge chairs and downed the delicious food in fifteen minutes flat. Closing her eyes in ecstasy, she reluctantly ate the final strawberry and bite of pancake, feeling contented and energized. If that was breakfast, what's for lunch, she marveled depositing the tray on the side table again. Time to explore this plantation mansion while she had the chance. She figured Britt probably had a lengthy list of chores the day after a hurricane, although the sky threatened to rain again, moist with thick humidity and very warm, even though it wasn't quite noon. Most of the upstairs rooms were guest rooms, done in various colors and bed sizes. There was a shadowy sitting room with aged furniture and draperies, Portraits and paintings hung on the walls, likely of long-past occupants of Nottingham. 
Melody found herself itching to go to a local library and find out what the history of this place was. Maybe Britt would know more. Had her grandmother visited the house once upon a time, and those memories rattled around in her brain, getting mixed up with the fear of the storm? Had it been a place of refuge once long ago? It was all so confusing. Melody ran a hand along the polished banister on her way to explore the downstairs rooms. Peeking in one at a time, she carefully stepped around the ropes that kept tourists at bay. Each room boasted 16-foot-high ceilings with medallion-based chandeliers and crown molding, furnished with settees and armchairs, glass knickknacks, and cut-glass blue lamps. There was a library, a study, a music room, and at the very end of the grand hallway, a stunning oval ballroom with a glossy white floor, white walls, white damask curtains, and several teardrop chandeliers hanging from the detailed plaster frieze moldings. The white ballroom was so unique it took Melody's breath away. Carved white columns and a hand-carved marble fireplace created a gorgeous setting, including the white and gold velvet couches and chairs placed under the windows. She stood in the doorway, imagining a string quartet, candles glowing softly, couples dressed in ball gowns dancing the waltz, and light reflecting from the chandelier's prisms. Stepping inside, she circled the room, feeling underdressed and much too modern. Four tall windows graced two sides of the room, and muted sunlight spilled across the white floor in a golden haze. Small tables sat in each corner, and pictures in gilt frames adorned the satin-finished cherry wood. Melody peered into the pictures to catch a glimpse of the past. Most were from the era of the Civil War. Solemn men wearing Confederate uniforms, women in hoop skirts and coiffed hair, shawls around their shoulders. Further on, Melody spotted a few photographs from the Edwardian era, and then the Roaring Twenties. The last photos appeared to be from the late 1940s or 50s, because the women were dressed in stylish fur coats and white gloves, pencil skirts and high-heeled shoes with softly waved hairstyles. One of the young women caught her eye. She was smiling broadly, her eyes glancing up from under mischievous brows, as she looked over her shoulder at a young man leaning against the fireplace mantel in this very room. Something about her smile, that coy glance, reminded Melody of something, or someone, Perhaps she'd seen the picture in the many history books of World War II that she had read or flipped through. Or perhaps there was a duplicate in some other old plantation house she had toured at some point in the past. She's very pretty, Melody murmured, hearing a door close somewhere in the house. Departing the ballroom, she took the stairs going down to the kitchen and restaurant Britt had shown her last night. When she entered the large, industrial-sized kitchen again, she realized that she had forgotten her breakfast tray, but made a mental note to fetch it later. Despite the modernity of it, the old stone fireplace gave it an old-fashioned appearance. Once again, she pictured herself sitting in that chair before the fire last night while Britt tended to her injury. A warm feeling surged in her chest and swept up her neck. She was acting like a teenager, blushing over a member of the male species. Venturing into the dining room, she found the place empty, although breakfast dishes and a frying pan sat in a sink of sudsy water in the kitchen. That sound of a door closing must have been the caretaker going outside. Trying to think of him as the caretaker would help Melody distance herself from the emotions she kept feeling every time she thought about Britt Mandeville. She found the French doors in the wall of curving glass and pushed against it. Suddenly, she was outside, a chilly breeze rattling the oak trees overhead. A faint drizzle of rain fell, but she wasn't getting wet, at least not more than an occasional drop, so Melody kept walking. It didn't take long before she discovered just how drenched and squishy the lawns were, while she jumped over swaths of mud where the grass had been torn up by the deluge yesterday. She didn't spot Britt anywhere in sight, and she couldn't see any vehicles either. Perhaps he'd taken off into town. The next instant, his figure appeared at the far end of the property, at least two acres away from the mansion near the Mississippi. He was digging or raking something, his back to her, so he hadn't seen her yet. Curious about the river, Melody walked toward the banks, a man-made levee actually, higher than the ground level of the mansion house. The plantation was lower than the river by at least ten feet. 
good for irrigation, a little scary during hurricanes due to the flood risk. When she climbed up the steep berm of the levee, it was apparent that the Mississippi was in danger of overflowing its banks, but it hadn't yet. Thank goodness, because that meant that the house was still safe. The water swept by in a torrent, dangerously deep and dangerously fast. Leaning over the edge, Melody was mesmerized by the churning water, so powerful and so dark, spraying a fine mist across her face. Kneeling on the ground, Melody felt like a kid, a dopey grin on her face, tempted to grab a handful of rocks and skitter them across the surface. How powerful nature was. How fierce and savage, the roar of the Mississippi drowning out any other sounds. Her thoughts relived yesterday's nightmare and her stomach churned, just like the river. What if she hadn't been able to get Mary out of the house in time? What would she have done? Carried her up through the attic to the roof? Melody shuddered, rising to her shaky feet again, arms outstretched. She staggered a little, buoyed up by the wind that was trying to knock her over. It was a peculiar feeling, almost like flying. What would it be like to jump into the Mississippi and let the current carry her all the way to New Orleans? But that was crazy thinking. She needed to get to the house before she was drenched again. Her only other set of clothes was still muddy and needing washing. Chapter 10 Britt caught sight of his new guest after he threw the last of the downed branches into a woodpile. One of these days, they'd dry out, and he'd have a rip-roaring bonfire. Marshmallows and s'mores, here we come, he predicted aloud. Perhaps during an evening with the intriguing woman who had shown up last night. It was starting to rain again, the drizzle increasing. He wiped a drop from his cheek while he studied Melody, striding down to the Mississippi to scramble up the berm of the dike so she could stare down into the mighty roar. He'd gone out himself earlier, after he'd left the tray of breakfast at her door, hoping she was still sleeping. Obviously, she had eaten and gone exploring, while he'd finally managed to get the generator gassed up and running. Then he cleared the mass of rotten leaves clogging the filter of the swimming pool. Britt had spent the rest of the morning clearing fallen branches. He was only halfway done, and would have to finish later. Might take him all week. Leaning against his rake, he studied Melody de Leon from a distance. She had an athletic, slender figure, but with beautiful curves in all the right places. He loved her thick, dark hair, the swirls it created across her back, and it had taken all his willpower last night not to reach out and touch it. The glossy sheen and the tendrils that curled around her face captured him in a way no other girl had before. This woman had the perfect combination of fair skin, black hair, and big blue eyes that looked like cut glass all inside an oval face with the most kissable lips he'd ever seen. He muttered a curse, remembering the restless night when his thoughts kept turning to this angel girl that had appeared on his doorstep out of nowhere. What kind of girl showed up at White Castle during a hurricane? It was crazy. Actually, she hadn't shown up on his doorstep. She was inside the house at midnight, having fallen to her knees in the Great Hall like a ghostly apparition, but she was very much real. Nursing the gash on her leg had set his skin on fire. His stomach clenched when he touched her soft skin. It took all his willpower not to glide his hand up the back of her calf and pull her closer, just to gaze into those gorgeous bedroom blue eyes. Oh, get a grip, man, he growled. His eyes lifted in her direction again, just as she rose to her feet holding out her arms, her face to the sky, and then she was wavering on her feet, rocking back and forth. The sight of her lurching on the dike had Britt dropping the rake and sprinting towards her. His heart pounded in his ears. Was she going to fall? She'd be gone in two seconds, pulled under by the violent current. He had no rope or any life-saving tools, except in the swimming pool shed, and it would take too long to retrieve them. She'd end up in New Orleans downriver, and perhaps the bay before they could find her. The idea was horrific, and Britt's chest burned in terror. Don't fall, he shouted, but the wind snatched the words away. He cursed, putting on a burst of speed, his legs pumping like a racehorse. Just as her unsteady legs were about to pitch forward, Britt grabbed the woman from behind 
and yanked her back from the river's edge. Melody, he shouted, just as she fell into his arms and they slid roughly down the dike to land on the wet grass. When he'd snatched her, she had gone limp as a rag doll, while his face brushed against the lilac shampoo scent of her hair when he shielded her from hitting the ground too hard. She let out a small shriek falling straight down on top of him, obviously startled at the sudden tumble. For a long moment, she stared at him with disconcerted eyes, then quickly rolled off of him and onto her back, breathing hard. Britt hovered over her, wanting to drink in the loveliness of her as she lay on the damp grass, her hair a dark pool of black curls. But he quickly rose to his knees, not wanting to scare her. What, what happened? Melody stammered. Where did you come from? Concern for her well-being kept his heart racing. Are you dizzy? Feeling weak? I, I'm not sure. One minute I was looking at the wild river and the next. You pulled me away. It feels like I just woke up from a dream. You scared the dickens out of me, Britt admitted. You were right on the edge, and it looked like you were about to jump. I sprinted over here as fast as I could, terrified that you were going to end up in the water. I'm sorry if I was rough pulling you back like that. A tiny frown puckered her forehead. I wasn't going to jump. Why would I do that? Your whole body was wavering like you were off balance and about to fall. It freaked me out. Melody gave an embarrassed laugh. I confess that sometimes when I'm near a dam or large body of water, I start fantasizing about what it would be like to fall in or jump and how I would get back out. She paused, biting at her full red lips. That probably sounds really crazy. I swear I didn't just escape a mental hospital. The thought never crossed my mind, he said with a smile. Promise. Actually, I was reliving yesterday. All the flooding, the water. Wondering if my grandmother's house is completely destroyed or gone. Guess my imagination got the better of me. Britt reached out to squeeze her hand reassuringly. It's not imagination when you just lived through it. You're probably still in a bit of shock. How about some hot cocoa in front of the fire? It's raining again. Melody glanced up at the drizzle, blinking when a drop of rain plopped into her eye. Then she laughed. So, we're just lying out here in the rain chatting? He laughed with her, loving the sound of her suppressed giggle. Guess we're both crazy. Come on, I'll help you up. He offered, jumping to his feet and extending his hand. When Melody rose, her hair flowed like a dusky waterfall down her back. And once again, it took all of Britt's willpower not to touch it. Her fingers gripped his as he pulled her from the damp lawn, and then she dropped her hand to swat at her clothes, wet splotches making her blush. How humiliating, she said, making a face. It is raining, he said, grinning at the obvious. She flashed her eyes. The problem is... I have no other clothing. These were the only set I packed when we left Mary's house once the emergency boat arrived. Yesterday's clothes are sitting by the hearth in my guest room. Britt's heart finally slowed after the scare she'd given him and sympathy washed over him at the trauma she and her grandmother had endured. I have a laundry room available for our guests. We're a full service historic mansion he added with a grin. She smiled and then grew pensive as they trudged back to the house. She was so sick. I spent all my time trying to tend her, making phone calls, breaking up with my boyfriend. A sarcastic laugh burst from her. It was silly. I ran around placing nearly a dozen buckets around the house because the roof was leaking. Fat lot of good that did when the floodwaters began seeping underneath the front door. Britt stifled the urge to tuck her protectively under his arm. Have you had a chance to call the hospital? You can borrow my phone. I did first thing. I was happy to see my cell phone light up when I woke this morning. What did they tell you? Britt prompted. She's stable, on antibiotics. No worse than last night, but due to her age, they want to keep her for a while. It's pneumonia, of course. Britt nodded, fully expecting that from the things Melody had told him last night. 
Will they let you see her? I can drive you into New Orleans. She glanced up at him and Britt had to hide his intake of breath when those deep crystal eyes met his. He blinked. This woman's beauty transported him to another place altogether. He could still feel the weight and curve of her body against his, as though it had been imprinted on him. The nurse said the city is still flooded. Most of the main roads are being cleared. No power for much of the city still. We'd probably get stuck attempting it, but she stopped to look at him fully in the face. You're very kind to offer. Thank you for taking me in and not calling the cops on the wild woman breaking and entering last night. When there's a hurricane in Louisiana, there's no such thing as breaking and entering. Most of the time, White Castle is open to the public anyway. People walk in all the time. Her lips cracked into a grin. At least during daylight hours, they do. He laughed in agreement, then led her around to the rear of the house and opened the side doors that led into the glass-enclosed restaurant. Let's have lunch. I'm starving. Didn't we just have breakfast? It was fantastic, by the way. The best breakfast I've had in years. Maybe a decade. That made him laugh. Surely you've made a trip to IHOP in the last year. IHOP has nothing on your cooking. Where did you learn to cook like that? He shrugged. My grandmother's from a small town outside Savannah. Best southern cook in the world. And I'm not exaggerating. She taught me everything. Ever since I was a boy, she had me cooking in the kitchen with her. You should taste her grits and biscuits and gravy. You'll think you've died and gone to heaven. Melody glanced up at him from under her long eyelashes. Is that on the menu for tomorrow? Absolutely. How does a ham sandwich sound for now? <laughs> You're serious, she said with a laugh. It's after one o'clock already. Her eyes widened in surprise. Seriously? He laughed at her shocked expression. I got out early to get the generator up and then cleared brush until a certain someone needed rescuing. Ha, Melody said, punching him playfully on the arm. I was in full control of myself. He gave her a wry grin. You were an inch from falling in. Was not. Were two. Melody put her hands on her hips, glaring at him, and then she bit her lips, a blush creeping up her face. We're like a couple of kids. I'll make lunch. You sit down after all your work this morning. We're supposed to have overnight guests this weekend. If they can make it here, that is. I'd better be ready for them, whether they show up or not. Where's the rest of your tour crew? Britt dug into the refrigerator, pulling out lunch meats and cheese a pitcher of lemonade and various spreads for the wheat rolls sitting in a bag on the granite countertop. Most of them are stuck in Baton Rouge. We have Florence Benoit, who does the tours and bookkeeping. Percy Whiteside is my assistant gardener. And Maggie Dubois is the housekeeper. But they trained me for emergencies, he added. Not sure they trained you that well, Mr. Mandeville, Melody said, a teasing lilt in her voice. You forgot to lock your front door last night. Any old vagabond could have just waltzed right in. If all vagabonds are as beautiful as you, they can walk in any old time, Britt said. Immediately, his face heated up. Their conversation had turned flirty and teasing. Melody de Leon was extremely beguiling. She lifted her face to retort, Only the vagabonds who run books on the Mississippi and collapse onto the hall rug of White Castle are allowed to be described in those adjectives, sir. As soon as she said the words, her face turned red, as if mortified to have spoken so brazenly. She began furiously spreading mayo and mustard on the wheat rolls. Never thought I'd rescue a damsel in distress, he said, purposefully making his voice light to soothe her. Here, Melody said abruptly, handing him a plate with a loaded ham, turkey, and Swiss cheese double-decker. Your sandwich, Mr. Mandeville. I've got the lemonade. Come sit down. When she headed to the kitchen table with its picnic benches, Britt gestured toward the dining room. In here. It's nicer and has a great view. It is lovely, Melody said, setting down her plate while Britt placed two tall glasses of clinking ice and lemonade on the table next to their places. I was admiring the rose garden this morning on my way out to find you. I mean, to go down to the river 
and check out the hurricane's damage. You almost became hurricane damage yourself, Miss de Leon. When she made a growling noise in her throat, he added, eat your lunch. As they used to say a hundred years ago, you look peaked. Melody gave him a disarming smile. It's funny how easy it is to lapse into the language of bygone days when you're in a hundred and fifty-year-old mansion, isn't it? Have you gone exploring yet? She broke her sandwich into smaller pieces, slowly chewing each one. I confess, I did the whole explore thing this morning. It was too tempting to go touch everything in all the rooms. They're so beautiful. Her eyes glanced up at his. I hope you don't mind. The old house should be explored and enjoyed. It's got a lot of interesting history. Help yourself to any room you'd like. The furniture that's original and truly antiques is marked and cordoned off. Everything else is a replica. I'll give you a tour after lunch. I thought Florence Benoit did those. I have the script memorized, too. Britt pushed his empty plate away and leaned forward. I've read a lot about the house. Antiques, history, it's kind of a thing of mine. Melody sipped at her drink. I've been wondering why a man like you would be working here. You look like a quarterback or a model for GQ. Britt laughed self-deprecatingly. Not by a long shot. White Castle is a bit remote and off the beaten path of the River Road plantations. I can't imagine a man like you living so far from any big city. How long have you been caretaker here? Two years this winter. Okay, don't laugh. A grin crossed those amazing lips, and Britt tried not to focus on them. Ever since he'd seen this woman last night in the glow of his flashlight, he'd been drawn to her like a moth to a flame. She was enchanting, but if he kept staring at her like this, he was going to burn himself out or chase her away for good. I promise I won't laugh, she said. All right, time for true confessions. I taught American history to high school juniors in Baton Rouge for the last eight years. Melody's eyes widened. You did what? Seriously? Hey, I told you not to laugh. I'm not laughing. I just never expected you to say that in a hundred years. But I'll bet, she added, a teasing smile on her lips, your forte was the Civil War era. <laughs> Does it show too much? Only if you coach the football team in your after-school hours. You must be clairvoyant, he teased right back. That must be your secret weapon. I think everybody who grows up in New Orleans dabbles in a bit of fortune-telling or card-reading at some time or other, she said slyly. But why would you quit teaching to come to White Castle? Well, a couple of different things. I was selling antiques on the side and got recruited for a company called Dreams. I've never heard of them. They're located in Denver, but the company is all over the globe, at least online. It's a popular app. You can buy anything through them. I mean, literally, you can buy anything. Products from just about every country in the world. Do you travel much for them? Just the States. American antiques, not European. There's another VP of the company who hangs out across the Atlantic most of the year. Right now, Civil War era antiques are big, so I came to White Castle and the other River Road plantations nearby looking through their attics and barns and storage sheds for items I could buy and then turn around and sell them through dreams. You catch on quick, Melody. She gave an involuntary shiver when he said her name. Are you cold? She shook her head, flustered. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm fine. Don't mind me. Even though I attend house auctions, estate sales, and antique shows, White Castle was looking for someone to do some work here. Bring it back up to par after it had exchanged hands several times over the last few decades. There are three barns full of trunks and boxes that I'm slowly going through, and I haven't even begun on the attic. It was easier to live on site, and now I'm hooked. Cupping her chin in her fist, Melody ran a finger down the condensation on her lemonade glass. The house has a wonderful feel to it. I can see why you're hooked. But let me get this straight. You're a history professor, a mansion caretaker, antiques dealer, and a fabulous chef. Is there anything you can't do? Britt ran his hands through his hair, laughing. 
all those careers go together. One just kept leading to the next. And I'm not a chef by any means. The food is just my granny's southern home cooking. As a southern girl myself, I know good food, but you didn't answer my question. And I'm intrigued. What's the one thing you wish you could do? My, you do get right down to the point, don't you? He drawled, putting on a small town bayou accent. A man has to keep something secret. That's for women, Melody said coyly. We get to be the secretive species. Britt immediately thought about Crystal and the fact that she hadn't communicated her honest goals or dreams with him. She was one woman outwardly and quite a different one inwardly. I think you hit the nail on the head. Sorry, I think I touched a nerve. He shrugged, spreading his hands. Let's just say that you're not the only one who's been unlucky in love lately. Chapter 11 That was the last thing Melody expected him to say, and her heart softened. I'm sorry, Britt. It's not pleasant to get your heart broken. She turned me down cold when I proposed a week or so ago. Melody almost choked. A week ago? This all happened during the lead-up to the hurricane? He gave her a sheepish smile, shoving his hands into the front pockets of his jeans while he leaned back in his chair, jeans that looked so very, very good on him. Melody tried to focus on his face and not his splendid physique. We'd been talking about getting married for a few months, but I finally showed her White Castle and tried to give her a ring. I was stupid. She travels with her job and loves the big city. I should have known. Life here wouldn't be one she wanted. I'm sorry. If she's a big city girl, where did you two meet? In Charleston two years ago, when I was there for an estate sale, but she's originally from Baton Rouge. Foolishly, I thought it was too much of a coincidence that we would both be from the same part of Louisiana. We're really very different from each other. I just thought I could convince her. You know what the strangest thing is? Melody was curious. What? I don't even feel that bad about it. I mean, yeah, it hurt at first, that first night, but I knew deep down in my heart we were wrong for each other. I should have known she didn't want to live out here in a small town. She prefers much more excitement. Melody was unable to fathom a woman turning down a man like Britt Mandeville and the mansion that came with him even if he was only the caretaker. Getting up her nerve, she touched his hand. Better to find out now rather than later, right? That's what I keep telling myself. My ex was always selfish, only thinking of himself, but running off with a waitress was a gut punch. He's one stupid dude, plain and simple. Melody glanced away, pretending to admire the flower gardens, disconcerted at the way he looked at her, but also reveling in the way he made her feel when his eyes were on her face. Britt cleared his throat. <clears throat> as soon as we can navigate the roads, I'll take you into New Orleans to see your grandmother, and we can survey the damage to your bookstore. That's a very generous offer, but honestly, I can just rent a car and go myself. Where are you going to rent a car? Well, isn't there an Avis or Hertz nearby? Melody asked the question, but it was probably ridiculous. Only at the airport in Baton Rouge. And if I'm going to drive you there, we might as well just do the extra 30 minutes into New Orleans. Besides, you're going to need a ton of help. We can do an assessment. Schedule the insurance adjuster. The city's going to be a mess for a long time. I'll make a call to my insurance to see when they can even meet me there. It could be a week or two. That's true. Meanwhile... We can do some cleanup and visit your grandmother. You're very kind. I'd also like to see my sister in Baton Rouge, if she's even in town. I need to text her and give her an update on Mary. With her work schedule, we don't see each other very often. I'm spending the rest of the day cleaning up the grounds. Go explore, make your phone calls, and I'll find you when it's time for dinner. Sound good? Sounds perfect. He was so ruggedly handsome and charming that Melody had a difficult time not smiling at him all the time, even as her heart fluttered on a constant loop. She hoped it didn't show too much. After all, 
She wanted to appear confident and in control, and not like she was drooling over the man. She didn't know him very well yet, but he seemed like the kind of man who would have top models wearing glittery dresses and stilettos hanging on his arm. A wry smile crept across her lips. She supposed glittery dresses and skyscraper heels wouldn't be ordinary wear. That would be tight designer jeans, sheer blouses, and casually messy manes of blonde hair with big hoop earrings. And yet, Britt was a high school teacher, and a gardener, and an antiques dealer. Not a high-end executive with MBAs coming out his ears and making high-powered calls to people with fat bank accounts. The man was an anomaly. With an easy, casual manner, Britt was laid back, which Melody loved. He wasn't on his phone every two minutes brokering deals, talking fast, sounding important and busy. She liked him. A lot. So much that her head was spinning and her attraction level was skyrocketing to an all-time high of ten. Everything is going to work out, Britt said, his voice pulling her from her musings. Louisiana always comes through hurricanes with flying colors. The people in this state are amazing, Melody concurred. Inwardly, she wanted to add, including you, but she kept her lips tightly shut so the words didn't accidentally spill out. Melody offered to clean up lunch, and a few minutes later, Britt strode across the property to the shed while she watched him through the windows. When she finished the dishes, Melody walked back upstairs, breathing in the past two centuries of the house. The scent of mahogany and cherry wood, lemon polish, musty furniture with its patina varnish. The history that this place had seen was amazing, an American icon and a relic of the changes and upheaval the South had endured over the last two centuries. Earlier, she had discovered the small gift shop just outside the front door, perfectly situated on the way out for the tourists who toured the house. Now, she spent an hour poking around, finally plopping a $20 bill on the register to purchase one of the books, The History of White Castle, taken from the pages of the diary of the young woman whose father had built Nottingham and endured the hardships of the war during the years between 1860 to 1865. This'll make great reading the next few nights, Melody murmured to herself, heading for the portrait gallery and then on to the array of photographs she'd studied last night. The particular photo in the ballroom had been haunting her. She had to look at it again, but first she carried the breakfast tray down to the kitchen. Then Melody opened the balcony doors to let in fresh air from the cool day. Next, she carried her muddy clothes downstairs to the laundry room that had several industrial-sized machines for all the sheets and towels that needed to be done for overnight guests. Choosing the smallest size load, she closed the laundry room door and took off the clothes she had gotten muddy when Britt pulled her off the levee. Throwing them in, she added her two blouses, socks, and sweater and sprinkled detergent over the small pile. Wearing the white bathrobe she'd found hanging in her guest room, Melody returned to the portrait gallery in the ballroom. Now, I get to go snooping. Sinking into a chair, Melody picked up the photograph preserved inside a simple oak frame. Not three seconds later, she gasped. Of course. Why hadn't she recognized them before? Her mind whirled with the impossibility of it. She had seen this photograph before, or at least a copy of it. It had been so long ago, it had taken a while to come back to her memory. A replica of this same photograph was pasted inside Mary's photo album from the years of her youth. This young woman, with the soft, dark waves looking coyly over her shoulder at the dapper young man in front of the fireplace mantel, was her grandmother. And the man was Peppo, Melody's grandfather. Why had they been here at White Castle? Don't get ahead of yourself, Melody muttered in a warning voice. Maybe they visited the plantation years ago on a tour. She shook her head. No, that couldn't be right. Nottingham wasn't on the tour registry for historic homes until decades later than the late 1940s. If Mary and Papa had taken pictures here at White Castle, they must have been acquainted with the owners. But why would the photograph still be here? Weren't there other, more important historical photos to display? A fizzy sensation traveled straight up Melody's spine. Her stomach tumbled with questions. 
White Castle was obviously important to her grandmother. Long, long ago, she had been here. This must be why Mary had been so insistent that Melody come here. She had wanted her to find this photo. She had been determined that her granddaughter learn more. A family mystery was right in front of her. Melody's cell phone buzzed, startling her out of her reverie. She dug it out of her pocket and glanced at the text message. It was from her sister. Chrissy, your bookstore line is dead. Mary's phone says out of service. Are you alive? Melody quickly typed back. Sorry I've been out of touch. Mary has pneumonia and in the hospital. My store is flooded. I left town. I'm in White Castle. Chrissy, White Castle? Please tell me you're joking. That is just too bizarre. How did you end up at that old place? Melody, long story. Where are you? Chrissy, Baton Rouge. Melody, so you're actually in the state. I figured you were gone. Chrissy, came in just before the hurricane hit. Had to meet with my agent and lawyer to draw up some prenuptial paperwork. Melody, what? You're getting married? When? To whom? Chrissy, ha ha, tell you when I see you. I have a car. I'll come to you. See you soon. Ta-ta. Melody's stomach sank. Her sister was coming here. She would much rather go to Baton Rouge. She didn't want the peace of White Castle interrupted by her loud, bossy sister. She wanted to hug this house to herself. It was selfish, but she didn't want to share it with anyone. Not until she figured out why Mary wanted her to come here. If she were honest, she had to admit that she didn't want to share Britt Mandeville either. Her sister would dazzle him, take over every conversation and make everything about her. Melody, when are you coming? As in, imminently? There was no reply. Her sister was never more than 12 inches away from her phone. She was purposefully being mysterious and secretive. Darn you, Melody said. Me? Britt's voice spoke at the door of the ballroom. Melody jerked her chin up, her pulse skyrocketing. He stood there, one hand leaning against one of the white columns, looking mighty fine, his hair disheveled and messy, like a young college co-ed. Then she remembered that she was wearing only her bathrobe, a pair of bikini underwear, and no bra. Her face burned as she jumped, quickly tightening the cord around her waist, her heart reverberating through her body like a jackhammer. I'm, I, I don't usually walk around in public like this, she stammered. Let me guess, Britt said, smiling that beguiling grin of his. You found the washing machine? Yes, exactly. My muddy clothes are washing. Totally understand. Don't be embarrassed. It's nice to know the guest bathrobes come in handy. But what are you doing in the ballroom? Just wandering. Well, actually, I found a very interesting photograph. Which one is it? He moved closer, and Melody wondered if he could see the outline of her body under the robe. She hoped nothing in particular was showing more than she wanted it to. Good grief, how humiliating. Walking around like she owned the place, or as if she was trying to get his attention? Not, not, not. Under her eyelashes, Melody watched while Britt averted his eyes from her and focused on the black and white photograph. Nice picture. They're a handsome couple. Don't you love the styles of the 40s and 50s? So smart. I completely agree. I've never had a favorite decade. I love them all. Well, probably beginning with the 60s and going back in time. She gave a small laugh and wondered if she just sounded silly. The house has an incredible array of historical pictures. Did you see the painting John Randolph had done of White Castle when it was first built? I'll have to look for that one. I purchased his daughter Cordelia's diary. I left the money on top of the register in the gift shop. Great. I'm glad you found something to captivate you while you're here. Britt handed back the photograph. So, Miss Melody de Leon, why did this particular photograph seize your attention? I've seen it before. I mean, I recognized it. I know it. A puzzled look crossed Britt's face. I don't understand. I thought you said you'd never been here before. This photograph, the woman in her hat and gloves, and the gentleman at the mantel. They're my grandparents. 
I've always called them Mary and Papa. Chapter 12 Britt stared at her. You mean the same grandmother who is currently in the hospital? The very same. Mary is the one who insisted I come to White Castle. It's practically the only thing she kept saying all during her fever. She knew this photo was here. This house has some kind of meaning for her. And I need to find out what it is. I agree. I'll help you any way I can. Biting at her lip, Melody shrugged. I have no idea how to begin. When the house was sold the last time, all the previous contents, trunks and boxes and miscellaneous paraphernalia, were stored in the attic. It's all still here, easy to explore. A sense of excitement flooded Melody. Thank you so much for your help, Britt. Happy to be of service. So, um, Melody stuttered again. I'll go move my clothes into the dryer and not burn your eyes any longer. Only good burning here, he said pleasantly with a sly grin. Melody blushed. By the way, I heard from my sister. She's on her way here from Baton Rouge. If the roads between there and White Castle are open and it's cleared, it's less than an hour's drive. Melody gave a start. She'll be here any minute then. Hurrying into the great hall to head downstairs, she held the robe together with both hands while Britt chuckled. She hoped the robe didn't make her look fat. Don't laugh, she ordered over her shoulder. I'm not laughing, it's you, he called back. Actually, I find you very sweet and funny. So glad I could amuse you, Mr. Mandeville. I mean that in every possible good way. Melody let out a snort of laughter and took the stairs down to the lower floor, hoping she wouldn't trip on her bare feet. Quickly moving her wet clothes into the dryer, she added a softener sheet, shut the door, and hit the buttons to start the cycle. Drat! She still had no clean clothes to wear. She should have told her sister to come later this evening. It was almost dinner time, actually, and Melody had planned to help Britt with the meal. He shouldn't have to do all the work for an uninvited, unwanted house guest. Maybe she should camp out here in the laundry room until they were dry. Britt could amuse her sister in the meantime. Except, thinking of the two of them spending even an hour together sent a burn of envy up her throat. Her sister was gorgeous and sophisticated, and Melody was the boring bookworm who spent her time on a computer ordering stock for the store, reading glasses perched on her nose. It would also be nice to have more than one pair of jeans and a couple of t-shirts. Wading through chest-high dirty water had discouraged wearing anything nicer, of course, and how was she to know she'd meet the most intriguing man of her life? Well, she could sit here in the laundry room for an hour or more. After all, jeans took time to fully dry and they were horrible to put on damp. Or she could tough it out and go upstairs. She could always hide in her room and ask Britt to delay dinner until she was fully clothed, too. But with her sister coming, she might as well bite the bullet. She and her two sisters had often run around the house half-dressed, and she and Britt had already had a deep conversation about the old photograph while she wore the terry cloth robe. Might as well move forward and convey the news about Mary. Her sister deserved to know what was going on, and perhaps she'd give Melody a ride to New Orleans so she wouldn't have to inconvenience Britt. Trudging up the stairs again, Melody crossed paths with Britt right on cue. Inwardly groaning, she put on a fake smile nevertheless. I'll help you with dinner as soon as the dryer is done, okay? I don't mind starting it. Leftover shrimp and chicken in a casserole sound good? I also have fresh makings for a salad. Perfect, but I really want to help. You didn't expect me here when you have so much to do on the property right now. You are not an imposition. Honestly, it's nice to have the company. Well, get ready for crazy when my sister gets here. I look forward to meeting her. Melody gave a faint smile, staring into the spectacular ballroom while a daydream shot through her mind. She and Britt, dressed up in evening clothes and dancing the waltz to a three-piece string quartet. She'd never forget how powerful his arms were around her, 
when he snatched her back from the river and gathered her clothes, protecting her, afraid for her. The scent of his musky skin, the brush of his sandpaper jaw against her cheek when they fell to the soggy lawn. Her mind kept returning to those few moments when their bodies were locked together, and the gentleness of his voice when he asked if she was okay. She wanted more of that, more of him, but it was a fool's dream. She was not the kind of girl a man like Britt Mandeville fell for. A knock at the door sounded and Melody jumped. Her sister was here. I'll get it, Melody, he said. Just in case it's the electric meter guy, he added in a tease, throwing a glance over his shoulder at her. She laughed, covering her mouth. How chivalrous of you. Studying his form as he crossed the foyer, Melody let out a sigh as her heart tugged. He pulled open the heavy front door and Britt took a sudden, startled step back. What in the world? Melody hung back until she heard her sister splutter as she walked inside, her heels clipping along the entry tiles. Sitting a hand on her hip, she stared between Britt and Melody. Well, 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 what have we here? Melody gave an uneasy laugh. What are you talking about? Her sister stared daggers between Britt and Melody her legs long and curvy in her short skirt, a red handbag slung over one shoulder. Look at you in your bathrobe. That's disgusting. Where are your clothes? Um, in the dryer. What's going on, little sister? Cheating behind my back with my fiancé? What are you talking about, Crystal? Crystal moved forward, her eyes snapping. Don't be stupid, and don't play dumb, Mel. Confusion filled Britt's face when he turned to Melody. Crystal is your sister? Of course. Who else would she be? Crystal threw her head back with laughter. <laughs> you mean you didn't know Melody is my sister, Britt, darling? How would I know that? He asked, turning to gaze at Melody with the strangest expression in his eyes. I've never met her before. You've rarely spoken of your family. I figured you'd meet at the wedding. Crystal, I didn't even know you were engaged, Melody said, trying to figure out why her sister and Britt were staring at each other so forcefully. When did it happen? When's the wedding? As soon as we can set a date, Crystal said, turning her full stare into Britt's face. I even have a ring. See? Isn't it stunning? The enormous diamond caught the chandelier's light when Crystal held out her hand, her long fingers elegant the nails painted a burgundy red. Melody swallowed, trying to figure out the subtle meanings behind her older sister's words, trying to get her brain in gear. Wait, you two know each other already, don't you? Her voice trailed off. You and Britt, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. That's when her breath caught, and she nearly choked. Tears threatened, burning at the back of her throat. Melody pulled on the bathrobe ties as hard as she could, wanting to punch a wall really, really hard. Britt took two steps toward her, shock and disbelief written all over his face. I'm sorry for the confusion, Melody. Let me explain. Crystal is, was, my girlfriend. The ring on her finger is the one I gave her ten days ago when I proposed. He broke off, the expression in his eyes helpless and panicked. Crystal. Is your fiancé? The words stuck in her throat, horror washing over her. I'm trying to understand this, he said, glancing furiously between the two of them. You two are sisters? It seems impossible. I, I, I don't know what to say. What are the odds of that? Chapter 13 Melody's throat was so dry, no words would come. Please don't let me cry, she prayed desperately. Crystal fixed a hard stare on her. Yes, what are the odds that you're here with my fiancé? This house in the middle of nowhere. How did you get here? How do you even know it exists? Mary, Melody replied, blinking rapidly to keep the tears from spilling over, eyes swimming. She caught the pained expression on Britt's face, trying to decipher his thoughts. He was engaged to her sister, to Crystal. 
That was the moment Melody knew she was falling for the guy. She had been daydreaming about him too much today. She should have known a man like Britt would have a girlfriend. Any girl would fall in love with his charm, his kindness, and his deep, soulful eyes. But the man didn't just have a girlfriend. He was engaged to her own sister. This week couldn't get much worse. Mary, Crystal echoed sharply. It's a long story, Melody said shortly. Where is Mary? I told you, she's in the hospital in New Orleans. She has pneumonia. She's very ill. Crystal's eyebrow arched. She's so ill. You left her there and ran all the way up to White Castle. How very odd. Melody's patience with her sister's sarcasm began to wear thin. As the youngest of the three sisters, she was always questioned and blamed when things went wrong, and she was the only one of them that cared about their grandmother. She was the one who took her to the doctor appointments, made sure she was eating healthy, got out for walks and shopping, and called the neighbors to check on her. She was sure her face was blistering red, and her voice was now shaking as well. I'm not going to stand here and let you throw insinuations at me. Yes, I had to leave her at the hospital. In case you haven't watched the news recently, New Orleans is flooded. Granny's house is filled to the ceiling with brown water and debris. We were rescued through the window, and she's in the hospital in ICU, and I had nowhere else to go. Where's Vince? He could have helped you. Vince abandoned me. Crystal's face finally flushed. Oh, I'm sorry, she said stiffly. Mary told me to go to White Castle. Over and over again. I have no idea why. I thought it was an abandoned house with rats and a dirt floor, but it was a place to get away from the flooding until I figured out how to get a car and get back to the city, since my own car probably got washed away. Her sister paced the floor, fuming and obviously discomfited by the way her baby sister was fighting back. But Melody had done nothing wrong. Despite the deep and rising attraction to Brit, she hadn't flirted with him, and he had been a perfect gentleman. Crystal was practically accusing her of running off with her boyfriend. Brit touched Crystal's shoulder. Don't assume anything. Nothing is going on here. Besides, you turned down my proposal. And now, Crystal shrugged him off, her voice sharp. Not now, Brit. Gritting her teeth, Melody said, If you'll excuse me, I'm going to get my clothes out of the dryer and get dressed. Then I'm going for a walk. I think you two have some talking you need to do, and I will leave you to it. She spun on her heel and headed for the staircase, but her legs wobbled and she had to grab at the banister to steady herself. Brit spoke behind her. Are you all right, Melody? Perfectly fine, she said airily, hoping her voice didn't crack with emotion. Just promise you won't fall into any mud holes and that you'll stay far away from the raging Mississippi. I'll do my best, she said, a half smile lifting her lips. What does that mean? Crystal asked, glancing between the two of them, her eyes snapping. Private joke, Britt told her. Crystal gasped in outrage and Melody couldn't get to the laundry room fast enough. She fell against the warm dryer, holding her hands over her face while the tears finally spilled. She needed to get out of here. The sooner, the better. She needed to forget about Britt Mandeville. Despite his earlier explanations, he belonged to her sister. And even if they had broken up, how could she and Britt ever get past this awful rift? Even if Britt were interested in her, Melody couldn't steal her sister's fiancé. It wasn't done. She'd be labeled a husband stealer, and worse, forevermore. And Crystal would never forgive her. Thoughts of Britt holding her, gazing at her, fixing her meals and touching her hand, rained through her mind like a hundred stinging darts. Melody shook her head, trying to erase it all. Britt was just a considerate, polite gentleman. Nothing more to it. Besides, Crystal was the one wearing a rock the size of a boulder on her finger.
The dryer finally buzzed, and Melody pulled her clothes out, loving the feel of the soft, hot jeans and the deep purple blouse that fitted her just right around her hips and bust line. She had been drenched in the clothes last night, a drowned cat, a sweatshirt yanked over her head, just a shapeless wet mass. But Britt had told her she looked like an angel. He was crazy, but the thought made her smile. I have to stop thinking about him, she told the dryer wearily, slipping into her clean clothes. He's lost forever, and it's over. What's over? Britt's voice said, breaking into her thoughts. Melody's chin jerked up. He was standing in the doorway of the laundry room, hands braced on either side of the door jamb with a soft smile on his lips. She let out a startled cough. Good grief. She was glad she had already dressed and wasn't in the process of disrobing. How could she have forgotten the clothes and locked the door? Is everything okay? he asked. You just turned white as a sheet. And that's pretty white when you already have perfect porcelain skin. Melody was sure she was blushing clear to her roots, her neck going splotchy. And now you're blushing. Her hands flew to her cheeks. Is it that obvious? When you have skin like yours, I imagine it's hard to hide, he said with an easy smile. I was just headed up to my room. I came down to check on you when you disappeared for so long. I was purposefully hiding out, giving you two time to talk. I'm just going to bed now. But we never ate dinner. We didn't? Melody tried to get her bearings, but it was hard when Brick gazed at her the way he did. Leaning close, his eyes burning holes of desire into her soul. It's only seven. I'm grilling shrimp and catfish. Thought it'd be the easiest. Figured we'd better eat the fish before it goes bad. I'm not really hungry. Honestly, I'm beat. You two eat. I'm going to hit the sack and curl up with the book. Don't let your sister drive you away, Melody, he said softly. She gave a strangled laugh. <laughs> Have you seen my sister? She turns heads in every room she enters. So do you, but I'm not sure you're even aware of it, Britt said, not letting her off the hook. You're just being nice. He dropped his arms from the door and came closer, too close for a laundry room. Are you calling me a liar? No, of course not. Just so you know, I am never just being nice. I say what I mean. I'm not insincere. I believe you, but Crystal thinks you're engaged, Melody said pointedly. We actually broke up a week ago. Not according to her. And she's still wearing your ring. Melody chewed on her lower lip, and Britt's eyes dropped to her mouth. I'm going to let the two of you talk privately. Figure out your relationship and engagement and wedding plans without me. It's for the best. I'll see you in the morning. Skirting past the broad-shouldered caretaker standing in her path, Melody tried not to brush up against him as she slid past the washing machines and shelves full of detergent. Her eyes fluttered when she caught the scent of cologne on his skin. His presence was powerful and magnetic. Ripples of warmth and masculinity radiated from him, and Melody had to steal her resolve not to throw herself against him. When she reached the door, Britt said, Sleep well, Melody. I'll see you in the morning, right? She gave a small shrug. I can't make any promises. Think I'll ask Crystal to drive me to the hospital. Britt gave a small humph, as if he didn't believe her sister would do any such thing. She turned to wave her finger at him. That's not very nice. I've cared for Crystal for a long time, but her true colors have slipped out lately. I'm just sorry I didn't see them sooner. Good night. Melody whispered, rushing past him and then racing up the two flights of stairs to the guest room. She closed the door and locked it, emotion stinging her eyes while she tried to breathe normally. Frustrated, she brushed the tears away. I am stupid, stupid, stupid. After dressing for bed, she jumped under the mountain of soft covers and pulled a book from the bedside table. The night was warm, a moist, heated humidity after the storm. Voluminous black clouds still filled the evening skies, 
but were beginning to dissipate as the storm lost strength and traveled north. When stars peeked through the night haze, Melody opened the balcony doors to let the cool breeze stream through. Downstairs on the back patio came the faint sound and smell of sizzling meat, the soft laughter of Crystal, the murmur of her voice mingled with Brit's. A sharp spasm traveled up her stomach and lodged in her heart. A mix of emotions pressed down on her mind with an ache she was afraid to scrutinize too closely. Her sister had been seriously dating someone, but never mentioned him to Melody. Then she got engaged and didn't bother to call her. Her sister, who lived only an hour from New Orleans. Of course, Crystal spent a lot of her time traveling for work. Baton Rouge was often just a way stop in between. Or to see her boyfriend, Britt Mandeville, it appeared. How often had she visited Britt at White Castle and not taken the time to come see her and Mary? Melody stared at the ceiling while the words on the page grew blurry. Pushing the book across the bed, she paced the room, too worked up to settle down. Were Britt and Crystal actually still engaged? The body language between them had been lost in the confusion of Crystal's arrival, and Britt shocked to find out that she and Crystal were related. Actually, they didn't act engaged. Britt hadn't even embraced Crystal. Despite flashing that obnoxious diamond, her older sister strutted about the foyer in her high heels, accusing Melody and Britt of cheating behind her back. The whole thing was insane. Why did you send me here, Granny Mary? She moaned, running her fingers through her hair. Because you knew Crystal was about to get married and she needed my help? Or something else entirely? She wouldn't be able to ask her grandmother until she could get back into the city. And Mary woke up from her semi-comatose state. Britt was just a side story. An ex-history teacher turned plantation caretaker. The room turned dark and Melody lit a couple of lamps. The sound of grilling was long over, the sizzling aroma of the garlic shrimp no longer drifting into the house. They had probably had an intimate dinner together and renewed their relationship. Now that the shock was over, Melody was starving. She'd have to sneak down to the kitchen later and get something from the fridge, but she'd wait until after they had gone to bed. A steely resolve took over while Melody gazed at the night sky. She'd put her own research mind to good use. After all, she loved research, loved Louisiana history, and even had a huge section of it at Books on the Mississippi. All she had to do was get to the parish courthouse and find out who the past owners of Nottingham were. That should clear up the mystery over her grandparents' picture in the ballroom, once and for all. Chapter 14 a light tap came at the door and Melody jerked awake. The Tiffany lamp on the nightstand was still burning. She rubbed at her eyes, bumping an elbow into the corner of the book she'd been attempting to read earlier. Her eyes darted to the clock on the bedside table. It was after midnight. Who is it? She croaked out. Your sister. Who else? Came the reply. Crystal knocked again harder. Come on, let me in, Mel. Melody rolled over her neck stiff and her legs in slow motion as she swung them over the side of the bed. How long had she been asleep? What was her sister doing at her door at this time of night? The lighting down below on the main grounds was now dim. Only a few nightlights along the pathways remained, presumably for guests who liked to take midnight strolls. Her stomach rumbled. She'd fallen asleep before she could sneak downstairs to the kitchen and she was starving. Unlocking the door, she let it fall open and then fell back onto the four-poster bed. Her head was groggy, like she'd been drugged. She hated being woken from a dead sleep. Her older sister pushed through as if she'd injected herself with adrenaline and stared around the guest room, then back at Melody. You look terrible. Duh. I was asleep. What do you want? Just wanted to talk. Can it wait until morning? No. Britt and I just finished our evening together, and I thought I'd come up here, because I have to go home tomorrow. I have a flight to New York. The airports are back up and running, at least in Baton Rouge. Most roads are still closed into New Orleans. Britt and I were just watching the news. How nice, Melody said, sarcasm lighting her voice. Are you here to lecture me? Crystal sank onto the bed without being invited, her back ramrod straight, her demeanor irritated. 
Honestly, what the heck are you doing here? Scooting herself into a sitting position, Melody stuffed three pillows behind her back and curled her knees up to her chest. You look like you're 16 in that baby doll nightgown, little sis, Crystal said. I'm not a fashion model like you are, Melody said shortly. Is that what you woke me up to tell me? Of course not. But I am jealous of your great legs. Don't you dare walk around the house in that. If Britt sees you, I will kill you. Melody's temper spiked. I'm too tired for a lecture, so knock it off. I do not have designs on Britt Mandeville but you could have called your own sister and told me you were seriously dating someone, that you got engaged. What the heck? She added, repeating her sister's words back at her. I'm very busy, Crystal said shortly, playing with one of her long platinum blonde curls. A text takes ten seconds. Besides, you're not the only one with a hectic life. I do run my own business, so what's new with your career? My agent just got the contract for a gig with Vogue magazine, and I got a part on Broadway as an extra. Congratulations. That's wonderful. I know you've been going back and forth, but aren't you mostly there, as in New York? Crystal leaned against one of the bedposts. That's why Britt's proposal came out of the blue. He was so excited to show me this old house. He spent a lot of time fixing it up. I'm sure he's proud of it. What does he care? Crystal blew at her bangs impatiently. He's just the caretaker. It's his other secrets that are juicy. She winked at Melody and wiggled her shoulders in a sexy move. I sort of blew a gasket when he said we were going to live here. I'd love to live here, Melody confessed, then quickly used her hands to erase the sentiment. I'm not implying anything by that. I suppose it would be difficult to commute with your job. White Castle is an hour from the closest airport. Now you understand my dilemma. Britt could move to New York. His job allows him to live anywhere he wants to. Melody's brow puckered. But his job is here, at White Castle. This is a side gig. Or didn't he tell you that? He mentioned that he's an antiques dealer. My impression is that he loves the countryside, small towns, and their history. Those traits are proving to be a problem. I did sort of turn him down last week, but he gave me the ring to keep. I got that impression, too, Melody said dryly. Did he tell you about me? Um, a little bit, Melody lied. Actually, Britt hadn't said much at all, only that there had been a woman who had turned down his proposal. I don't understand the status between you two. We decided to take a little break, but a week was all I could stand to be away from him. Melody chewed on her lips, fidgeting with the sheets. If she truly loved a man, she wouldn't have let more than 24 hours go by without running back to him. But aren't you leaving for New York indefinitely? Yes, but I've decided there are some things too tempting to pass up. My mind does not want to go there, so please spare me. Oh, sweetheart, I'm not talking about that. Britt wanted to wait for our wedding night. No, I'm talking about the fact that, while sitting in my tiny cramped apartment, I realized what an idiot I am. What do I care if Britt and I don't see each other very often? We can still travel first class to New York. He can hire more gardeners, for that matter. A hundred gardeners, if he wants to. My brain is too muddled. I have no idea what you're talking about. For a girl with an MBA and a 4.0 GPA, you're having a hard time putting the pieces together. I thought long and hard while staring at my four-carat diamond and ruby ring. Why was I giving up the best eye candy in the South? And... Why would I voluntarily give up Brit's money? I could have it all. My career, a doting husband, a lavish penthouse in New York City, attendance at all the best parties and events. I'd be a very rich woman. Okay, I'm even more confused. Crystal grabbed her by the shoulders, wiggling her diamond-clad finger in front of Melody's face. Pay attention. 
there's a blue Italian Maserati in the rear garages at the back of the property, with a red Ferrari in the stall next to it. There is, Melody echoed, trying to take in what her sister was telling her while her mind exploded. So, here is my fiancé's little secret, sweetheart. Britt Mandeville is a freaking billionaire. Melody's heart stopped for three beats. She'd have sworn on a Bible it did, and then her heart began to pound so hard she couldn't hear herself think. Her limbs turned to mush and then liquidated onto the duvet into a puddle of shock. What? She stuttered. You're making this up. I swear on our parents' graves that I'm not. A throbbing pain started on either side of Melody's head, fracturing the light from the lamps. Please don't say that. You know I hate when you do that. Crystal held out her pinky to make a promise of honesty, just like they used to when they were kids, except that Crystal always got the better end of the deal, just like now. If Britt is a, a billionaire, Melody said slowly, what's he doing at White Castle clearing brush after a hurricane? That's my entire point, Crystal paced the floor, her heels clacking on the hardwood floors. All the pieces of her sister's revelations were pinging around like a pinball machine in Melody's brain. Let me get this straight. You guys went on a break. You told him no when he proposed. But you're back tonight because he's a billionaire and you want to accept his proposal because of his money. That's pretty callous, Crystal. Even for you. Hey, I'm not a fool. I know a good thing when I see it. It's not like he and I won't see each other at least one week out of every month. Melody winced, suddenly exhausted. This conversation was really beginning to bother her. Don't give me that judgmental look, little sister. I've lived in New York long enough to know that sentimental hearts only get broken. It's a cutthroat business I'm in, and I need all the help I can get. Besides, who wouldn't love Britt? He's handsome, too nice for his own good, and he offered it all to me. So, I'm taking it with both hands. If it makes me a witch, so be it. Except Britt doesn't want your lifestyle. How would you know that? You just told me you two hardly talked. We, uh, spoke a bit at lunchtime, Melody replied vaguely. She wasn't going to give Crystal the details of the last 24 hours. Those moments with Britt were hers, the memory of him catching her, and the way his arms trembled, as if he was honestly frightened that she had almost fallen into the Mississippi to be swept away forever. Good grief. Was she in love with the man? But that was impossible. She hardly knew him. Don't try to be evasive, Crystal said. I always know when you're lying. Melody rolled her eyes, then looked at her sister straight on. In many ways, the world made us sisters tough. We had to be after Mom and Dad, but we both went after our dreams. I did too. While you left me to take care of Granny Mary. By myself, I might add, Melody said curtly. You're so much better at it than I am. Her sister's flippant attitude loosened Melody's fury. I could have used your help during the hurricane. Mary is very sick. You've hardly asked about her. You could have offered to meet us somewhere with your car to drive us out of the city. Crystal gave her a smile. I was a little busy dreaming about my engagement in Brit's billions. The air left her lungs, shocked by Crystal's lack of empathy. Wow, I guess that says it all. Melody had no livelihood left while Crystal would go on her merry way to a dazzling career in New York City with a cool billion of Brit's bank account embezzled in her back pocket. Okay, not literally. But goodness, her sister was a gold digger. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. Good night. It's goodbye for me, Melody. You'll see me in a few weeks. Will I? Of course. You're invited to the wedding. You have a date? No but we will soon. Or maybe we'll fly to some exotic island for the ceremony. I could wear a flowing white dress and go barefoot. We'll stay at a resort. I'll make Britt buy a ticket for you and Avery. How very generous of you. 
Walking forward, Crystal gave Melody a brief hug. I have a car rental that's going to show up for you tomorrow. Can't have you here in the house alone with my fiancé, can I? Not trusting your own sister and fiancé is pathetic, Melody retorted. And I don't appreciate the innuendo. Just kidding, Crystal said, pecking her on the cheek. She sailed out the door and closed it behind her with a firm click. No, Crystal, Melody whispered aloud. You were not kidding. Chapter 15 To sneak down to the kitchen and raid the fridge, or not, that was the question. Melody paced the floor of the guest suite, too worked up to go back to sleep. Crystal could be so exasperating. She'd come back to claim her territory and marry a man for his money. Oh, she probably had some feelings for Britt, but Crystal had been very cold and calculating. At least she was honest. But had she been honest with Britt, the one who mattered most? What did Britt really think about Crystal? Were they just on a break? Or were those Crystal's words because she'd decided she couldn't give up his money? And, oh my heck, Melody whispered, striding toward the French balcony doors. Britt Mandeville is a billionaire? An honest-to-goodness billionaire? I have to get some air. Stepping out onto the balcony, she gripped the railing to steady herself. Tonight had been full of revelations, and she didn't know quite how to process it all. She sank into one of the cushioned chairs. Britt had given her one of the best suites in the house. He was very generous to a stranger that showed up during a storm, dripping mud on the antique rug he was supposed to be caring for. Why are you here, Britt? She mused aloud. With that kind of money, you could go anywhere, do anything. Melody's brain raced with more questions than ever before. Perhaps he really was telling the truth. He loved history and antiques and physical labor, designing, creating, and beautifying. The owner of this historic home was getting a deal in this man. She was now dying of curiosity to go sneak into the garages and see if Crystal spoke the truth. That was first on her agenda tomorrow, including a trip to the parish courthouse to look up old property deeds. Right now, investigating her grandmother's mysterious request was the most important task. Melody wondered if Granny Mary did know about Crystal and Brett. Is that why she had sent Melody here? Knowing she'd be safe with her sister and they'd be together during the hurricane? That made as much sense as anything else. Melody leaned her head back, enjoying the luscious night air on her bare legs and neck. Oh, it was lovely here. What a waste of a gorgeous home on Crystal, who didn't appreciate it at all, or appreciate Brit. Fairy lights in the oak and cypress trees glittered overhead like frosted raindrops. The lights along the rose garden pathway glowed in shapes of sunbursts and stars. It was so beautiful, it almost made her cry. The sound of feet below on the patio paving sounded, and Melody sat up straight. Then the footsteps paused, and Melody rose from the balcony chair to stare down at the yard, the sheer curtains in the doorway billowing behind her. When her eyes came into focus, she recognized the figure of Britt standing on the grass, just beyond the roses, his face gazing up at her. Melody sucked in her breath. Oh, she said, holding a hand to her mouth. Britt's gorgeous green eyes studied her and the expression on the man's face was startling. She stepped back, acutely aware that she was only wearing her tiny little nightgown. My apologies for startling you, Melody, he called out softly. I was just coming back from the barns. Barns, she repeated. There are horses? Um, no. They've been converted to storage sheds now, but I still call them barns out of habit. She stepped backwards into the shadows. Her skin broke out in goosebumps at the appreciative way he was looking at her. Oh, to have those eyes gaze at her every single day. Who wouldn't fall in love with this man? But he belonged to her sister. So, Melody needed to leave this place as soon as she could. Britt was dangerous to her soul, dangerous to her heart. Her attraction would take over all of her senses if she stayed any longer. I promise I'm not looking, Britt said, staring down at the ground. Just heading to bed. Hey, did you find the dinner I saved you? She shook her head, not daring to speak. Afraid she'd either burst from delight at the euphoria he gave her, 
or run downstairs as fast as she could and jump into his arms. Thank you, she finally said, retreating back into the room and locking the balcony doors. What a silly woman she was. But now that she was awake, she was famished. Throwing the robe over her nightgown, Melody tiptoed to the upper hallway. The house was quiet. The grandfather clock downstairs chimed one. On bare feet, she padded down to the breakfast area. Pushing open the door to the kitchen, she collided right into Brit. You were supposed to have gone to bed, Mr. Mandeville, she told him sternly. He chuckled, raiding the refrigerator and pulling out plastic containers. A skewer of shrimp and a fillet of catfish were slowly sizzling in a pan on the stove. What are you doing? Reheating your dinner. I couldn't let you go to bed hungry just because you were trying to wait out me and Crystal. I'm not a poor orphan child. Actually, I'd fallen asleep with all the lights on, and then Crystal barged in. Britt's head jerked up. You mean you recently spoke to Crystal? She left my room about 30 minutes ago. We had a little sisterly chat. He lifted his eyebrows. That sounds ominous. It was about normal. Ah, and what is normal about Crystal when she's in sister mode? I get lectures on my comportment and manners, mostly. And then there's the usual stay away from my man discussion. Uh-oh, Britt let out a breath. I have a feeling she is quite fierce. That's a good way of describing it. Before Melody knew it, Britt was tugging her toward the table. The bolt of electricity that shot through her was so powerful, she actually gasped, and then she immediately blushed, so hard, her face heated up like she was standing near a fire. Are you okay? Britt asked. He pulled out a chair and laid the plate of food on the table for her. The shrimp was sizzling, and the catfish seasoned and blackened, along with a pile of rice and steamed green peppers. You want a serving of salad, too? I made it with spinach and strawberries. Melody moaned with pleasure. This food looks fantastic, and it smells divine. Have I eaten in the last two days? She joked. Britt turned his dazzling smile on her. It was like basking in sunlight after the storm clouds, the storm clouds known as crystal. I'm pretty sure I fed you two square meals earlier today. Breakfast and lunch. Or was it all a dream? She laughed again. <laughs> nope, it was real. But this is too much to eat this time of night. I'll have late night food nightmares. We can't have that. I'll serenade you below your balcony to make sure you have only sweet dreams. You're a singer, too? Oh, my. Is there nothing you don't excel at, sir? His brow puckered into a frown. I'm a terrible boyfriend, fiancé, friend. Love, with all its complications, isn't my forte. I've never been good at finding the right woman. Melody ate one of the shrimps, and then took a bite of the catfish, launching into a series of appreciative noises. I have a hard time believing that. This is heavenly, by the way. While I eat, you tell me about your romance woes. I'm a good listener. Believe me, it's all very boring. Overwhelmed at sitting in Britt's presence, his body being so close to her sent tingles up her spine. Melody cleared her throat. Love is never boring. He smiled at her, and Melody lit up inside. She really needed to stop looking at him. She was probably giving herself away. She had to remain cordial, but distant. That's a very wise statement, Britt said. But every girl I date only lasts a year at the most, usually less. I always pick the ones who are career-driven, make plans without me as part of their life. Crystal is very determined to be a star of some kind. The stage, the fashion industry. She's quite talented. He nodded, but his pained expression belied his feelings. Melody wanted to erase the lines of consternation on his face with her fingertips. But instead, she gripped her fork and knife even harder, determined to appear nonchalant, which wasn't very easy with the powerful level of emotions that rose due to the close proximity of Brit, including Crystal's veiled threats concerning the man. Maybe my relationship with Crystal worked better than other girls in the past because we spent half our time apart. Britt laughed at himself, as if he realized how foolish that sounded. 
I thought proposing would solve everything, that she'd choose me, but she didn't. What did she say? Melody was too curious not to ask. Mostly complained about living in an old house. Crystal is a very modern woman. Britt raked a hand through his thick, dark hair. How dumb can I be? He glanced over at Melody. Don't answer that, he warned. She needs the big city, her career, her agent gushing over her. I could see in her hidden eye rolls that White Castle didn't appeal to her at all. You did give her quite an impressive diamond. That was the moment her eyes twinkled, Britt admitted. Isn't that an old saying? The way to a man's heart is through his stomach, and diamonds are a girl's best friend, Melody finished. I'll quit talking and let you finish eating. You don't have to stay up and keep me company. I'm too restless to sleep yet. Besides, you're pretty good company. Well, thank you, Melody said primly. So, she said slowly, did my sister turn you down flat? Not exactly. When she wanted me to give up this place and my business and move with her to New York, I let her off the hook. I told her that maybe we needed a break. She could keep the ring. It was a gift. Very generous of you. She was wearing it in style tonight. Deep down, she knew that Crystal just wanted to show it off. Britt grabbed the pitcher of ice water, pouring more into Melody's glass. I probably shouldn't be saying this, but... It was a complete surprise when she showed up tonight wearing the ring, saying she was having second thoughts, that she did want to get married. Pretty fast turnaround in her feelings. Or am I reading too much into it? Melody glanced up at him quizzically. What was she supposed to say? Especially after her sister confessed that she wanted to marry Britt because of his wealth. But maybe that was wrong, too. Britt was just so down-to-earth, so real. He certainly didn't act like a wealthy man, let alone a billionaire. Maybe Crystal had it all wrong? What rich guy raked their own yard, cooked their own meals, wore soft jeans and tight t-shirts, ran around barefoot in the house? Of course, this was small-town Louisiana where life was casual and unpretentious. Where are you originally from, Britt? she asked now. You sound a little bit West Coast, now I think of it. He wagged his eyebrows and dropped his soft Louisiana accent. You caught me. I spent a few years in Denver, but the South always tugs at my heart. The history and old homes, the drama and war stories, and Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind? That's my favorite book, favorite movie. We have several things in common, Melody de Lyon and then Britt gave her a quick, sexy wink. Melody stuck her hands under her thighs, willing herself not to blush. She was glad Britt hadn't turned on the full overhead arsenal of lights that most chefs worked under. I have to confess, Britt went on. I like your accent. It's soft, barely discernible at times, but you speak like a southern gentlewoman. My ancestors came straight from France to Louisiana in the 19th century, not by way of Acadia like the Cajuns did, settling in the swamps. College sort of toned it down, and living in New Orleans, too, which is very metropolitan. I spend most of my time talking to immigrants or visitors from around the world in the bookstore. You should hear Granny Mary. It's thicker, but she was also educated in San Francisco. She knows how to turn it on and off as needed. Ha, so that's the trick. Many Cajuns have perfected the art, too. Folks outside of Louisiana would never suspect. Britt gazed into her eyes with a look that made Melody shiver. What's that for? You pulled a fast one on me, he teased. You never answered my question. Just changed the subject. He was right, of course. She was avoiding the topic of his relationship with Crystal. I don't know if Crystal's change of heart means she truly loves me or what the ring represents. Did she talk to you about it? Melody bit at her lower lip, and Britt's eyes followed the gesture, his eyes lingering on her mouth. Feeling out of breath from his nearness, 
She tried to choose her words carefully. Of course we talked, we're sisters. But I'm sorry, I can't tell you what she said. It wouldn't be right of me. You need to figure out what Crystal's true motives are. We talked for five hours all through dinner, and I'm still in the dark. Serious conversations were never Crystal's forte. I'm sure this isn't easy for you. Melody rinsed her dishes in the sink, and he immediately came over and briefly laid a hand on her arm to stop her. Hey, I'll do those. I have a super-duper automatic dishwasher. Besides, you're a guest. No, no, no. I'm an unwanted guest, mister. You've been cooking and cleaning for me. I need to earn my keep. You already have. You are great company. So are you, Melody said softly. Now, I need to get to bed before the sun rises. Thank you for dinner. You're welcome. But we all have to eat, right? He switched off the kitchen light and they ascended the staircase, using the soft glow of nightlights to maneuver the steps. When they reached the main hall, Melody turned. My presence has spoiled your time with Crystal. Don't forget... She was gone before you arrived, with my ring and a no on her lips, although she wouldn't admit it to my face. Any last piece of advice? Melody looked at him steadily. Force her to talk to you. Don't let her off the hook, or she'll dangle you on that fishing line forever. Wise words. Do you fish, Miss Melody? She laughed. <laughs> Never learned. But I eat crawfish étouffée with the best of them. One of my favorite dishes. I'll take you out to one of my favorite Cajun restaurants one of these days. Melody waved away his words, emotion tugging at her throat when she finally said, Don't you know the code? Confusion crossed his features. What code? Even if you and Crystal don't make it together, you and I can't be friends. She would never forgive me. Melody barely got the words out before turning away from Britt and running lightly up the stairs to her bedroom. Once inside, she closed the door softly and flung herself onto the bed, her eyes prickly with emotion and longing. Crystal had only come back because Britt had money. She was teasing him, using him. What kind of wife was she going to be, living most of the time in New York, never sharing her husband's dreams and goals in life? Despite Brit's millions or billions, he and her sister were worlds apart. Why did he have to be Crystal's man? If it was some other woman who had her hooks into Brit Mandeville, she'd have no qualms about flirting or pursuing the man. The sooner I forget about him, the better, she said, climbing into bed and snapping off the light. Her mind spun from the conversation with her sister and then her unexpected meal in the kitchen with Brit. Bunching the pillow under her cheek, she closed her eyes and relived the moments he had gazed at her and touched her hand. The sound of his deep, melodic voice was enough to make her swoon. Was the man just naturally charismatic, or was he merely a flirt with any female within close range? Did he feel the vibes between them too? Maybe it was all her own imagination and he was just a gracious host and a sincerely kind person. If he was, then he was exactly the kind of man she'd been looking for her whole life, only to be snatched away by the one person Melody never saw coming. Chapter 16 Melody tossed and turned, Crystal's little midnight talk replaying in her head like an old stuck vinyl record. Mary had stacks of them in the attic. As a teenager, Melody used to sit up there and play Frank Sinatra or Bing Crosby with a few Beatles and Elvis thrown in the mix. Melody finally fell into a deep sleep, only to wake at dawn. A rooster was crowing, and tiny beams of sunrise began peeking through the gigantic oaks. All night long, something had been nagging at her brain. Any successful businessman could buy a big old diamond ring for the woman he loved. But Brit, as a billionaire, was a whole new level of outrageous wealth. Had Crystal come up to warn Melody away, or just to show off and brag? There was only one way to find out. Melody showered quickly and pulled on her jeans. Her sneakers were still damp. She could have stuck them outside to dry, except there hadn't been a whole lot of sun yet. 
Hopefully, the clouds would break up today, and she could be on her way to New Orleans to assess the damage of her life. Her love life had been pretty pathetic to begin with, and now that she had met Britt, there was no more neutral. A noise came from the hallway, and Melody cracked open the door to see Crystal bumping her suitcase down the staircase. It was true, then, that her sister was off to catch an early morning flight to New York. Had the other things she said been true? Waiting for the front door to close behind her sister, Melody counted to one hundred. No sign of Crystal returning. No sign of Britt appearing to say goodbye. They must have said their goodbyes after dinner last night. But it wasn't a positive sign that Britt hadn't dragged himself out of bed to kiss his fiancée one last time. At least, not a positive sign for their relationship. Melody descended the stairs to crack open the front door. The red taillights of Crystal's car glowed in the dusky light. The engine revved and she gunned the gas pedal, spitting rocks as she peeled out of the long lane to the road that led to Baton Rouge. Annoyed much, sis? Melody muttered. That makes two of us. Stepping onto the porch, she rubbed her arms against the chill of the morning. The storm clouds were breaking up and turning into puffy white cotton balls that tumbled across the sky. She'd have to watch the news this morning to see what the roads were like in New Orleans. Meanwhile, she planned to do a few minutes of sleuthing, starting with the barns, or sheds, or whatever Brick called them to hide their true contents. Crystal may have been exaggerating everything just to get under Melody's skin. Striding through the gardens, Melody crossed the expanse of lawns, emerald and dewy, while the blades of grass glistened under the morning sun. The two hundred year old oak trees spread their massive, gnarly branches in a wide umbrella, shading the property. Beyond the swimming pool lay a set of low roofed buildings with sliding garage doors. Taking a peek over her shoulder at the dark house, she hurried to the side doors and let herself in, her heart thudding, as if she were a burglar. Stacks of boxes were in the first garage, the second had more boxes as well as an array of bicycles of all sizes. Guests could probably go for a ride on the country lanes or along the Mississippi if they had a mind to. The third garage was dark, and Melody fumbled for the light switch on the wall. When she flicked it on, she let out a gasp. A gleaming midnight blue Maserati was sitting in the center of the room. Oh, wow, Melody breathed, running a hand along the hood, where the finish was a glowing satin. Now that is quite a car. And well over a hundred grand. Maybe even two hundred if it was a sports model. She breathed in the new car smell, wishing she could open the locked doors and sit at the wheel. What a dream. There was another garage, and Melody wasted no time in undoing the simple hinge lock and opening the door. Crystal wasn't lying when a cherry red Ferrari literally took her breath away. The car of every boy's dream and their girlfriends. She sagged against the garage door for a moment and then circled the sports car, lightly touching the perfect finish. She tried the door and found it unlocked. Did she dare? Surreptitiously, glancing over her shoulder, Melody slipped into the driver's seat. The plush leather was perfect, fitting her like a glove. Keys? She said with a chuckle. No, there wasn't a set in the ignition. She smoothed a hand along the dash, trying out the stick shift and turning the wheel. She pretended she was driving along a winding Italian country lane, villas and grape vineyards in the distance. Closing her eyes, she conjured up the image of Britt sitting beside her, elbow perched on the open window ledge while warm, spicy air slid like silk over her skin. In an hour... They'd stop for lunch at a little cafe and order linguine with oven-baked breads and spumoni for dessert. So how much does a Ferrari go for these days, she wondered aloud. Over 200,000 U.S. dollars, a male voice said in her ear. Oh! Melody screamed, jumping so high in her seat, her head banged against the ceiling. Oh, wow, ouch! Britt stood next to her, a hand resting on top of the car door while he leaned down to give her a Cheshire Cat grin. You scared me, she accused him, her heart pounding at his nearness, their faces only inches away from each other. 
I had to make sure you weren't a burglar preparing to drive off in my new car. You knew I wasn't a burglar. You're right. But I thought perhaps you heard me come into the garage. It's practically soundproof sitting inside here. Plus, she added, her heart whacking against her ribs from the adrenaline. I was sort of daydreaming. Daydreaming is good, he agreed. Everybody should have a good daydream now and then. Why did his voice send her soul to the moon? Why was he looking at her with such significance? I'm sorry I'm sitting in your car, your terribly expensive car. I shouldn't have touched it. You're probably furious with me. Just the opposite. I think you look good sitting here. You reminded me of a happy teen whose dream has just come true. A teenager. Oh, good. Hey, I meant that as a compliment. Melody arched an eyebrow at him quizzically. I guess I'll just have to trust you. You already do. The question is, can I trust you? Okay, now I'm mortified. Scoot aside and let me out. I promise never to come out here again and sit in your red luxury sports car. Stay where you are, Miss de Leon. I'm getting in on the other side. What? Why? Before Melody could protest again, Britt slid into the passenger seat and handed her the keys. You're kidding me. There's the ignition. Start her up. With the hurricane, I haven't been out in a week or two. Gotta keep her running smooth. But I might crash it. There's no way you should trust me to drive your car. Do you normally crash cars every time you drive one? He asked. She laughed. <laughs> of course not. I've never crashed a car in my life. Then I trust you. Britt pressed a button on a remote and the front doors of the garage slowly opened. You can pull straight forward. No backing up. This is just bizarre, Melody said, the purr of the engine like a fantasy come true. This is pretty fun at 6.30 in the morning. I always think about driving the Ferrari at this time of day. You are silly. And you are in much too good of a mood for a man whose fiancé just left for New York. She's not my fiancé, Melody. But I spent quite a bit of time thinking last night after we talked. Thinking can be dangerous, Melody warned playfully, as she slowly pulled forward, leaning into the steering wheel so she could see over the hood of the car. Sunlight glittered off the cherry color, sparkling like a pitcher of Kool-Aid and ice cubes. Turn left toward the mansion drive. Straight ahead. A hundred yards and then left around this curve, Britt instructed. I feel like I'm in a James Bond movie, Melody said, a laugh catching at her throat. I read between the lines last night. What lines? Yours, Melody, he said gently. And you've just proved my theory right. How did I do that? I haven't said a word about crystal or wedding dates or diamond rings or anything this morning. My mouth is shut forever. You didn't have to say anything else. After I went to bed, I figured out why Crystal came back so quickly. She's convinced herself that she doesn't have to live here at all. That she can have her cake and eat it too. And that sounds like my sister, all right. Finding you in my car this morning proves it all. Are you a detective in your spare time, Mr. Mandeville? Melody asked indignantly. No, he said his eyes sparkling with mischief. But I can put two and two together and get a perfect four. You wouldn't have come out here looking for my vehicles if Crystal hadn't told you about them. Oh. She had played right into his hands, even if she hadn't told him a thing about her conversation with her sister. Now I'm more than embarrassed. I can't show my face again. Actually... I love that I found you out here sitting in my car. Saves me from looking like a braggart when I showed it off. I'm so glad I could be of service then, Melody told him, pretending indignation. He chuckled in that warm, deep voice. 
You are cute when you're pretending to be mad. Wrong adjective, mister. No woman wants to be called cute. That's for teenage girls and plush toys. I should have clarified. Your personality is cute, but you are one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. Ha! Melody gave him a withering stare. Crystal is the stunning model, the sister who turns heads. That's true, but looks only last so long in a real relationship. Deeper friendships and romantic relationships need compatibility, mutual goals and respect, humor and laughter, as well as attraction. Melody almost choked at hearing those words come out of a man's mouth. Are you for real? I'm real. It's the car that's a dream. Melody swatted his leg with her hand. You are incorrigible. Eyes on the road, please. If you take the next right, that will lead us along the back road of the property, back to the garages. I don't think we should take a longer road trip without having breakfast first. Aye, aye, Captain. Melody did as Britt instructed and pulled the Ferrari back into the empty garage. She put the gear shift into park and then turned off the motor, handing the keys over. He caught the keys and her fingers in his hand, not letting go. Did I do something wrong? Melody asked, trying not to faint at the feel of his hand around hers, firm and warm and utterly sensual. Holding hands with Vince had never felt like this before. Her pulse was in her throat. Her mind became dizzy with his nearness and the spicy scent of his skin. The entire essence of this remarkable man you haven't done a single thing wrong, he said softly. You keep doing so many things very, very right. I want to know you better, Melody. All of you. Every part of you. You have a curious mind, a sensitive soul, and a giving nature. You and Crystal are so very, very different. Britt, I... I... Before she could get her thoughts out, Britt was suddenly in her line of vision, leaning close and gently cupping her head with his free hand to bring Melody toward him. He pressed his lips against hers in the gentlest of kisses. His lips were soft and so much more delicious than she had ever imagined in all her daydreams of the past two days. Which Melody shouldn't have been doing. Daydreaming about her sister's fiancé was not good. Not right. Not right at all. Oh, but what is happening? She whispered against his mouth. My mind is all mixed up. My heart is going crazy. I'm going crazy over you, Britt said in a low voice, turning his head to kiss her again. Melody tasted the scent of his skin and his amazing lips, and her limbs went as limp as overcooked spaghetti. We... We can't, she tried to say, as he pressed her face closer to his own to explore her lips even more fully. Seriously, if he kept going like this, she'd be an emotional wreck for the rest of the day, putty in his hands. After several long moments of the best kissing Melody had ever experienced, Britt paused, still holding her hand in his, his face close, his expression tender. I'm probably coming on too strong. But ever since I saw you in the hall at midnight, it felt like you belonged here at White Castle. With me, it sounds crazy, but I had the strangest thought that I'd been waiting my whole life for you. He pulled her into his arms, and Melody melted against his chest, her face in his neck, while his hand fingered the long strands of her hair. I go to sleep thinking about you, wanting to hold you, and then I wake up and life crashes down again. Life can't be crashing too bad when you own a car like this, she teased. Britt laughed. You're funny and refreshing. And that kiss just now was more than remarkable. His fingers tightened on hers as he pressed his lips against the back of her hand in a romantic gesture. 
If I say anything to confirm or deny about that kiss, I will only incriminate myself. He chuckled again. <laughs> you are adorable. Brit, Melody said, forcing herself to pull away. As romantic and wonderful that kissing you in a Ferrari may be, there is Crystal. I can't do this to my own sister. You're engaged. She wears your ring. This is so wrong in every way. Her voice choked. Melody, we are not engaged. We were on a break when you showed up, and I told her last night that any official engagement was off, even though she came back to give me a yes answer. All evening, nothing she said rang true or sincere, only that she wanted to put up an announcement in the society page in New York and go wedding shopping. Newspaper clippings and wedding dresses do not make a marriage, Melody said out loud not realizing that she was speaking her thoughts. Blushing furiously and ducking her head, Melody tried not to be embarrassed after her comment. You're absolutely right, Britt said, using one of his fingers to brush the hair out of her eyes while his gaze locked onto hers. Crystal is in love with the idea of a star-studded wedding. I know it sounds crass, but I realized that I needed to face a cold dose of reality. After thinking half my nights away ever since I met you, I knew that she wasn't really in love with me, just the idea of me and my money. We're so incompatible in every other way. In a year, we'd be miserable. We're done. That's why she left so angry, Melody said softly. Why do you think I came to find you? She tried not to laugh. To make sure I didn't take off with your car? Britt let out another burst of laughter. <laughs> Have I told you lately that you're adorable? Yes, and you can tell me as often as you'd like. So, she said, pausing to collect her thoughts, trying to breathe normally. It would be so easy to sit in this sports car and kiss until their lips were bruised. But there was still so much about Britt Mandeville that she didn't know. Although she liked the things she did know very, very much, and she needed to remember that her sister was still part of the equation. He lowered his head closer to hers, his voice soft and deep in her ear. I see your mind whirring away. What's going on inside that brilliant mind of yours, Melody? Thoughts tumbled over one another. What was she going to do about her developing feelings, knowing Britt returned them, but also keeping her relationship with Crystal intact? Crystal is still very much in the background. So, what do we do now? Besides the obvious? Melody punched him on the arm, her lips twitching with mirth. He leaned back, folding her hands between his. Right now, we get on our work gloves, load up gear and supplies in my truck, and we head to New Orleans to dig out your bookstore and visit your grandmother. Are the roads open? Turn on the morning news while I cook up some eggs and bacon. Then we'll make a plan. Chapter 17 Thirty minutes later, they sat in front of the television set watching the weather report and updates on the aftermath of the hurricane. Britt shoveled eggs and bacon into his mouth like there was no tomorrow. Melody stabbed a fork into the last of her eggs, amused. He was like a big, adventurous kid sometimes. There were so many aspects of this man that intrigued her and mesmerized her. But she had to hold back. It was almost too good to be true that he desired her as much as she longed for him. Standing up, Melody said, Thank you for breakfast. I'm going to go upstairs and put a bag together for the day. We have no idea what we're going to find in downtown New Orleans. Britt stood up and stretched. Mm, good thinking. Let's get on the road as soon as we can, since it's almost a two-hour drive into the city. Maybe more, depending on the road conditions. We can talk and plan on the way. 
even though I'd love to stay here and spend the day with you cozy on the couch or taking a walk together. I'll bet it's very nice kissing under an oak tree, although I've never tried it. Yet. Heat rose up Melody's cheeks. Kissing Brit under a tree with a picnic would be the perfect way to spend the day. But she had to banish those thoughts. Slowly, she backed out of the sitting room, trying not to be tempted as she wrestled with herself over feeling disloyal to Crystal. Crystal was still an issue and would always be an issue. When Melody reached her room and turned on the shower, she pondered the complications arising from her and Britt's feelings. Because Crystal was her sister, and she would raise heck if she knew that Britt had kissed her and called her adorable. Crystal would probably never speak to her again. Of course, they rarely spoke that often. Her fashion plate sister's life was filled with auditions and lunch meetings, photo shoots, and clothes shopping. Melody called her sister in Chicago three times as much, and in fact, had visited Avery's family and her nephew and niece only a few months ago. Avery had her hands full, too, with her bridal gown business and the children. But she shouldn't get involved with her sister's ex-boyfriend, period, Melody determined as she stepped out of the shower and dressed. She wouldn't be surprised if Crystal returned to New York still wearing that outrageous diamond on her left hand. Her sister wouldn't be able to help herself. From there, the gossip would spread like wildfire. If Melody embarrassed Crystal, that would spell doom to their relationship. After examining the wound on her leg and putting on a smaller band-aid, Melody was glad to see it was beginning to heal. Fingers crossed, there wouldn't be much of a scar. She placed her few belongings in her backpack and then stepped into the hall. A peculiar clacking noise sounded from somewhere in the quiet house. Peeking into each of the empty guest rooms, Melody tried to locate it, finally heading downstairs where the clattering grew louder. In the back of the house, past the public rooms, she finally recognized the sound, the tapping of fingers on a keyboard. Britt, she called out. I'm here, Melody, he answered. She moved toward a room at the end of a perpendicular hallway, leaning against the doorframe to watch Britt, who sat at a computer. Work stuff? she asked casually, but also dying of curiosity about what he truly did for a living to earn major wealth in the millions or billions of dollars. Yup, he said, pausing from his work to gaze at her when she entered. Melody glanced around the wood-paneled office while Britt leaned back in his desk chair, which sat underneath a window that overlooked the side of the property where cypress trees provided shade. You do know that you are a contradiction a uh, dichotomy in every way, right? Melody said. My sister tells me you're filthy rich. You own luxury cars. And we're not talking about just a nice Lincoln or Corvette, but limited edition sports cars worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yet, you claim to be a gardener. Both of those things are true. Remember when I told you that I had an antique business? I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the company. Dreams. Caleb Davenport is the CEO and president. Oh, yes, Melody said with a nod. Caleb had no idea the online app selling products from all over the world would explode like it did. Since I'm a history and antique buff, I proposed we offer collectibles and antiques something they hadn't tried selling yet. Estate sales are more than just a bunch of Victorian couches. There are paintings and silver and china and stamp collections from some of the wealthiest families in the world. Right now, I'm digging through attics and old plantations, the ones that weren't burned down during the Civil War, and finding some amazing treasures. It sounds fascinating. It is, Britt agreed, holding out his hand. Come here. Melody moved forward while he grasped her hand in his and pointed at the computer screen. Actually, he had three monitors and impressive state-of-the-art equipment. I'm tracking shipments here, setting up some auctions over here, and finalizing details of my trip to Savannah for the estate sale. 
Actually, I managed to get three scheduled over just a two-day period, so I don't have to be gone very long. I hope you'll be all right here without me, and that you'll wait for me to return. I'm packed up to stay in New Orleans, if I can stay at my own apartment. Of course, that depends on the damage, but I can't remain at White Castle forever. I don't want you to go, you know, Britt said quietly. I like having you here with me. Melody's heart skipped a beat. I have to be practical. My emotions are running too strong. Plus, I need to see my grandmother. I won't keep you from her, and I'll try not to be so selfish. Brute gave her a smile and then kissed the back of her hand. Melody shivered at the touch of his lips against her skin. But instead, she focused on the evidence of Brit's intriguing historical business all over the computer screens, the potential wealth that surrounded her. You've certainly developed your passions into a thriving business. It's fascinating, too. I'd love to help you with it, she stopped, realizing what she was saying. When, if the time is ever right, I'm going to hold you to it, he said. This is all thanks to Caleb. He's the genius behind the computer app. I just lucked out, working for him. Melody sank into a chair. Knowing the value and history of antiques is not lucking out, Mr. Mandeville. You've put your time and passion, but why are you a groundskeeper here at White Castle? It seems so isolated. Not really. Thirty minutes to Baton Rouge. Another hour to New Orleans, when there isn't a hurricane blowing through, that is, he added with a grin. People in San Francisco and New York City commute longer than that, and most of my work is online or via conference calls. I travel maybe once a month. Besides, I like to keep physically busy, too. Sitting at the computer can drive me crazy after a while, and... I fell in love with the plantations of the South during my college years. You are a fascinating man, Melody told him. He rose from his chair, pulling her to her feet as well, and wrapped his arms around her. You feel fantastic, he told her, lifting her off her feet for a moment. Setting her back down, he leaned in closer, but Melody stepped back. It's tempting, Brett, but I have to practice restraint. I can't do this to my sister. He dropped his hands and nodded. I understand. No more touching. Until you give me the word. It might be a year or more, she warned him. It will depend on what Crystal does in New York the next few weeks. If your pending nuptials are announced in People magazine or the New York Times, Britt groaned, running his fingers through his hair. In my various lines of work, I've had to learn patience. Patience watching flowers and trees grow. Patience waiting for the right piece of art to rise at the most opportune moment. The right timing for an auction. I think it all started <laughs> when I was teaching high schoolers, he said with a laugh. Teenagers force you to have patience. I can imagine, Melody said. And now... If you will drop me off in Baton Rouge so I can pick up a rental car to drive into New Orleans, we will bid goodbye for now. Britt shook his head. Mm, no. I'm taking you down there myself. I can't ask you to do any more for me. And what have I done besides cook a few meals? There's still flooding in parts of the city. Potential crime? Especially in the downtown area. Being alone is not safe, and you don't know what you're going to find when you get there. Oh, why do you have to make so much sense? I'm giving you an out, Mandeville. I'm sure the rest of your tour and kitchen crew will be arriving back on site over the next few days. No more arguments. I'd hate myself if I let you drive off to the French Quarter without a bodyguard. Now you're my bodyguard, huh? I have my black belt in karate, in case you didn't know, and a Ruger handgun under the seat of my truck. Yikes. I hope it's not that bad in New Orleans. Wait a minute. 
You have a truck now, too? How many cars do you own? One for every occasion, he said with a wry smile. You never know when a certain vehicle might come in handy. If I can't twist your arm, then what are we waiting for, handyman? You can twist my arm any time, as long as you do it up close and personal. She raised an eyebrow, her heart pounding at his teasing words. I think someone is not focusing on the matter at hand. Give me something else to think about then, Melody, he said in a husky voice. She moved into a circle of reach and tugged at the collar of his t-shirt. Pulling him close, Melody leaned in to kiss him full on the lips. She heard his surprise intake of breath and his hands caught her hips, sending her heart thudding. Melody held the kiss, exploring his lips for a few moments before breaking it off. That will have to last you for a long time, Mr. Mandeville. No more flirting. There's work to be done. Aye, aye, Captain he said, copying her words from earlier. My truck is loaded and ready to go. Whoa, that was fast. What can I say? You take long showers. Incorrigible man, Melody muttered under her breath before glancing up at his breathtaking eyes, which held hers in a penetrating gaze. Chapter 18 True to his word, Britt had a blue Chevy truck in the front drive loaded with tools, lumber, saws, a stack of blankets, heavy-duty garbage bags, and a huge cooler filled with food and ice. A second cooler was stuffed with water bottles and juices. Are you planning to feed an army? He gave her a wink. You never know who you're going to meet who needs help. Melody shook her head in awe. This man continued to surprise and delight her. His warmth and generosity seemed to know no bounds. You are pretty extraordinary, she said quietly. Ditto, Melody. First stop is the hospital. I know you're worried. The nurses have been keeping me informed, but I have to see her with my own eyes. After Britt opened the cab door of the truck, Melody climbed in and they were off. The vehicle had all the bells and whistles, and the engine noise became almost a lullaby as she dozed off. Late nights and early mornings didn't go together anymore. She was no longer a college freshman who could study all night and ace an exam the next day. A light touch on her arm startled her. Melody sat up straight and adjusted her seatbelt. Where are we? What time is it? Look ahead. There's the big easy right in front of us. And it's going on ten o'clock. Sure enough, Melody could see the tall downtown buildings Lake Pontchartrain in a blue sweep to the east, clogged roads and highways surrounding them. Look over there. Those roads disappear right into bodies of water. Yeah, it's crazy. But I think the city is slowly draining compared to the images I saw before the house power went out. The French Quarter usually doesn't get hit as badly as other lower areas, but my little bookstore is off an alley that sits lower than the main streets. I'm dreading this. Melody gripped the dash while Britt maneuvered the streets to the hospital. Within another hour of slow traffic and clogged roads, they had parked and were getting directions to Mary's room from the nurse's station. She practically raced down the hall, and Britt caught her arm. Easy there. You don't want to alarm the other patients, or your grandmother. Not more than thirty seconds later, Melody burst through the door and stopped as a nurse was taking Mary's vitals. I'm Melody, her granddaughter, she told the woman. Glad to see you, Melody. Mrs. DeLeon is waking up more each day, so come say hello. Just don't stay too long. How are her x-rays, Melody asked. Getting better. She's lucky, the nurse lowered her voice. At her age, pneumonia can be tricky, especially when she came in off a boat, so ill and cold and drenched to the bone. Melody nodded, moving toward the bed where Mary lay so small, so fragile. Her skin was ashen color, eyelids paper thin with spidery blue veins. It's me, Mary, she said softly. Melody, are you awake? Mary's eyes fluttered, attempting to open. Melody, darling, 
she said in a whispery voice. Been dreaming about you. I've been worrying about you constantly. I couldn't get back into the city until today. Her grandmother's fingers plucked at the white sheet as she tried to adjust her position, groaning as she did so. The breathing tubes twisted and Melody reached out to adjust them. What day is it? Just lie still. I'll retuck your bedding to make you more comfortable. Mary blinked as though the light from the window was bothering her, and Melody pulled the blinds down. Her grandmother let out a deep, hoarse sigh, her chest rattling from the pneumonia, while Melody straightened the sheets and tucked them under the mattress, smoothing out the wrinkles with her hands. Mary fumbled for Melody's fingers, but her strength was limited. Tell me, she said. Melody grabbed a chair and held her hot, feverish fingers between her own. Tell you what, dear. Crystal, is she? Words and energy seemed to fail her. I saw her yesterday, and she's fine. She flew back to New York today. Mary tried to wet her dry lips, and Melody picked up the water cup from the bedside table, holding the straw in her mouth so she could take a sip. Just wet your whistle, she said lightly. I'll put some lip balm on for you. That will help with the chapped lips. She rummaged in her purse and applied the balm, which seemed to calm her grandmother. Tell me, Mary said again. Tell me about... Her lips tried to form the words, but she ended up shaking her head in frustration. Do you mean did I go to White Castle? Melody asked, knowing full well that was weighing on her grandmother's mind. Yes, I did. The flooding wasn't bad, although the power was out for a few days. The sun is coming out now. We survived the hurricane, and you're getting well. Keep fighting hard to get your strength back. Weakly, Mary lifted her hand, waving it in the air for a moment, as though trying to collect her thoughts. Slowly, she turned her head. Did you? Did you find it? A deep rattling sound racked her chest, and then her strength was gone and she closed her eyes. Mary, are you still awake? Should I get the nurse? Melody glanced behind her, aware that Britt was standing behind her, solid and silent, prepared to run and do anything she asked of him. Her grandmother's eyes suddenly fluttered again. Promise. Promise. White Castle. Leaning in close, Melody said, I saw the photograph of you and Papa in the ballroom. But why were you there? What does it mean? Remember. Remember. Mary let out a long, rattling sigh that sounded horrible, and then lapsed into unconsciousness again. Melody watched her for a few moments longer, wiping the emotion from her eyes. Rising, she kissed her grandmother on the cheek and then slowly back toward the door. Britt put an arm around her and pulled her in for a comforting hug. She's going to recover and be home before you know it. Melody nodded, unable to speak for a moment. Our grandparents gave us a wonderful life. I can see how much you love each other. Did you hear what she said to me? Not much. Were you able to understand what she was trying to tell you? There are things she wants me to do. Things I already plan to do, but I need a vehicle to accomplish them. You can use my truck. I have a Lincoln Navigator, too, which has a back end like an SUV and is super comfortable to drive. Four cars? Melody lifted her eyebrows. Any other cars you'd like to tell me about? His expression turned sheepish. I have a Lincoln I keep in Savannah at an apartment there. I use Savannah as a headquarters for my auctions and all of that. It's easy to get to Atlanta or Charleston from there. Sometimes Charlotte, North Carolina. I do like road trips. Melody's mouth quirked into a smile. I want to kiss those saucy lips, you know, Britt said, leaning close to whisper in her ear. Shh, he 
You're terrible. But you're grinning from ear to ear. Hopeless. That's what you are. Melody allowed him to take her arm while they returned to the parking lot and climbed back into the truck. She was quiet as they drove through the neighborhoods on the way to the French Quarter. Roads still sported a few inches of standing water where residents or emergency people were sloshing through. Mounds of trash heaped up along the lawns. Insulation, soggy drywall, damaged furniture. Countless trash bags loaded with irreparable pictures, clothes, and toys. I should go check on Mary's house, but I can't bear to see it right now. I'll call some of her neighbors to see what needs to be done. We can do a cleanup there, too. But aren't you scheduled for your work trip soon? It will all work out, Melody, he said, pressing her hand as he drove down Bourbon Street. Now, direct me to Books on the Mississippi. Turn right at the next corner, then go down the wide alley a couple hundred feet. My store is on the right, brick facade, picture windows full of books. Except there wasn't. Melody choked out a cry when she climbed out of the truck and lurched toward the front door, sloshing through water. Oh, no. Oh, no. She moaned, stumbling down the broken sidewalk. The books were gone, or rather, they had fallen into the still-standing water. The bloated bookshelves had crashed into a hundred splintered pieces floating on top of the water as well. The particle board shelves, purchased because she couldn't afford anything of higher quality, had nearly disintegrated, turning pulpy as though they had just been churned through a paper mill. The door was unlocked, and a growl of irritation exploded from Melody's throat. That's Vince's doing. He couldn't even lock the door behind him. Silently, the two of them walked the aisles previously labeled new releases, adult fiction, travel, historical, science fiction, children, and young adult. After being waterlogged for so long, there were aisles where the shelves had fallen into soggy heaps that smelled horrible after being shut up in a hot, humid building for days. The books were forever ruined, bloated and wrinkled pages from sitting in water for so long and completely unreadable. Melody's chest grew tight. The damage was almost inconceivable. I can't salvage anything, she said, her throat thick and strained. When they reached the customer service desk, the cash registers were lying open and empty. Any money left taken by looters or Vince. It probably wouldn't matter anyway, Britt said. Water damage is always the worst on books, and anything made of wood that's not solid oak. The squishy carpet under their feet felt weird, and Melody winced knowing it was probably not salvageable either. It had been cheap remnants to begin with. She started her bookstore five years ago on a shoestring budget and a small loan, afraid of not being able to pay the monthly mortgage. You're insured, right? Britt asked softly behind her. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure how much. I may have only insured the structure, not the contents. This may put me out of business for good. Chin up, sweet Melody, Britt said, his voice cheerful and optimistic. Easy for you to say, when you have billions in the bank. Melody put a hand to her mouth. I'm sorry, that wasn't fair. The tears finally came, dribbling silently down her cheeks. It's just so unbelievable. I can't even comprehend the damage this is. It's hard to take it all in, like something out of a... An apocalyptic movie. Hey, hey, Britt said, wrapping his big arms around her and rubbing her back. You're in shock, but anything can be fixed. You're tougher than you think, and you're from the South. Hurricanes and flooding never get us down for good. Neighbors help neighbors. You can depend on it. Everything has to be thrown out. All these 
lovely, precious books. But books can be reordered. Not the older ones, the collectibles. Although, I keep those up in the loft in a locked bookcase. Then there's hope. Come on, let's go upstairs. Holding her hand, Britt ventured up the stairs first, but even the carpet here was soggy, creating squishy noises as they ascended. Do you think the stairs are safe? Melody asked, tension rising in her throat. Looks like they're made out of hardwood. And there's a good railing, so I think we're fine, Britt assured her. Melody raced to the tall shelves in the tiny reading loft, running her hands along the books and pulling some of them out. There's some water damage on the lower shelves, but higher up, the volumes look halfway decent. She lifted her eyes to the ceiling, where the plasterboard had rings of brown stains. Got a roof leak, it looks like, Britt said. But it's holding. Where's your apartment? Through this door, although I'm embarrassed to show it to you. I hadn't had time to clean in weeks, and it also serves as my office for the bookstore, so it probably looks like a cyclone tore through it. Cyclones or hurricanes, Britt said with a smile, which is worse. Very funny. Melody stepped through the door and gasped. <gasps> oh, no! Two windows on the south side had been blown out by the hurricane force winds, and most of the mess was from that. Papers were strewn everywhere, even plastered to the walls. Table lamps were scattered across the floor in broken chunks. The pillows from the sofa had been blown into the small kitchenette, where the chairs were on their sides and her toaster oven lay upended in a corner. This is depressing, Melody said, putting a hand on one of the walls to steady herself. Ooh-wee, Britt whistled. Here's a filing cabinet fallen over. That used to hold invoices, orders, and tax papers. Hey, I can tell the IRS it was all destroyed in the hurricane of the year, right? See, there is a silver lining. Melody couldn't help smiling a little. Leave it to you to look at the bright side. A lot of these papers and notes from my desk are unreadable, she said, picking up sheets from the floor and couch, hidden under the desk chair and stuck along the ceiling. How will I ever remember what they were? You'll simply call your vendors and distributors and have them regenerate any recent paperwork. And if you have notes on orders or phone calls to return, those folks will just have to reorder and call you again to answer their questions. I need to get a hold of my assistant, Lucy Brignick. I hope she and her family are okay. I haven't heard from her yet. There are dozens of phone calls to make. One step at a time. Call the insurance company and hurricane assessor about whether this place is even viable to live in. It's an old building and needs to be inspected. The bookstore can wait. I'm glad I have a little bit of savings. Maybe I'll call my sister for a loan, she added as a joke. Britt lifted an eyebrow. You mean Crystal? Yeah, that rock on her hand is probably worth a pretty penny. Melody turned to give Britt a quirk of her mouth. Kidding, he chuckled. <laughs> I could tell. No, I meant Avery in Chicago. We've been texting ever since the storm made landfall, and I talked to her last night before Crystal came up for our little chat. I told her we're safe, but she's worried that she and her husband will come down to help me clean up, but I guess I'd better wait until the place has been officially inspected. Melody righted one of the fallen kitchen chairs and sank into it with a deep sigh, putting her hands over her eyes while she tried to muster her mental energy. Right now, my wardrobe is sorely lacking. I'll grab some clothes and my most important files stowed in the metal filing cabinet. I think they escaped the worst of it. While you do that, I'm going to do some structural damage assessment on my own. Tread carefully, though. I'd never forgive myself if you step through a bad spot in the floor 
and hit the bookstore floor below. You're making me nervous now. I won't be far away, but let's leave in the next five minutes. Britt returned to the downstairs store while Melody tugged a suitcase out from under the soggy bed and began stuffing jeans and blouses, socks, extra shoes, sweaters, and a couple of jackets into it. Flipping through her filing cabinet, she grabbed folders of outstanding orders and invoices, a list of her vendors and distributors, and a few of her favorite old books. If this building had structural damage they couldn't see, she might not be able to recover anything else for weeks. The beautiful old collectibles, waterlogged and fallen off the shelves, broke her heart so badly she could barely breathe. Britt took the suitcase and shoulder bags from her while Melody turned in a circle, gazing at the destruction in a daze. They're like my children, my best friends. So many memories, so much heart and soul. What does the rest of the store look like? Um, not good. But I'm not an expert on foundations. We can just hope for the best. We'd better leave for now, Britt told her, putting an arm around her shoulders as they climbed back into the truck. Melody glanced at the clock on the dash. I suppose it's too late to try to drive out to my grandmother's house. From the sound of the news reports, that part of town is still underwater a couple of feet. We don't want to get stuck. Next time we come into the city, we'll go out there, I promise. You're right, she agreed. I'll try to get hold of a neighbor and find out the situation. It was a quiet drive back to White Castle. Britt cast a few glances at Melody, as if to check her mental state, which she appreciated. But mostly, she stared out the window as they drove slowly through the crowded roads of the city, shocked by the caved-in roofs and debris. Citizens, wading through the last foot of water carrying garbage bags of belongings, on their way to shelters or out of the city altogether. There are no words to describe this, she said. Reaching across the seat, Britt squeezed her hand. In a month, all this destruction will be bulldozed and new building begun. The aftermath is the most difficult. Melody gave him a wan smile. That's true. Once you've survived the storm and have escaped with your life. Chapter 19 When they reached White Castle, Britt deposited Melody's belongings back in her room. Hey, will you be okay if I leave you to make some phone calls? He asked. Yeah, I'm just tired. Think I'll go for a walk along the river while I telephone Avery. Enjoy yourself, but don't overdo it. We've just had a very long day. Dinner in two hours? Sounds good. I'll help. Pulling on one of her light jackets, Melody headed down to the main level. Something was tickling at her brain, but she couldn't figure out what it was. Canceling her plans for a walk, she strode toward Britt's office at the back of the stairs. Do you know where the contents from the previous owners of Nottingham would be stored? He appeared at the doorway and Melody could hear the printer going. You'd be amazed at how much there still is on the premises. Furniture was moved into the barns and sheds, but personal belongings and photographs are in the attic. Lots of things from the original family, even. To get to the attic, return back up to the guest room floor and walk to the end of the hall. There's another set of steps behind a door that goes up to the attic. Excitement fluttered in Melody's chest. Original history was often difficult to find. So this was amazing news. Sounds like the house still needs a lot of cataloging done. It's on my list, but I haven't started that particular task yet. Could take months. There's a light switch by the door. One more thing, Melody went on. Would you mind if I took your navigator to visit the parish county seat? It's yours. Do whatever you need to. The keys are on the front entrance table. Melody gazed at him her eyes grazing his face, the confident stance and eager smile, and those powerfully amazing shoulders. 
which she tried not to linger on in case she melted into a puddle of hormonal goo on the antique carpets. You're pretty remarkable, Brent Mandeville, she told him. Ditto yourself, Melody. He took a step closer, then stopped. By the way, I loved your bookstore. I wanted to spend an hour perusing your history section, but I had to refrain in case the floor caved in on us. A bubble of laughter came up her throat. <laughs> You're pretty humorous too, mister. You have gorgeous eyes, he said, changing the subject in that lovely deep voice of his. She tried to maintain her composure. Okay, knock it off. I'll see you in a while. Thanks for your help today. And for your car. And for a dry roof over my head. Britt merely smiled that beautiful smile of his with those sparkling white teeth and kissable lips and took one slow step back toward his office. Melody sagged against the wall. The vibes between them were getting stronger, and the unspoken attraction was scintillating and powerful, despite their efforts to keep their conversation solely on the topic of her damaged property in the city. Shaking her head to clear her mind, she moved down the foyer to snap up her handbag and the keys on the foyer table. You're driving to the parish offices right now, Britt said, pausing on the way to his office. They'll be closing in thirty minutes. Melody halted mid-step. Right. I should have thought of that. Took all day to do New Orleans. Guess that shows how anxious I am to research. You must be exhausted, too, Britt said sympathetically. Not just the long drive back and forth, but the emotional toll of seeing your home and business practically reduced to rubble. She gave him a feeble smile, fatigue hitting her as if with a sledgehammer. I'm trying not to think about it. Maybe you should just go take a nap before dinner instead of trying to search through the attic. Melody chewed on her lips, thinking of Mary at the hospital still muttering about White Castle. I feel strangely anxious. Maybe poking around the attic for a bit will help my restlessness, since I can't do anything else today. Go have fun. I trust you not to take off with the family silver. Ha! Huh. What's for dinner? Pork chops in a frying pan with steamed veggies. Sounds perfect. Got any applesauce and cornbread? Melody asked with a grin. I think I can rustle that up. Go enjoy the house. He waved her off, and seconds later, she could hear him at his computer keyboard again. Turning around... Melody started at the beginning of the downstairs rooms. She hadn't really explored them all that thoroughly, and now that she was searching for more pictures or old family ties, she had a specific mission. The sitting rooms were mostly filled with polished old furniture, Victorian knickknacks and cut glass lamps, shelves and shelves of old books in the library, including ledgers from its sugarcane plantation days, and tomes about Louisiana's early history. A handsome but out-of-tune pianoforte stood in the bay window of the music room. Melody touched the keys, remembering a few tunes from her piano lesson days with Granny Mary. When she plucked at the ivory keys, the computer clacking paused as if Britt were listening to her playing. Moon River. For a prank, she played chopsticks, and Britt's booming laughter filled the grand hall. He called out from the end of the hallway. It's probably safe to say that the piano forte has never heard chopsticks in the last 175 years. You have a maestro in the house, and you didn't even know it. You have additional talents in many other areas, Brett shot back. Okay, shh, no talking. I'm trying to focus. That just made him laugh louder, as Melody strode to the ballroom to gaze at the picture of her grandparents. Sitting under one of the 12-foot windows, the gauzy damask draperies flowed around her like a wedding veil. She put her elbows on her knees and held the picture in her palms, astonished once again at its presence in such an unexpected location. Perhaps her grandparents had visited White Castle long ago and had their photo taken by a visiting photographer, and some unknown person decided to keep it here because it gave the mansion ambience. But that decision didn't settle right. It just seemed odd. 
and if the purpose of the mansion was to remain firmly in the antebellum era of the 1850s and 1860s, why have a few stray photos of visitors in the first decades of the 20th century? A flash of lightning went off in Melody's head. White Castle wasn't even open for tours at the time period of the photograph. Mary must have been a personal acquaintance of the White Castle owners and visited the mansion as a friend. She had to get to the parish record offices and figure the history of this house out once and for all. Tomorrow couldn't come soon enough. Meanwhile, Melody was itching to do some fresh exploring. She ran up the stairs on stockinged feet and past the various guest rooms, slipping into each one to pursue any of the smaller photographs, sitting in frames on tables or fireplace mantles. But there weren't many, and none of anyone she recognized. At the end of the hall, just like Britt had told her, there was a single door next to the windows overlooking the side yard and the Mississippi levee. She turned the handle, and the door squeaked on its hinges. A light switch was on the wall, and she flipped it, flooding the stairwell and revealing a set of narrow wooden steps that ascended steeply toward the roof's low ceiling. At the top of the stairs, Melody turned in a circle, astonished at the sight. The place was packed with boxes and trunks and various miscellaneous items, as if the place was a movie set with dressmaker dummies an old rocking horse, old chairs, a lumpy sofa, stripped bed frames, and a stack of mattresses shoved up against the far wall. Moving slowly, Melody walked the length of the attic, stopping to inspect a trundle bed, and then running her hand along the straps of a trunk. She opened the lid, and the musty scent of mothballs rose up from its depths. Wow, that's potent, she said, waving her hands to disperse the strong scent of more than a century earlier and so much saved here. Why didn't they get rid of some of it? In the past years, cleaning out houses of outgrown or worn-out furniture and belongings was probably more difficult before refuse centers and landfills were created. Wealthy plantation owners kept everything, as if knowing they needed to document their lives, as if looking into the future to generations that would be curious about what life was like 200 years ago just as she was. Shafts of light from the dormer window spilled across the length of dusty floors. Thankfully, Melody could stand erect, but the ceiling was low, and she found herself ducking occasionally, afraid she'd bash the top of her head. Opening up two trunks that sat side by side, she dug through the stacked and folded women's clothing, long dresses with bustles from the 1870s, a wooden hoop for wearing under the wide skirts and dresses, now broken and folded over onto itself. At the bottom lay dresses from the Edwardian era, with lace filigree and pretty necklines, boxes of beads and baubles, necklaces and earrings, such delicate finery, nightgowns, chemises, stockings, buttoned shoes, fans and feathers and boas and hats. Out of nowhere, a wave of dizziness suddenly assaulted Melody, images flickering past her eyes like a dazzling kaleidoscope of color and movement. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. She stood in the middle of a large room, packed with adults, dressed up in fancy evening wear. Everybody was talking at once, and the sound hurt her ears. She clapped her hands over her ears to block it out. But most of it got past her fingers and she looked out from under her bags to complain to Granny about the loud grown-ups and raucous laughter. Looking down at herself, Melody saw that she was wearing a pinafore dress and glossy black Mary Jane shoes that pinched her toes. Music was playing somewhere, and couples were dancing across the humongous hallway. Moving closer, she wound her way through the press of people, and Melody came to see that it wasn't a corridor at all. It was the great hall of White Castle. Why was she suddenly at a party at White Castle? And why was she a child again? It was hot, and Melody began to sway dizzily before plopping straight down to her bum on the foyer carpet. Where was her grandmother? She had to find her. But Mary was kind of like her mama now, since Mommy and Daddy had died in a car crash on the way home from a party. 
Melody had stayed up too late waiting for them. Was it this party? Is that why she felt so disoriented and her stomach hurt? Melody, someone called, jiggling at her arm. Melody, wake up. And then more sharply, Melody. The waves of the past memories crashed over her and then suddenly vanished. When Melody opened her eyes, she was lying on the dirty, cobwebby floor of the attic, and Britt Mandeville was staring down at her. Concern, or was it fear in his eyes? Can you hear me, Melody? He asked loudly. Say something. Of course I can hear you, she told him, clutching at his arm. But what am I doing on the floor? I think you fainted. Are you feeling all right? Perhaps it's been too long since we ate. I've never fainted in my life. I think I was having a dream, or a memory, or something. She sat up, and Britt grasped her arm firmly in his as she scooted into a sitting position. He dragged a chair over and helped her into it. Is this chair all right to sit in? She asked, teasing him. It's not two hundred years old and liable to break underneath me. It's a regular folding chair that was probably left up here sometime in the last ten years. He told her wryly. What happened? Did you hit your head or lose your balance? Melody shrugged. Not sure at all. Although her head didn't hurt. I saw... Melody looked up into Britt's face. I think I saw... The past, but I was myself when I was a little girl, which means it was actually a memory. Britt folded his hands around hers. Where were you? What did you see? I was here, she said simply. Frown lines creased his forehead. Here in the attic? No, silly. I, oh my gosh, I was here at White Castle, and I was looking for my grandmother. It's all coming to me now, but I've never been to White Castle before. I'd never heard of it before Mary urged me to come. What was happening in your flashback? A gathering or a party? A soiree or something? Melody's voice trailed away as she tried to hang on to the memory. It was hot and full of people and I was looking for my grandmother. No, my parents. Now I can't remember for sure. Goodness, Britt, am I losing my mind? Not at all. Maybe you fell asleep and were dreaming. It was more real than a dream. The details, so specific and in full color. Why wouldn't I be my own age now, an adult? Lifting her chin, a sudden certainty washed over her. No, I was a child. I'm not even sure how old, but young. And I was at the mansion. I have been here before. Maybe it was seeing all these old party dresses in the trunks that brought it all back. Sounds like a possibility. Britt leaned back on his palms, his fingers making prints in the thick dust. Could this explain why your grandmother wanted you to come, perhaps? But what does White Castle have to do with anything now? Gosh, that childhood memory is over 25 years ago. I was probably not more than three or four. Perhaps Mary was confused and a little mixed up from the high fever. Old memories of attending a party or a wedding surfaced in her mind. A time that was happy and safe. So she sent you here to be safe and happy in a mixed up sort of way. Maybe, but she was so urgent about it, like a deathbed promise. She's been very ill, Britt added, squeezing her cold hand in his. So, do you feel safe here at White Castle and happy? Was he teasing her now? Or was there more to his question, their eyes locked in a meaningful gaze, as if he discerned her heart and the sorrows of her life? Melody tried to shake off the urge to melt into his arms and let him explain everything away as coincidence, but she held back. Staring down at her lap, she saw that their fingers were locked together. When had that happened? A sizzling lightning raced like a whirlwind through her entire being. 
far beyond anything she had ever experienced before. Her heart and mind and soul were completely overwhelmed by Britt Mandeville. But touching him wasn't right. Not while her sister assumed Britt was her fiancé and she wore his ring. Slowly, she slipped her hand from his and clasped her fingers together in her lap. Britt stared down at their broken bond. I understand what you're trying to tell me, but I'm still not thrilled about it. Her shoulders lifted. It's the way it has to be for now. I'll respect that for now, but a man can fight back in other ways. Oh, really? She teased, lifting an eyebrow. It's really adorable when you do that. So I've been told. Let me help you downstairs, he said, jumping to his feet. Dinner is probably burning. She made a face. Yikes, sorry. But I'm glad you found me up here. For a moment, I thought I was losing my mind. I know that Mary was here many decades ago with my grandfather because I have their picture. But now I also know that I have been here too, as much as that blows my mind. Melody dusted off the back of her jeans. Her eyes narrowed as she squinted across the darkened room. What's that over there? Britt followed her gaze to the far corner of the attic. Behind an old rocking chair stood a wooden table, scarred with scratches and dirt. But on top of the table stood a dollhouse, with cupolas and dormer windows and an imposing entrance with a big veranda porch. It was a beautiful plantation mansion, painted a pearl white with massive Greek revival columns running the breadth of the house. It's White Castle, Melody breathed, a prickling sensation running down her spine. It's a dollhouse replica of White Castle. Look at the miniature rocking chairs on the porch and the black wrought iron handrails. Peering around the back of the table, she peeked into the open back of the house where an exact replica of the grand foyer lay, complete with carpet and paintings on the wall. There's the library, Britt said, touching a finger against the desk and along the library shelves with paper mache books. You can even read the titles. With a magnifying glass, he added, grinning. Um, yeah, maybe I need glasses, but I can definitely see that the spines have real letters and words, not just a scribble. Oh, look at the music room. A carved piano forte with the tiniest pretty ivory keys. All the upstairs bedrooms are accounted for, too, with real glass windows. Those logs in the fireplace are pretty awesome. The staircase running up through the house is incredible. Such detailed replicas of the actual house. Melody rocked back on her heels, stunned. Whoever received this dollhouse as a gift was a lucky girl. It should be on display in the front parlor or the second-story playroom for tour visitors to enjoy. I'm adding this project to my growing White Castle to-do list. Before we move it anywhere, I need to examine it more closely. Plus, it's pretty dirty. It needs paint and a few repairs. Melody pressed a hand against her lips. It's a work of art. Carved and crafted by someone with loving, talented hands. She stopped talking and rolled her eyes at her own words. Here I am worried about an old dollhouse when I have no place to live and no means of income. It's going to take a year to reconstruct the bookstore. I need to spend my time figuring that out, even though the dollhouse would be much more fun to play with, she added laughing at herself. Meanwhile, I'm stuck spending my time getting bids and assessments done. Britt's eyes caught hers. This is a great project to distract you, and me too. I'm not supposed to be distracted by you, she said softly. But you distract me every day, every moment, every glance, every laugh. You shouldn't talk like this. Then just take me out back and put me out of my misery. 
You're in misery, Melody teased, quirking her lips. Britt cupped his hand around her head, playing with the strands of her hair as his gaze raked over her face and drank in her eyes. Hey, it's a good kind of misery, because being near you is all I want. Until I can convince you to give me a chance. You may be waiting until hell freezes over, sir. I'll take my chances. My, you are a patient man, then. Their faces had moved closer as they talked, and Melody found herself breathing Brit in, his masculine aftershave, the warmth of his body, and the deep timber of his voice. She reveled in the touch of his hand on her neck. It would be so easy to give in, to lose herself in him, to spend hours kissing him. Britt's eyes glanced down at her mouth, and Melody shivered with delight and anticipation, wanting to feel his lips on hers again. It had only been since this morning when he'd kissed her in the Ferrari. Hours and hours too long. As if reading her mind, Britt said, Almost a whole day without a taste of heaven. Melody tried not to giggle. You are so very bad. He broke into a wide grin, enjoying her insult. I thought the word was incorrigible. Maximum incorrigible, sir. Then, this will have to do, he said, taking her hand in his, bending over. Britt kissed the back of her fingers. My lady, may I have the pleasure of your company at dinner tonight? Melody glanced down at her clothes. After the lady changes out of her dusty attire, I will await you in the dining room then. Chapter 20 After breakfast the next morning, Melody headed across the gardens to the garage. Britt offered to accompany her, but she insisted that she had to go do this on her own. She hadn't actually told him what she was doing, only that she wanted to find out why her grandmother had come here as a young woman and then again to bring Melody as a child. Mary had known the owners, or was friends with someone who knew the owners of White Castle. Most peculiar of all was the fact that before last week, her grandmother had never mentioned this house. You're being very secretive, Britt had said at breakfast. Where exactly are you going? Only ten miles up the road, she said simply. Her old memories were a jumble of shadowy images, all laced with Mary's urgent request. It's probably nothing at all. Just my grandmother's fevered brain at 86 years old, remembering an old party of no consequence. Britt gave her a quick hug and admonished her to be careful in case there were downed trees along the way. Once inside the Lincoln Navigator, Melody breathed in the new car smell with longing. She was still driving a 15-year-old rusted Honda, if it hadn't been damaged during the storm. Using her phone app, she drove down the Lane of Oaks and then jumped onto Highway 1 into Plaquemine where the Iberville Parish records were kept. The parish courthouse records building was small, but the clerks were helpful when Melody told them she wanted to look up the records of the White Castle Plantation. What sort of records are you wanting, miss? The middle-aged woman with bleached blonde hair asked from her desk on the other side of the counter. Guess I'd like to know who owned the mansion over the years, ma'am. All the various owners, please, she quickly added, not wanting to appear demanding. That's a tall order. It'll take me a while to pull them up, but it was John Randolph who came to Louisiana from Mississippi in the 1840s to plant cotton. Then he turned to sugar cane and built a sugar mill. After his success, he bought the property in 1855 and had the castle built, moved into the house in 1859 with his family. You should just go take a tour, she added with a smile. Tours are closed until next week and it's sort of a family question that I'm searching about. She raised her eyebrows. Ah, I see. Do you know that there's a cemetery on the property? A cemetery at White Castle? Yes. It has several family burial plots. Anybody buried there after the 19th century? Hmm, I'm not sure. I'm afraid you'll just have to go looking, dear. If you don't mind pulling up the list of owners, I'd sure appreciate that. 
Maybe I'll search for some birth and marriage records, if you have a computer. Melody felt at a loss as to what to ask or where to find the correct documents. Where would I find those? Next building over. Should be able to borrow their computers and search yourself. Thanks. I'll try that, and I'll be back in an hour or so. Melody went out into the late morning sunshine and managed to settle at a computer for the next two hours with the help of the clerk, who was reluctant to help at first. We usually get requests by mail and send them out for a fee. Can I get records for anybody in the entire state, or do you just have Plaquem and Parish? I'm sorry, I've never done this before. Do you mind if I use your computer? I hate to take your time, but it's sort of urgent, and I don't live in the area. My home was hit by the hurricane. Oh no, honey, I'm sorry. Guess you're from New Orleans. Melody nodded, hoping to play on her sympathy a little. My bookstore got ruined, too. You own a bookstore? Well, how about that? How devastating. You with family up here? Not exactly, but I'm finding evidence that my family has connections up here. Hate to tell you this, sweetie, but we only have Plaquem and Parish records. State records are at the Capitol in Baton Rouge, but Baton Rouge is only an hour from here, although you may have to order those by phone or email. We can accommodate a few walk-ins in the smaller parishes. Melody's heart deflated. Genealogy work can be mighty interesting. Just be careful of potential skeletons hidden in the closet, the clerk added with a grin. Forewarned is forearmed, Melody said, smiling back. The clerk set her up at the computer and logged her in for $10 an hour. Taking a deep breath, Melody punched in the code on the keyboard and searched for the correct tabs, headings, and links at the top of the homepage. Birth records first. Where was Granny Mary born, and where had she married? Seemed like she should have known all of this already. She had always assumed New Orleans, or maybe the outskirts like Metairie or Slidell. Scrolling through names and decades, and spending a bit of time racking her brain trying to recall Mary's maiden name, Melody finally honed in on the dozens of pages of female Blanchards from the 1930s. Fingers crossed. Could she find her Mary and not somebody else entirely? Despair settled in her gut when she thought about having to trick the state courthouses or send a request by mail. That could take months, and she wanted answers now. Ideas flickered through her mind. Did her grandmother have a box of personal records back at her flooded house? She'd never seen anything like that before. But they could exist. Baptismal records, pictures, if they hadn't been buried by water a few days ago. It occurred to her that her grandmother rarely spoke of the relatives of her own childhood. That seemed odd now that she thought of it. Oh, there were general comments about old-fashioned technology, movies or fashion styles, stories of listening to the radio as a child, that sort of thing but not about aunts and uncles and cousins. Melody had always assumed they were gone since Granny Mary was so elderly now herself. Melody's uncles and cousins on her mother's side mostly lived around Baton Rouge or New Orleans. When her parents died and Mary and Peppa had taken in the three sisters to raise them, the history of the past was firmly in the past. Her grandparents were already well into their fifties by then. Life revolved around Melody and Avery and Crystal. Getting them raised, schoolwork, church events, sports, piano lessons, and then college. Melody kept scrolling through the pages, her eyes going wonky after a while. All of a sudden, she stopped. There. A Morella Blanchard, born in... Melody squinted at the old handwriting on the document. Born in 1932. That had to be her Mary. The birth certificate included parents' names, of course but Melody didn't know if they actually were her great-grandparents, since she wasn't familiar with their names. Place of birth was... Melody stared hard, then rubbed her eyes. Had she read that correctly? The place of birth of Marella Blanchard in 1932 was White Castle. That was a peculiar coincidence. How many Marella Blanchards were there, in all reality? A prickly sensation ran up her neck and climbed across her scalp. If Mary had been born at White Castle, 
Wouldn't she have said something? Anything, these past thirty years? A light touch came to her shoulder. We're breaking for lunch, miss. But you can come back in an hour. Melody blinked as if she were coming out of a trance. Of course. Thank you. Is the property records office closed now, too? Yes, but there's a cafe up the road you can grab a bite to eat. Melody rose from the table, her eyes blurry from the strain of the computer screen. Checking her phone, she saw that she had been sitting there for nearly two hours. Her stomach rumbled, so she found the cafe and ate lunch. Returning quickly to pace the sidewalk of the first records office, waiting for it to open again. A text had come through from Britt. Having any luck? The house is quiet without you. The Mississippi misses you, and so do I. Melody wrote back. Thought you were working in the yard, or are you playing hooky and watching Netflix movies instead? Britt. Ha, calling a tree trunk removal company right now. Lost one of the cypress about a quarter mile from the mansion. Melody, that's too bad. Be careful. I'll be back in a couple of hours, I think. Brit, are you memorizing all the birth certificates of the entire past hundred years? Melody, very funny, Mr. Mandeville. The door of the office opened at last and Melody leaped forward and slipped through, approaching the desk again. Find anything for me? I did the parish clerk said. Here's a folder you can look through. There's a chair and a table in the corner you can use. But please don't remove the documents from the premises. Melody sat down in the far corner and opened the folder. Old property papers and ancient cursive gazed up at her. Dates, names, numbers, deeds of trust, deeds of sale. All of them about White Castle Plantation. She shivered when she looked at the top document, the spidery writing giving her chills. The past was literally staring up at her. Hands from nearly 200 years ago held this, filled it out, signed and dated. Parts of it were in French, the common language of the 19th century. Thank goodness Melody had learned some French while growing up, and then taken more while at college. The stack of deeds was in numerical order by date. John Randolph was the original owner purchasing the property from the state of Louisiana, Plaquemine Parish. Eventually, Mr. Randolph died in 1883, leaving it to his wife, Emily. She sold it to a partnership of two people from New Orleans who bought the plantation in 1886. In 1899, it sold again to another partnership for $100,000. Then, in 1920, it sold to a man by the name of Charles Blanchard, who owned it and lived at White Castle with his family until 1950, when his sugarcane crops failed for the third year in a row due to drought. Charles Blanchard. Was this Mary's father? Was Morella Blanchard, who was born in 1932, her grandmother? The dates matched. In 1950, she would have been 18 years old. Granny Mary would have watched her parents' financial struggles and endured the humiliation of losing their farm and the anguish of having to move away from their beloved home. It was bought by a Dr. White Owen for only $54,000. The Blanchards, her very own great-grandparents, had taken a big loss in more ways than one. Emotion burned at the back of Melody's eyes. What had happened to Mary's parents after that? Where had they gone? And how had they survived? All of a sudden, she was brimming with questions about her ancestors. Where had they moved to? What had they done for a living in those years after World War II? How had Mary met Papa, her grandfather? Where had they married? She had known him just before they moved, though, because a black and white photograph had been taken of them right there inside the mansion and left behind. What else of the Blanchard family had been left behind? Mary's parents had owned the place for nearly 30 years. Melody vowed she would open every single box and crate and trunk in the attic. Her family's history was there. Her roots were here. This is where they had lived and loved and lost. This was the reason that Granny Mary insisted Melody go to White Castle. She was ill. She feared she might be dying and she could only think about home. A home she obviously had dearly loved and had mourned for the rest of her life. 
A tear slipped down Melody's nose. She wiped it away surreptitiously, hoping the woman at the desk couldn't see her weeping. Grabbing a tissue out of her purse, she wiped at her eyes and took a deep breath. She could hardly comprehend this sudden information about her family. Mary had hidden away her heartache, just like she had steeled her back and hid the pain of losing her son and his wife more than 25 years ago in a horrible car crash. Melody barely remembered them, but Mary did speak of her parents frequently, telling stories and pulling out the photo albums so that she and her sisters would know them. At least, Avery and Crystal actually did remember them. Melody was often envious of that. But Melody couldn't overlook the fact that, at some point, Mary had taken her to White Castle when she was about three to four years old. Some sort of party or public event that was held there decades after her family had lost the plantation. Goodness, Melody whispered aloud, sinking back into the straight back chair. It was all so unexpected and overwhelming. Gathering her own steel spine and nerves, she gazed down at the folder again, curious as to who owned White Castle now. How many more hands had White Castle gone through over the last 65 years? She was obsessed with knowing everything she could find out now, even though going through the contents of the house could take years, and she probably had to get permission from the local historical society to touch or document anything. The next owner was a man named Arlen Deese, who bought the property from Dr. Owen's daughter-in-law in 1980. He sold it a mere five years later to an Australian named Sir Paul Ramsey in 1985. Sir Paul Ramsey owned White Castle and refurbished it extensively until his sudden death of a heart attack on his yacht in Spain. Lord Ramsey owned it until last year, when a man named Britt Mandeville bought the White Castle estate for a cool $50 million. Chapter 21 Britt Mandeville The man who had proposed to her sister, given her a diamond ring worth $20,000, and owned a small fleet of luxury sports cars. The man who had called her an angel at midnight, had driven her down to the city to help her muck out her disaster of a bookstore, comforted her, bandaged her leg, rescued her from falling into the Mississippi, and then got as excited as a kid talking about how he would renovate the White Castle dollhouse in the attic. The same man who cooked up a storm in the kitchen and then let her drive his Ferrari, but not before kissing her with more passion and tenderness than any man ever had before. The man she was seriously falling in love with and was forbidden from being with. Her mind was reeling from it all. Emotion grew thick in her throat, pounded through her body, and sent waves of pain to the center of her chest. Now she had a headache, too, exploding spasms traveling down her neck all the way to her toes. When she slid into the driver's seat of the navigator again and shut the door, Melody gripped the steering wheel so hard her fingers turned white. She laid her forehead on the edge of the wheel and shook her head in disbelief. Britt owns White Castle. Britt Mandeville really is a billionaire. Now what do I say to him? She wasn't shocked. Well, yes, she was. And she knew the man could afford the place, but still. Britt had lied to her about being the landscaper, the gardener, the caretaker, the alternate chef, the regular guy who hauled logs and went to antique auctions. Needling at her conscience was the trust she had placed in him. If he'd lied to her about owning the mansion, what else had he lied about? How did he make his billions? Was he a con man, a Romeo, who was stealing her heart while she couldn't place true confidence in him? Her eyes were red and bloodshot, tears leaking the entire time she drove the ten miles back to White Castle. She didn't want to see him or speak to him. She wanted to run upstairs to her room and have a good cry. Melody also wanted to confront him, demand answers, tell him he wasn't going to get away with the lies and deception. Not with Melody de Leon. She'd pack up and leave, get her bookstore and apartment cleaned and repaired by herself. Insurance money and a loan 
a couple of good contractors, and she'd be back in business. Meanwhile, she'd live with Granny Mary, although Mary didn't have a house to go back to either. That made another residence that needed major work. She and her grandmother would be homeless for the next several months. Well, blast it all, she sputtered, stomping on the gas pedal and zooming down the long drive up to the parking lot of the house. She stared at the sign. White Castle Historic Tours on the Hour. Tickets at the gift shop. Sliding out of the navigator, she gazed up at the magnificent Greek Revival Manor House. How very spectacular it was, and she loved it so much. It already seemed like home. A melancholy sense of loss came over her. She might have grown up here, might have married in the elegant white ballroom. Well, at least Avery would have married, she said, reflecting on her husbandless and boyfriendless state once again. Oh, Granny Mary, I desperately need to talk to you. A deep male voice spoke behind her. Sounds like you're talking to yourself. Melody whirled around. Britt stood there, a smile on his lips to welcome her back home. Don't be so amused, Mr. Mandeville, she shot back, striding past on the gravel parking lot. Those stupid tears were pricking at her eyelids making them swim in water and her nose sniffle. Before he could respond, she marched across the lawns, the same darn color of his eyes, and ignored his calls for her to stop. Holding her head high, she didn't have any sort of plan. Disturbing news that came out of the blue always caught her off guard. If she confronted Britt, she'd probably burst into tears and embarrass herself. His footsteps crunched along the gravel as he ran after her. Melody, what's going on? Is your grandmother okay? Have you had bad news? Goodness, the man wouldn't stop. And why did he think of her grandmother as the very first thing out of his mouth? Why was he so darn considerate and such a problem solver with smiles on steroids? Suddenly she was at the Mississippi climbing up the massive berm and parading down the bank, arms swinging. The sound of water soothed her and calmed her pounding heart. Melody, you're scaring me, Britt said, his voice behind her shoulder. Tell me what happened while you were gone. His arm caught hers, turning her around to face him. She bit at her lips, willing herself not to heave blubbering words out of her mouth. You look like you've had a bad shock. Let me help you. You can't help me, Britt. I shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be living under the same roof. Frown lines appeared between his green eyes. But you're in the upstairs guest room, and I'm two floors below you, in the old servants' quarters. As if on cue, her cell phone buzzed. A text from Crystal. Could her day get any worse? Without responding to Britt, she brought the text message up, eyes scanning the annoying words. Crystal. Are you still at White Castle with my fiancé? If so, I want you gone today. Go back home. Melody growled, fingers punching at the letters. I have no home to go back to. But don't worry. I was already packing. I'll go pay for a hotel I can't afford. Crystal. Use a cot at the hospital in Mary's room. Melody. I'm overwhelmed at your compassion. Crystal. Are you being sarcastic? You know I hate it when you get snippy. Melody, when I get snippy. Excuse me, while I'm currently homeless, and you want to tell me how to feel and act. When she was finished typing, she threw the phone on the grass. Britt chuckled, lifting his eyebrows. A text bite? Oh, be quiet. You have no room to talk. He laughed out loud, then immediately sobered. Melody, I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at you, but you do say funny things. He stepped forward, and she took two steps backward. You're blocking my path along the river, she told him, arms folded over her chest. You're out for a stroll along the Mississippi? Right now? Isn't that obvious? Not in the mood you're in. I won't leave your side. You and the Mississippi kind of scare me. Hey, he said more softly. 
I can see that you're really upset. I know you're not going to throw yourself into the river. I'm teasing. I want to help you. I want to... to... He broke off and gazed off into the thicket of trees at the edge of the property. What did Crystal say that got you so angry? See for yourself, Melody said, indicating the phone on the ground. Gingerly, he picked up the device. Is it going to explode? She rolled her eyes. Seriously? I'm teasing, Melody. Britt read the message thread and rubbed a hand along the stubble of his jaw, his eyes narrowing. Wow. Crystal is really controlling. She enjoys bossing me around. It's obvious that she's envious I'm here with you. There's no reason she should be jealous. None. Britt raked his hands through his hair, frustration deepening in his expression. Crystal and I broke up. Completely. Permanently. She knows it. She's just playing games. Besides, she's in New York. And she doesn't want to be here. You and I are grown-ups, and we know that there's nothing going on between us. There isn't? Britt cocked his head, hope welling in his eyes. You mean there is? I think I need an explanation. Actually, I'd love an explanation. You've been gone for hours and hours. I missed you. You missed lunch, too. I've been worried. Melody swallowed hard, glancing away from him toward the river. It was probably silly to not get the anger and betrayal out in the open. There was no reason to play games. They weren't teenagers. Her initial shock was wearing off, too. Time to pack up and leave. It was over with Britt before it had even really begun. He reached out for her hand, but she stepped away while his eyes became hurt and confused. I'm truly mystified. I'll do anything I can to fix this. I'm not sure it can be fixed, Britt, Melody said, an edge to her voice. You learned something while you were gone. Please talk to me, Melody. I won't leave until you do. I went to find my family records. Turns out, my grandmother was born right here at White Castle. Britt's eyes widened, and he let out a low whistle. Wow. That's fascinating and wonderful too, right? Her father bought the property in 1920 and lost it when Mary was 18 years old in 1950. Why didn't she ever tell me that? Melody spun about and began striding again, closing her eyes while a cool breeze blew the heat from her face. She must have her reasons, Britt said from behind her, his voice gentle. It explains the photograph in the ballroom. It also sort of, explains why she might have brought me here when I was very young. Wow, this is pretty wild. I think White Castle has changed hands a lot over the past two centuries, right? A sharp intake of breath nearly doubled Melody over. She jerked her chin at him. You should know those facts better than anyone, Britt. I spent quite a bit of time reading over the property deeds at the courthouse. All the owners... Every single one of them. He pressed his lips together and shook his head sadly, his face crumpling with regret. I'm so sorry, Melody. Why, Brent? Why didn't you just tell me? You are the owner of White Castle. You are! Chapter 22 He shoved his hands into the front pockets of his jeans. It's true. I feel terrible that you found out this way. I saw the papers myself, so there's no denying it. I won't deny it. Actually, I want you to know the truth. There was just never a good time to tell you. But you pretended to be the caretaker, the gardener, just a regular guy. I feel like everyone around me is lying to me about something. Melody's voice rose higher, and she worried that she sounded hysterical. Gritting her teeth, she slowed down and clenched her fists. If you want to know the truth... I'd much rather be known as just the caretaker, Britt said softly. Don't patronize me, she cut him off, scrambling down the steep levee. Would he follow her? She was determined not to look back over her shoulder. Instead, she followed the berm of the earth in a direction she had never taken before. 
and that's when she spied the cemetery sitting underneath a ring of cypress dripping with Spanish moss that wavered in the gentle autumn breeze. Britt stood discreetly outside the cemetery gates while Melody wandered the family plots where mounds of tall headstones stood solemnly deep in the earth, strained by lichen and moss. She stopped before the massive stone marker for John Randolph, the original builder of the house, and his wife, Emily. The marriage had produced something like eleven children. John fled Louisiana for Texas during the Civil War, taking his slaves with him to keep them safe and then freeing them. All alone, Emily and her children held the household together when White Castle was taken over by Union soldiers for the duration of the war, suffering deprivation and terror. A few children were buried here, and there were also a few unmarked plots or headstones where the lettering had worn away completely. In a far corner was the newest headstone, cleaner and deeply engraved, and Melody hurried toward it. She stopped in shock, trembling, when she saw the words, Abel Walter de Leon, beloved husband and father, may heaven be as sweet as our lives were with you, born 1925, died 1995. Oh! Melody let out a cry of anguish, sinking to her knees on the patchy grass. Abel de Leon was her own papa, Mary's husband, the grandparents who had taken her into their home and hearts. She had only been seven years old when he passed away, and Mary became her only parent. Melody's memories were spotty, but Papa used to take her crawfishing, played card games with her, read books together, and took her out for special birthday dinners. She knew he'd loved her dearly. Good grief. Mary had a hard life, she choked out, the lump in her throat growing so big she could hardly speak. A warm hand touched her arm and she started, lifting her eyes. Britt knelt beside her, concern and worry in his eyes. Melody, sweetheart, I'm so sorry you're so distraught, he said. Who is this? Why are you crying? He's my grandfather, my papa. My own grandfather is buried at White Castle. It seems impossible, and yet, here he is. She stopped, unable to speak. His headstone confirmed everything she had learned, but she thought Papa had been buried in one of the neighborhood cemeteries in New Orleans. How had he gotten here? Britt clasped Melody's hands, holding them tight in his. There was no denying that his strength and solidness was comforting. She rocked back on her heels. Her grandfather was buried here so many decades after the family lost the plantation. Why would he be here? I have so many questions for my grandmother, I think I need to make a list. I have a notebook and pencil back at the house, Britt said, working his lips up into a smile. She laughed in spite of herself. Don't do that, she warned him. Do what? Make me laugh while I'm crying my eyes out. And while I'm very mad at you, you have every right to be angry. But I plan to tell you everything. I just needed you to get past letting Crystal run your life and our relationship. What kind of a woman gets involved with her sister's fiancé? Melody wagged a finger at him. And don't tell me that it's okay because she's no longer your fiancé. She would hate me. She would always say I broke you two up. We'll keep it a secret then. She gave him a look with an arch of her eyebrows. Okay, bad choice of words. You think? I guess you're good at keeping secrets. Or should I say, lying. How can I ever trust you, Britt? You can trust me because I am a very trustworthy person. I will never divulge your secrets or confidences. I never gossip or speak badly of others. I give everyone a chance. I forgive. I forget. Are you an Eagle Scout, too? She said with a slow smirk. A deep laugh burst out of him. <laughs> How'd you guess? That still doesn't explain. You need to let me explain. And you need to understand who I am deep down. Why I did or did not do the things you accuse me of. But I want a chance with you, Melody. More than anything else I've ever wanted in my entire life. She folded her arms and sat cross-legged on the ground, straightening her back like a strict schoolmarm. Okay, I am the kind of person who gives others a chance to redeem themselves. 
I thought you were, he said, his eyes locking onto hers. I know it shocked you to learn that I have wealth. As in, you're a freaking billionaire? Those are Crystal's words, meant to impress you. And the fact that she told you doesn't speak well of her. It was not her business to tell you. I'll concede that, because it did make me uncomfortable. It's a personal part of someone's life. I also realized that was the reason she came back to claim you. Because you have money, and she wants a rich lifestyle. Double whammy by my own sister. I think you can still speak to her at Christmas, though, Britt said with a wink. Melody suppressed a smile, wanting to stay outraged. I've known my sister for almost 30 years. I don't let her get in the way of our relationship. He chuckled and reached out to squeeze her hands, but Melody slipped out of his grasp and placed her palms behind her on the grass. Melody, he started again, his voice soft and earnest. I never wanted to be a millionaire or a billionaire or whatever you want to call it. None of us did. We were just having fun, experimenting, using our brains and creativity to program cool stuff. What are you talking about? Melody's mind was spinning too fast to grab onto what he was saying. Dreams. Our little company that went global and rocked the financial charts. Right, right, Melody said quietly. You said the company was doing well, but this is astronomical, unthinkable wealth. I'm actually embarrassed by it. Britt glanced away, a hint of red creeping up his face. But what about those chart-rocking sports cars? He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. I hide them in the garages, and I only drive one at a time. If you tried driving two at a time, I'd accuse you of being a secret stuntman. Okay, were you really a history teacher? Scout's honor, he said, holding up three fingers in the scout oath. I'm crazy about southern history and caring for White Castle. It was easier to buy it than get hired on. That way, I could research it and refurbish the property as it's intended to be. My only nemesis is the local White Castle Historical Society. Melody gave him a sly look. I've heard that groups like those can be filled with bossy ogres. It doesn't help that I'm 30 or 40 years younger than most of the members who have to approve of any little change or repair that needs done. He spread his hands. I'd rather be known as the caretaker than the owner. It makes things easier all around. They take me more seriously, as a lover of history, rather than a rich dude who throws his money and opinions around. She nodded slowly. I guess I can understand that. You should see the paperwork and reports I have to fill out to just move a picture from one wall to another. Ultimately, White Castle is a tourist attraction, and most people never know or care who the owner is. Makes it easier to remain incognito, I guess. A small smile played on his mouth. I like to be incognito. Except when you're not. What does that mean, Miss de Leon? I fear you have some underhanded designs going on in that beautiful mind of yours. You'll figure it out, she said flippantly. It's going to take a while for the shock to wear off. That this used to be Mary's home. That she grew up here. I think it suits you perfectly. I don't know about that. But I have fallen in love with it. Everyone does. I'll give it back to you and your family. Melody let out a choked laugh. What? Now you're certifiably crazy. You can have White Castle, as long as I can stay on as caretaker. And I can always purchase more historical homes and fight with other historical society matrons. You're insane, Melody chided. Maybe I'm the perfect owner for White Castle right now, he said thoughtfully, his eyes piercing hers with significant meaning. Until its true owner can move in and make it her own again. Now that's a loaded statement. Honestly, buying this house and overseeing all of its care and maintenance means you're stuck in this little town. I would think you'd want houses all over the world to travel, to run your antique business, to just be free. Everyone needs a home base. And I've always wanted a place that can be turned into a home, 
a true home, with kids and horses and four-wheelers, the works. It's not often you meet a man who admits it out loud, or even truly wants all those domestic things. You lost your parents in a tragic accident, but I lost my parents in other ways. Spent my teen years in the foster care system. Melody was stunned by his casual admission. He'd suffered much more than she ever had. Oh, Britt, I'm so sorry. Hey, I turned out okay, and I don't dwell on it. I had good foster parents. I just had so many of them, and that always hurt. Better than being raised with a mother on drugs and a father in prison. Good friends in high school helped a great deal. They helped set me on a whole new path. Probably the only reason I went to college. But Melody, my biggest dream is to find an amazing woman who shares my dreams, who loves the same things I do, someone that appreciates a house like this and all of its good and sad history. A hot flush crept up Melody's face. Her entire body was scorched by the significant look on Britt's face. She forced her eyes away from his, then wrapped her arms around her knees and gazed at the sparkling mansion in all of its grandeur. I can't believe we're lounging about talking in a graveyard, she finally said. It's got a good ambience for talking about family history. I'm sorry you had such a shock today. But what an amazing story about your family history and roots. That's an understatement. Have you tried calling Mary today? She may be able to talk a little bit by now. I'm sure she really misses you. I called before I left for Plaquemine, but she was sleeping. I'll try again in a bit. I miss her too, Melody added softly. Hey, hey. Britt reached out to gather her up in his big warm arms. Thanks for your honesty. I think I understand why you're guarded about your own life story. I'm worried about a hundred things right now. We can't start anything. She ended up awkwardly rising to her feet. It's only been two weeks since you proposed to Crystal. I have to know that you're not some fickle guy. Don't fickle reputations belong to the women of the world? He teased. She brushed off her jeans and stuck a hand on her hip. Not this one. I'll do anything you want. Or nothing. We'll just be friends, okay? Want to shake on it? Nope. She took a step backward. I can't touch you anymore. I don't trust myself with you. I'll take that as a good sign. How about a cup of hot tea instead? Yes, and I want time. He frowned. What do you mean? We need time, you and me. I agree. I want you to trust me, Melody, completely. Meanwhile, I'll tell your sister to quit stalking you and telling you what you should do. Melody threw a saucy look over her shoulder. Believe me, I can give her a piece of my mind all on my own. Chapter 23 Over the next several weeks, Melody threw herself into the details of reconstructing both books on the Mississippi and her apartment. She met with insurance adjusters, flood experts, building inspectors, and construction companies to get prize bids. She stayed at White Castle during the duration, discussing each step with Britt in the evenings while they took turns cooking dinner. Breakfast and lunch were quick affairs, since every hour of the day was packed with a myriad of tasks and traveling back and forth to New Orleans. Britt was kind enough to lend her his navigator until she could purchase a car. Her Chevy Spark had disappeared in the flooding, swept away to somewhere. It showed up a month after the hurricane at a car auction, where someone had turned it in, hoping for quick cash. The car dealership checked the license plate and discovered its true owner. The damage was horrible, he told her in the thousands of dollars range, if not irreparable. After meeting the car insurance adjuster at the dealership, the vehicle was deemed a total loss, unless she wanted to keep it as an engine and body project for the fun of it. No thanks, she told the man with a sigh. She'd bought the car during her senior year in high school, saving her money while working as a waitress and volunteering at a small used bookshop in the French Quarter. Books being her true calling, but the store barely made ends meet and couldn't afford to pay her. 
The Chevy was a battered wreck from tumbling down flooded streets, banging into other cars, and being dented by branches and debris in the deep water. The interior was moldy, smelly, and disgusting. And somehow the entire back seat had been ripped to shreds, probably from the glass windows exploding. It was hard to tell. Just thinking about the work this car needs is overwhelming, Melody said while talking with the owner of the dealership. It's only good for the junkyard and maybe a few salvageable engine parts. They'll probably only give you 50 bucks. Sorry, miss, but I can take it off your hands and get it towed over there if you'll sign over the registration. I suspect you're taking pity and giving me a good deal. Towing will cost more than the potential parts will give you. He tipped his hat and gave her a friendly smile. We all just got through one of the worst hurricanes in the century. A few bucks ain't gonna hurt me, and I know you don't have the means to take care of it. I got a warehouse of tow trucks I bought after Katrina 15 years ago. Melody smiled at that, and they shook on it, splitting the insurance money as well, which gave her a few hundred bucks. At least she'd have gas and grocery money for a few months, while construction began on the rest of her life. She had also insisted on helping with the meals while staying at White Castle. She had to feel as independent as possible while her life was upended and in disrepair. Going grocery shopping took her mind off her troubles, too, and life was just a little bit more normal, especially when Britt accompanied her and they made a game out of who could get the most groceries for the least amount of money, each of them gripping 50 bucks in cash and racing through the store. And then it was a competition to see who could whip up the best dinners. It was usually a tie. Driving into New Orleans each day was always a shock no matter how often Melody went. The destruction of whole neighborhoods was staggering. Roofs collapsed in on themselves, retaining walls in piles of brick and mortar. Trucks going up and down the roads loaded down with debris to take to the landfills. Britt was with her when she got the final numbers on the bookstore. They met at a cafe with her insurance agent and the three bids he had brought from construction companies, and they sat around the table to discuss details of whether the bookstore was still habitable. At least Melody assumed they would discuss details, but it turned out there were no details to discuss. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, ma'am, her Allstate insurance rep said after their tea and coffee was served. I've gone over and over the cost of materials and labor including meeting with the city building department and their inspectors to crank out numbers, and it doesn't work. What does that mean? Melody asked. To bring the building back to code? Well, it can't. Plain and simple. He broke off, his eyes locking onto Melody's. The city has decided that the building, your bookstore, is to be condemned. Shaken to the core, Melody tried to hide the shock on her face. What do we do to rebuild and get it out of condemned status? You don't. You can't. I'm sorry, Miss De Leon. The building has to be torn down. You're lucky it didn't collapse on you all the times you've gone inside since the floodwaters receded. Goosebumps broke out on Melody's arms as she gripped the edge of the table. What does this mean long term? What do I do? The man glanced at the foreman of the construction companies who were sipping at their coffee and watching her. Normally, it would mean building from scratch, but that's going to be more per square foot than you'd qualify for at the bank. More than a million dollars to rebuild from foundation up. Part of the expense is that the soil needs work, footings, and raising the height of the building due to its poor location. Pressing a hand to her mouth, Melody glanced at Britt, whose face was sober. The bad news was worse than she ever expected. Of course it would cost that much. It was a piece of real estate, and she personally didn't own the land. She leased it from the city. Well, she said, her mind swirling with a hundred thoughts. Will the city reconstruct the building and then sell or lease it down the road? Eventually, one of the foremen said, tugging at the brim of his NFL Saints cap. But it's way down the list of priorities. It could take a year before they even begin, maybe two years. City offices, hotels, grocery stores, all the more vital businesses are in line ahead of you. Sorry to say, but they have deeper pockets and more need to get them running again. Construction companies are pouring in from all over Texas, Alabama, and Florida states. 
and even then business owners are going to be waiting a few months to get started. Melody turned to Britt, her hands shaking. She was so grateful he was here with her. My poor little bookstore. It's really gone. Her voice cracked, and the men at the table picked up their drinks and sipped at them, not looking at her. Thanks for your time, Britt said, rising from his chair. He picked up the food ticket and pocketed it. I'll take care of the bill. I'm sure you all are pretty busy these days. Britt left as the insurance rep shook hands with Melody. Sorry the news wasn't better. But it'll all work out, ma'am. It usually does. Good luck to you. Before I forget, the insurance check for your settlement claim on personal effects, as well as the bookstore stock and office equipment, will arrive in a few weeks. Melody sank back into her chair and picked up her cup, but the herbal tea had gone cold. When Britt returned from paying the bill, she lifted her eyes to him, tamping down the rising panic. Now what do I do? Britt shook his head. It's worse than expected. But all your questions are now answered, and you know what's at stake. No more uncertainty over cleanup or bids, or how long it will take to get the store up and running again. And finally, Britt added, you won't be in debt until you die either. Now there's a happy thought, Melody said, swatting at his arm. Debt until I die. Unfortunately, I already have piles of debt from the mortgage I took out three years ago. It was my pride and joy, Britt. My life. Connecting books with readers and fans. Books are like emotional food to them. To me. I know. Britt said gently. Melody tried not to drown in his gorgeous emerald eyes, attempting to focus on the task at hand. How do I pay off the loans I already have? I'll never be approved for another loan. I have no collateral, nothing of worth. You have an insurance check coming for all your personal belongings, and the shelves and the computers in the store are insured, which will help you pay off your business bank loan. There may... Also be federal grants through the National Flood Insurance. There's that, I guess. But I still feel this tremendous loss, like my best friend just died. Your best friend didn't just die. You're looking at him right now. Melody bit at her lips, gazing at this man she knew deep in her heart she was falling in love with, but didn't quite want to admit it. In fact, she couldn't think about that right now, and Mary was still in the hospital. She stopped in every day, but her grandmother had difficulty speaking. She was on oxygen and massive doses of antibiotics because the pneumonia had become a serious bronchial infection, perhaps worsened by the trauma of dragging her through the cold water while she had a fever. But Mary always opened her eyes and whispered a few words while Melody gripped her hand and kissed her cheek. She tried to entertain her grandmother by relating all the details of the last few weeks, about Crystal, about White Castle, which made her smile despite the teary eyes. You know the truth of our family, Mary said hoarsely, eyelids fluttering weakly, while Melody and Britt stopped to visit her after their meeting with the insurance rep. I know everything, darling Granny, but how could you bear to lose your home? We lived through the Great Depression. We would survive again. Then Granny Mary beckoned Melody to come closer. I always pined for White Castle, she went on, coughing between words. Always longed to go back. But it was out of outreach, me and your papa. Abel Walter de Leon, you mean? Melody said with a small smile. I saw his grave in the family cemetery. Granny, I had no idea he was buried there. My one true love, Mary whispered. I took you once, as a child. I hadn't remembered until recently. I don't understand. It was Abel's wake. The owner at the time gave me permission to bury him in the family graveyard. We always hoped to be buried there together. Your papa knew how much my old family home meant to me. How very kind of them, Melody said, her eyes watering. 
Holding her grandmother's hand to her lips, Melody prayed hard for healing and recovery. Please, she murmured. I can't bear to lose her. Britt was standing in the corner of the room, gazing at her tenderly when she finally rose from the chair. Let's go home, he suggested, kissing the top of her head. She pressed her face against his soft shirt, willing herself not to break into weeping. Britt's arms crept around her cautiously, and when Melody slipped her arms around his waist, he pulled her even tighter, resting his cheek against her hair. I'm here for you, Melody, he said. In any capacity you need me. You're not alone. I'm right by your side. How marvelous it was to feel his arms around her after so long. She missed his touch, his solid strength, the feel of his muscular arms holding her against his broad chest. Over the last several weeks, Melody had resisted any temptation to touch Britt. She had tried hard to keep her distance and not let her heart open up any more than it already had toward him. Remaining at White Castle and spending her free time with Britt had been wonderful, but it had tested her limits. She had been strong, but in this moment, having him hold her had given her the added strength she hadn't realized she needed. Yet, she couldn't stay in his arms. Finally, she tugged away, his hands slipping down her arms while her heart lodged in her throat. Your grandmother is a romantic, Britt said when he opened the door to the hospital corridor. Melody nodded. I think you're right. My one true love, Britt said, repeating Mary's words. Oh, you heard that, huh? I like it. I also love that you're back where your family first began. You're in the right place, Melody. You sure I can't convince you to let me give you White Castle's deed? That's crazy, Britt. As if you're going to hand over a multi-million dollar historical mansion to someone you've only known six weeks. And why not? He asked when he opened the door of the Lincoln for her to step inside. I confess that it's still a very strange feeling to know that I could buy ten of those mansions, including a few in Europe. Oh my gosh, stop! That's just insane. If not for the Great Depression, the war, and the drought, you would have grown up at White Castle. Married there. It weighs on my mind, you know. I feel like I stole it from its rightful owner. I'm a stranger. A man who has lived a hundred other places, a dozen other lives. She stared at him as he pressed the key fob to start the car's engine. I do believe you're serious, you crazy man. Deadly, he joked lightly. Melody leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. You truly are a dear. You know that. Hmm, I like that. Can I have some more? It's been an awful long time, sweet Melody. Have I told you lately that you are incorrigible? Almost every day. Britt pulled out of the hospital parking lot and maneuvered through the streets back to the highway to White Castle, the groceries rattling in their sacks in the back seat. Chapter 24 Brit, Melody ventured after they jumped onto the highway. Thank you for helping me through this upheaval. Meeting with builders and insurance adjusters and going over paperwork and letting me brainstorm with you. And for visiting Mary every time you come with me. I might be incorrigible, but you will always be my midnight angel. Melody flushed, fiddling with her seatbelt. Just drive, Mr. Mandeville. We have another brainstorming session tonight. I need to figure out how I'm going to resurrect my bookstore in a new location. Hold that thought, because I have an idea. After they pulled into the driveway and unloaded the groceries, Melody automatically began making dinner, pulling out vegetables to chop while he heated the grill for some fish steaks. She turned on the oven to warm the rolls they had purchased from the bakery in town. We make a good team, Britt said casually. Melody stared up at him from the oven door. She was going to make a sarcastic remark about how he loved to hint at a future between them, but then she just smiled and straightened. I think you're right. We don't even have to talk or ask questions. We're reading each other's minds now. Oh, now I really want to know what's going on in that mind of yours, he said, 
tugging at her hand to spin her closer, as though they were dancing to an unheard piece of music. Their noses touched while they gazed at each other for several long seconds. Melody held her breath. Their lips were so close, nearly touching. But he didn't kiss her or take advantage of the moment. Oh my, but Britt felt good. His hand in hers was perfect, and just thinking about him sent an explosion of fireworks through her. She had wondered if her feelings might dissipate while she'd kept her distance. But in an instant, it was back, full force. Full-on attraction swarmed through her for this incredibly handsome, kind, and generous man. Blinking, she tried to hide how rattled she was. I, wow, I have to get the paring knife out. Now, tell me again, which kitchen drawer it's in? The knife block is in the corner over there, he said amused. Same place it's been the last six weeks. Waves of intense attraction heated Melody through and through. If she wasn't careful, she'd be throwing herself at him and never looking back. If I'm not mistaken, he said softly, gently sliding his hands up to her shoulders while keeping his eyes locked on hers. I'd say I just took your breath away, Melody. You're imagining things, she said, becoming brisk and efficient. I'll set the table while you grill. I'll have to remember this for the future. When you don't want to talk about something, you change the subject. I do not. Yep, in spades. She glared at him and began getting out flatware and plates. You said you had an idea for me about my bookstore. Do you know of one for sale? Except I can't get a loan or a mortgage. I'm in hock up to my ears, even with the insurance. I need to get a regular job again. Maybe I can put my accounting degree to good use. Know anyone who needs their taxes or bookkeeping done? Britt laughed, tugging her into a kitchen chair. Quit changing the subject. Okay, I'll be a good girl and let you speak. She put a fist under her chin and smiled up at him. Wipe that smirk off your face, or I'll wipe it off for you. Ah, and how will you do that? I can think of several ways, he said, leaning in closer. Their flirting had risen to dangerous levels, and here she was egging him on. The heat of Brit's closeness was like the heat waves of a volcano. She wanted to climb into his lap and kiss him until they were both breathless. Before I forget, I also have a surprise for you, he said. She sat up taller. You mean, an idea and a surprise both, or the same thing? Two things. Two very good, very excellent things. Don't keep me in suspense. He turned his chair so they were facing each other, almost knee to knee. The first one is my most excellent idea, so brace yourself. Ready? I think you should open a bookstore right here, at White Castle. Melody was stunned. What do you mean here at White Castle? Have you seen the cottages on the other side of the gardens? They're used as guest houses when we have overflow, but we could renovate one of them into a little bookstore. A few bookcases, some shelving, a desk for the cash register. You'd be in business in no time. Show me, Melody demanded, jumping to her feet. Let me take the steaks off the grill first and cover them while they rest. My perfectly grilled medium rare is not to be outdone. She grinned at him, ready to burst out of her skin. My mouth's watering, just thinking about that first bite. But I can't eat now, so hurry. Two minutes later, Britt was unlocking the cottage closest to the road which would give it easy access for customers. This cottage is almost never rented. Guests want to be closer to the swimming pool and not near the driveway with all the house tour traffic. Spinning around on her heels, Melody's mind exploded with ideas. She could imagine the little bookstore perfectly. Without the beds and couches, there would be plenty of room for several sections of titles, at least a couple thousand volumes, and... It even has a restroom for customer use. A couple of weekends installing shelving and you'd be in business. Melody put a hand to her chest, breathless. 
Even the windows already have darling organza yellow curtains, the color of sunlight. Let's use one of the corners for a reading corner with comfy chairs and a lamp. Oh gosh, what shall I call it? That's the easy part. How about books on the Mississippi? Her breath caught when Melody realized how perfect the name was. We're only a two-minute walk from the river. I can say that my New Orleans bookstore has changed locations. We'll need to advertise, though, put up notices and advertisements in all the little towns along Highway 1 and Highway 10 going into Baton Rouge. Maybe a newspaper and radio ad. I'll need to find out what kind of books folks around here like to read. Maybe books about camping and gator hunting, fishing and hunting titles, history of the parish, setting up a camp on the bayou, and children's books, of course. I could work with the school district and find out what they need and do their ordering. Slow down, Britt said. Your mind is going a hundred miles an hour. She gulped in a breath of air, laughing in return and peeking out the windows before whirling around again. What sort of rent do you want me to pay? We can talk about rent later, okay? Discussing money is really boring. Melody placed a hand on her hip, giving him a smug look. Except when you don't have any, or you're dreaming about what money can buy. Touché. Now, let's go eat. I'm starving. You can start making your lists after dinner. They ate a leisurely dinner in the dining room while watching the sunset over the Mississippi through the wall of plate glass windows. The garden lights twinkled as they came on, and a barn owl hooted overhead, the dark shape skimming over the tops of the oak trees. After Melody drained her ice water, she leaned her elbows on the table and sat forward. I just remembered that you said you had another surprise. You're right, I did. Want to see it now? Of course! She jumped up and tugged at his arm. Dishes can wait. As far as I'm concerned, dishes can wait all night, Britt said with a wink, leading her upstairs to the main foyer. They were still holding hands when Britt guided Melody to the Victorian music room. Butterflies swooped through her stomach at Britt's touch. How could holding hands be such a swoon-worthy event? But it was, and she never wanted to let go. Over here, Britt said turning on the lamps. Logs in the fireplace had already been lit to take the chill off the room. Methinks you already planned this, Melody mused. How'd you guess? All at once, Melody let out a gasp, stopping in her tracks. Oh, 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 she cried. In front of the fireplace stood a mahogany table, and on top of the table a pink marble slab where the miniature White Castle dollhouse sat in all its glory. Melody sank to her knees in front of the dollhouse, reaching out to touch the Greek columns and the curving staircase that led to the front porch, where tiny rocking chairs sat. It's been sanded and painted, she said, and you fixed the broken walls and redid some of the furniture. I also found some similar wallpaper for the main rooms and took out the old peeling paper and replaced it. It looks perfect, as well as perfectly aligned with the original time period of the house. Melody touched the antique tables and couches, the beds and armoires and fixtures in the bathrooms. A clawfoot tub and tiny lamps glowed with actual working lights. You are a miracle worker, Britt. When did you do all this? We talked about redoing the dollhouse, but I'm in awe that you started and finished already. Oh, the roof still needs some repairs, but I couldn't resist showing off how it's coming along. And well, you spent a lot of time in New Orleans over the past month. The hardest part was when I had to go to Savannah for those estate auctions. It really put me behind. I thought today was a great day to show you after... The loss of your beloved bookstore. You are such a secret keeper. It feels like Christmas in October. I want to give you Christmas every day, Melody, Britt told her, lifting her hand to kiss the back of her fingers. What a gift, Melody said. I absolutely love it. Thank you. I have to show you the best part now, but don't cry. 
What? Kneeling down, Britt carefully lifted the dollhouse up on one end. Clicking on the flashlight, he handed the torch to Melody. I found the initials of the person who built the dollhouse. Actually, the initials of two different people. Now I'm even more puzzled. She tilted her head, shining the flashlight onto the flat wooden bottom of the house. The carved letters were A W D L, followed by the letters C R B. Melody stared at Britt, her voice choking. April William De Leon. My grandfather built this dollhouse, but for whom? My father was his son, and you don't give dollhouses to your son. Do you know who CRB is? You're the one who searched the records of the house. Oh, Melody said, when it all clicked into place. Those initials must stand for, it's Mary's father. Charles Roosevelt Blanchard. Her father and her husband built this for her. After they were married, is my guess. Probably just before the plantation was foreclosed. I wonder if it was a wedding gift, Melody said, tears springing to her eyes. A wedding gift of a piece of her childhood home to cherish. What a thoughtful and generous thing you've done for her. She is going to love seeing this when she gets out of the hospital. Now I told you not to cry, Britt teased, putting his arms around her. You knew I would, she said, melting against his chest while she hid her swimming eyes. I had a pretty strong suspicion. Now, let's go eat dessert. Later, when a glowing full moon rose above the oak trees, Melody pulled open the double glass doors to her balcony and stepped outside into the warm evening. She spent an hour examining every adorable, perfect knick-knack and furnishing in the dollhouse while Britt ate two pieces of cheesecake and gazed at her with his dazzling eyes. Her heart was so full tonight. The hospital had called and told her that Mary was turning a corner and could probably be home in a few days. Britt had already made arrangements for housekeeping to prepare a guest room for her, and Melody couldn't wait to surprise her grandmother with the news that she was moving back into White Castle while her own house was being repaired. Melody had managed to get a good bid on cleaning and repairing her grandmother's little house, and they were starting work next week. Insurance money had finally come through, too. It's a beautiful day and a gorgeous night, she said, with a happy sigh. Wrapping her dressing gown over her lace nightgown, Melody relaxed into one of the balcony rocking chairs to gaze at the moon. All of a sudden, the sound of footsteps came from across the gardens. A tall male figure strode toward the house, skirting the gurgling fountains and heading into her line of vision. Brit, is that you? She rose to peer over the railing. Her dressing gown slipped open, revealing the nightgown, and she grabbed the edges with her fist to keep it closed. Hey, <laughs> I like that view, Brit said with a low chuckle. No need to wrap up like a nun. Oh, you, she chided, tightening the belt even more. I'm hardly dressed like a nun. A second later, he disappeared from view, but the leaves of the abundant ivy that grew along the side of the house began to rustle. Melody leaned out over the railing to see his head appear in the thick shrubbery. What are you doing? I'm climbing up the balcony of the woman I love, he said in a firm, determined voice. You're crazy. You'll fall and kill yourself. I've done it before, Britt said. There was already a ladder here from last week when I was repairing a broken window frame just below your room. Not two seconds later, his chiseled, handsome face appeared, and he swung himself up over the balcony railing. Melody's breath stopped. She clutched at the railing, trying to keep from melting straight onto the floor. Britt wore faded jeans and a soft cashmere midnight blue shirt, his biceps bulging from the climb. Wavering on her feet, Melody stared into his eyes under the moonlight. What are you doing climbing my balcony, Mr. Mandeville? And what was that you said a minute ago? I didn't quite catch it, she said, playing dumb while dying to hear the words again. What did I say, Melody? He moved toward her and placed his firm, warm hands around her waist, pulling her closer. 
Her own palms slid up along his chest, and her legs trembled with attraction and desire for this man. You tell me what I said, he teased, whispering into her ear as he held the back of her head and kissed her neck. Instantly turning into a bowl of melted jello, Melody clung to him, tightening her fists around the fabric of his sweater. You are downright mean. I think you mean incorrigible. That too. I can't wait any longer to say how I feel about you, Melody. It's driving me insane. You're driving me insane. I want to sweep you off your feet and sail away into the sunset. I think you already did sweep me off my feet. That's a good sign. You always have, Melody admitted. I just keep trying to hide it. Now that's what I like to hear. But you don't have to hide it anymore. Did you say you love me? She asked in a whisper, her voice shaking. Do you really? Is that true? Doesn't it show? He asked with a slow smile. Why are you telling me now? Why tonight? He stroked his fingers along her cheek, gazing at the moon's light falling along the dark strands of her thick hair. Because I can't wait any longer. We've spent a great deal of time together, more than many couples. There's no more propriety over Crystal that has to be followed. Neither one of us have heard a word from her, so there's no reason to wait. I do love you, fiercely, and with all my heart. I can't stand being apart when I travel for work, and I want to take you with me. Every moment of every day, all I want to do is touch you and hold you and kiss you. We should be together. If you love me in return, tell me now, before I pour the rest of my heart and soul into loving you. Melody's eyes glistened with happiness surging through her entire body. Her heart and soul was alive and tingling with joy. Yes, Britt, I love you too. In a hundred ways. I dream about you at night and daydream about you during the day. You are the most generous man I've ever met. You're kind and thoughtful and full of energy and ideas and talent. Mostly, I'm always happy when I'm with you. That's the best news I've heard. Britt pulled her closer before sliding his hands up along her shoulders to hold her face in his tender, cupped hands. Bending his head, his lips pressed down on hers with a passion that left Melody swooning and trembling. She kissed him back, his lips soft, gentle, then urgent and sexy. He tasted so perfectly, wonderfully incredible. She didn't think she could ever get enough of him. When their lips parted, she was breathless and limp, and Britt held her up in his arms so that her feet barely touched the ground any longer. I think, he said softly, kissing the corners of her mouth. My only problem is going to be not spoiling you every single day for the next fifty years. Spoil away. Just don't remind me that you're a billionaire. It's too mind-blowing. We can pretend it's not real. Okay? I'll pay the bills and pretend to have money problems once in a while so it feels normal. It's a deal. You incorrigible, lovely man. He gave a sigh of pleasure and Melody put her arms around his neck, pulling his face close to hers. What's that sigh for? <laughs> I'm just relieved that you're not keeping me at arm's length any longer, he chuckled. All the time I was gone to Savannah. All I could think about was how White Castle was going to be the most beautiful home for us. It couldn't be any more perfect. White Castle and you are a dream come true. Melody stood on tiptoe to kiss him with all the love she had felt for so long. And then they tripped over themselves with so much kissing and finally fell back against the balcony love seat. The rest of the evening was spent laughing and kissing while stars glittered in the black sky and a silver medallion moon rose above the treetops. Epilogue Three months later, Granny Mary's house was restored and Britt and Melody had moved her back in. During Mary's recuperation from her long illness, she had spent her days at White Castle, 
happily going through boxes and trunks in the attic, and sitting in the music room next to the pianoforte gazing at the beautifully restored dollhouse. Old family photo albums came out of hiding, and there were many nostalgic evenings while she told stories of the last century. Books on the Mississippi had a grand opening to celebrate its launch, and most of the community turned out for the party. Even the parish clerks at Plaquemine when they learned that the bookstore was owned by Melody and was a member of one of the past families of the beloved plantation. There were cupcakes and cold drinks and a huge red banner welcoming all the local book lovers stretched across the cottage. Part of the bookstore was a lending library for needy families, since the closest libraries were in Baton Rouge. Melody's book orders came just in time to stock the shelves, and the place was packed with curious neighbors and eager customers. We may need to open up the next cottage, she quipped at Britt. Anything you want, sweetheart, he told her, handing out gourmet cupcakes to the children and reading Dr. Seuss on a rug in the corner. Florence Benoit, White Castle's head tour guide, volunteered to help during opening week, and she was busy at the cash register ringing up purchases while her assistant kept the gift shop attended and the tours for the Grand Historic Home running on time. Miri was also up to her eyeballs and wedding plans for her granddaughter. She was impressed by Britt Mandeville and his love and care for White Castle, which made Miri fall in love with him too. A week before Melody and Britt's early April wedding, Avery arrived from Chicago, a stunning satin wedding dress in hand for alterations and the final pearls and lace touches, including a ten-foot train and a Belgian lace veil. Avery had designed it herself, a Victorian re-imaging piece of elegance, in keeping with previous brides through the ages. Melody had read about Cornelia Randolph's wedding, getting married in the very same white ballroom nearly 150 years earlier. She pinched herself at the incredible fact that she would be the first family bride in well over a hundred years to get married in the ballroom. At the time, Crystal was conveniently, of her own scheduling, across the Atlantic in Italy on a photo shoot. A wedding gift arrived that contained a box of fine Italian goblets for the wedding toast, including a personal handwritten message from her sister. I'm happy for you, Melody, and hope you and Britt have a historic life together. No hard feelings. I have a new man in my life. Hint, he speaks Italian and owns a villa in Tuscany. Your papa would be so proud of you, darling Melody. Mary told her when she and Avery helped her dress before the ceremony. I know he's here in spirit. He loved all you girls so much. Melody threw her arms around her grandmother. Thank you for a wonderful life, she whispered. Even though I've always missed knowing Mama and Daddy, you and Papa were the best parents to me. It's a dream come true for me to see one of my girls married here at White Castle. But you were supposed to get married here. Granny Mary shook her head. I have no regrets, sweetheart. Despite loss and heartache, I've had a wonderful life. And you are one of the reasons why. And you, dear Melody, deserve every joy in the world. Avery's husband and three children had arrived from Chicago the previous day and were exploring the house. Britt was probably not dressed yet. He'd taken her 12-year-old nephew Trevor for a spin in the Ferrari. The boy was in heaven. Melody could hear the three-piece string orchestra warming up the ballroom, and her heart fluttered with anticipation. She couldn't wait to see Britt and truly be married at last. The past six months had been packed with rebuilding and renovations for both Mary and the bookstore, and she couldn't wait to take a real vacation with the man she adored. Her old bookstore assistant, Lucy, had happily offered to keep the new store running while they were gone. They planned to spend the night in the White Castle bridal suite and then travel to the Greek islands for a month-long honeymoon of sailing, white sand beaches, and romantic dinners and dancing. Voices came from downstairs, and she peeked out the door of the bedroom to glance into the foyer. It was Britt and Trevor, back at last, carrying the black tux Britt picked up from the tailor. Right behind them was the parish priest, who would be performing the ceremony. Melody touched up her hair and makeup one last time until she knew Britt had finished dressing. She stood at the balcony, gazing out over the White Castle property with its exploding springtime gardens and spreading oaks. 
She breathed a deep sigh of joy and gratitude. Love for Britt and all their sweet moments together over the last six months overflowed her heart. A knock came at the door and she hurried over, holding on to her veil to make sure the pins didn't come loose. Is it time? she asked. Britt's voice came through the door. It's me, Melody. Her heart leaped. Britt, don't jinx anything by opening the door. You silly girl. There's no jinxing us. That's true. But you might decide to let your incorrigible nature let loose and march in here to shock me. <laughs> I'll be marching into our bridal suite later tonight, he chuckled in his deep, sexy voice, as fast as we can sneak away. See? You are incorrigible, Melody whispered back. But I can't wait to be alone together either. Melody, sweetheart. I'm counting down the seconds until I see you in your wedding gown and marry you in front of the whole world. I love you more than life, and I can't wait to start our life together. See you in a few minutes, beautiful girl. And don't forget the gift I left you here on the table. A gift? Melody heard Britt descend the stairs, and eagerness spilled over as she opened the bedroom door. There, on the lemon-polished table was a bouquet of the most beautiful formed yellow roses tied with baby's breath and satin ribbons. Oh, Brit, Melody lifted the flowers and buried her nose in the rich, sweet scent. He had probably cut these from the gardens. Roses from White Castle for her wedding day couldn't be more perfect. Carrying them in her arms, she turned to glide down the sweeping, winding staircase, just like Cordelia Randolph had done so long ago. The past and the present mingled together, and the image of the home she and Britt would create over the years to come came fully formed in her mind. Floral arrangements of roses, daisies, and hyacinths lined the grand foyer. The late afternoon sparkled with sunshine, and the heady perfume scent of the flowers brought the spring season right into the house. Melody stood in the Victorian drawing room while Avery and her two young daughters spread out the lace trim satin train. A moment later, the string trio began the classical music of Chopin for the march down the grand hallway. Seated in the ballroom, friends, neighbors, and family, including Britt's foster parents, Melody's cousins, Mary, and the staff at White Castle. They stood with happy smiles to watch Avery, the matron of honor, followed by the bride, walk steadily down the foyer toward them. The chandelier sparkled overhead, and sunshine poured in through the upper windows of the white ballroom. Britt was waiting for Melody at the top of the elegant room, standing with the priest between the twelve-foot windows, the white draperies cascading to the floor. Melody watched Britt's handsome face widen with surprise and delight when he saw her coming toward him. He grasped her hand and pulled her close to his side. You are the most beautiful creature I ever saw, he whispered with his adoring eyes. Her heart fluttered while her stomach jumped at the long-awaited day. You are pretty gorgeous yourself, Mr. Mandeville. Turning toward the priest who began the wedding ceremony, Melody and Britt couldn't help but keep catching each other's gaze, the love and promise of many years ahead shining from each other's eyes. After the ceremony was over and the I do's enthusiastically pronounced, the guests applauded when the priest introduced them as Mr. and Mrs. Britt Mandeville. Dinner was served in the gardens, and the azalea bushes were in their splendorous pink and purple April bloom. The fountains burst with a shower of water, catching the setting sun under the oak trees. Avery's children, pumped up with too much wedding cake, splashed their hands in the fountains and played tag across the acres of freshly mowed lawn. Smiles and laughter filled the air, and afterward, there was dancing in the ballroom and a toast to the new owners of White Castle. May the walls of this blessed home always contain peace and joy, Granny Mary told the newlyweds in a quivery voice as she raised a glass while leaning on her cane. And many happy children in the years to come, as long as I always have a guest room to claim when I need to visit the great-grandchildren. Always, Melody told her, gazing about the beauty of the day. Tears of joy overflowed her eyes and heart. In another decade or so, it would be a hundred years since Mary had been born in this very house. Life had certainly come full circle in the best way possible. Can we be alone yet? Britt asked, holding Melody in his arms, 
their cheeks pressed together under the starlight of the gardens, as he swayed with her in a silent dance and hummed a waltz tune in her ear. The string trio had long since packed up. Do you think anyone would notice if we sneak away? Melody teased back. Britt gave her a sly grin. Probably only Trevor, who I promised a ride in the Maserati before we fly to Greece. That made Melody laugh. <laughs> I'll finish packing while you take him for a spin tomorrow afternoon. But I get you all to myself until then. Have I told you lately that you are the most beautiful bride I have ever seen? About a hundred times, she said, inhaling his spicy masculine scent that sent her head spinning. But I never said you get to stop. Oh, I am a lucky man, Melody de Leon. She cut him off, gently pressing a finger against his lips and leaning in to whisper, That'll be Melody Mandeville to you. Just for that, you can give me a foot massage in the hot tub tonight. Britt growled in her ear while he wrapped an arm around her waist and pulled her in for a warm, passionate kiss, which she returned with a moan of delight, sliding her arms up around his neck and melting against him. They kissed again, while the lingering guests teased and cheered from the sidelines. Shall we get a room? Melody whispered into his ear. With pleasure, Mrs. Mandeville, he said, picking her up into his strong arms to carry her across the threshold of White Castle and up the long curving staircase. This has been The Owner's Secret, a secret billionaire romance book four, written by Kimberly Montpetit, narrated by Reagan Boggs. Copyright 2018 by Kimberly Montpetit. Production copyright by Kimberly Montpetit.